the author's prologue of gargantua and pantagruel book three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org gargantua and pantagruel book three by francois rabelais translated by thomas urquhart and peter moteur the third book francois rabelais to the soul of the deceased queen of navarre abstracted soul ravished with ecstasies gone back and now familiar in the skies thy former host thy body leaving quite which to obey thee always took delight obsequious ready now from motion free senseless and as it were in apathy wouldst thou not issue forth for a short space from that divine eternal heavenly place to see the third part in this earthy cell of the brave acts of good pantagruel the author's prologue good people most illustrious drinkers and you thrice precious gouty gentlemen did you ever see diogenes and cynic philosopher if you have seen him you then had your eyes in your head or am very much out of my understanding and logical sense it is a gallant thing to see the clearness of wine gold the sun i'll be judged by the blind born so renowned in the sacred scriptures who having at his choice to ask whatever he would from him who is almighty and whose word in an instant is effectually performed asked nothing else but that he might see item you are not young which is a competent quality for you to philosophate more than physically in wine not in vain and henceforwards to be of the bacchic council to the end that o oh, pining there you may give your opinion faithfully of the substance colour excellent odour eminency propriety faculty virtue and effectual dignity of the said blessed and desired liquor if you have not seen him as i am easily induced to believe that you have not at least you have heard some talk of him for through the air and the whole extent of this hemisphere of the heavens hath his report and fame even until this present time remained very memorable and renowned then all of you are derived from the phrygian blood if i be not deceived if you have not so many crowns as midas had yet have you something i know not what of him which the persians of old esteemed more of in all their otacus and which was more desired by the emperor antonine and gave occasion thereafter to the basilico at rohan to be surnamed goodly ears if you've not heard of him i will presently tell you a story to make your wine relish drink then so to the purpose hearken now whilst i give you notice to the end that you may not like infidels be by your simplicity abused that in his time he was a rare philosopher and the cheerfulest of a thousand if he had some imperfection so have you so have we for there is nothing but god that is perfect yet so it was that by alexander the great although he had aristotle for his instructor and domestic was he held in such estimation that he wished if he had not been alexander to have been diogenes the sinopian 
when philip king of macedon enterprised the siege and ruin of corinth the corinthians having received certain intelligence by their spies that he with a numerous army in battle rank was coming against them were all of them not without cause most terribly afraid and therefore were not neglected of their duty in doing their best endeavours to put themselves in a fit posture to resist his hostile approach and defend their own city some from the fields brought into the fortified places their movables bestial corn wine fruit victuals, and other necessary provision others did fortify and rampire their walls set up little fortresses bastions squared ravelins digged trenches cleansed countermines fenced themselves with gabions contrived platforms emptied casemates barricaded the false braes erected the cavaliers repaired the counter scarps plastered the curtains lengthened ravelins stopped parapets mortised barbicans assured the portcullises fastened the hearses saracens quays and cataracts placed their sentries and doubled their patrol every one did watch and ward and not one was exempted from carrying the basket some polished corslets varnished backs and breasts cleaned the headpieces mail coats brigandines salads helmets morions jacks gushes gorgets hogwins brassers and cuirassars corslets habergeons shields bucklers targets greaves gauntlets and spurs others made ready bows slings crossbows pellets catapults migraines or fireballs firebrands ballasts scorpions and other such warlike engines expugnatory and destructive to the helipolites they sharpened and prepared spears staves pikes brown bills halberds long hooks lances agues quarter staves eel spears partisans stout staves clubs battle-axes maces darts dartless claves javelins javelots and truncheons they set edges upon scimitars cutlasses battleairs back swords tucks rapiers bayonets arrowheads dags daggers mandusians poniards winyards knives skeins shabbles chipping knives and railions every man exercised his weapon every man scoured off the rust from his natural hanger nor was there a woman amongst them though never so reserved or old who made not her harness to be well furbished as you know the corinthian women of old were reputed very courageous combatants diogenes seeing them all so warm at work and himself not employed by the magistrates in any business whatsoever he did very seriously for many days together without speaking one word consider and contemplate the countenance of his fellow-citizens then on a sudden as if he had been roused up and inspired by a martial spirit he girded his cloak scarf-wise about his left arm tucked up his sleeves to the elbow trussed himself like a clown gathering apples and giving to one of his old acquaintance his wallet books and opistographs away went he out of town towards a little hill or promontory of corinth called the crany and there on the strand a pretty level place did he roll his jolly tub which served him for a house to shelter him from the injuries of the weather there i say in a great vehemency of spirit did he turn it veer it wheel it whirl it frisk it jumble it shuffle it huddle it tumble it hurry it jolt it jostle it overthrow it evert it invert it subvert it overturn it beat it whack it bump it batter it knock it thrust it push it jerk it jock it shake it toss it throw it overthrow it upside down topsy-turvy arse-turvy tread it trample it stamp it tap it ting it ring it tingle it towel it sound it resound it stop it shut it umbung it close it unstopple it and then again in a mighty bustle he bandied it slubbered it hacked it whittled it 
weighed it darted it hurled it staggered it reeled it swinged it brangled it tottered it lifted it heaved it transformed it transfigured it transposed it transplaced it reared it raised it hoisted it washed it dyed it cleansed it rinsed it nailed it settled it fastened it shackled it bettered it leveled it blocked it tugged it tooted it carried it bedashed it berated it parched it mounted it broached it nicked it notched it besplattered it decked it adorned it trimmed it garnished it gauged it burnished it bored it pierced it trapped it rumbled it slid it down the hill and precipitated it from the very height of the crany then from the foot to the top like another sisyphus with his stone bore it up again in every way so banged it and belaboured it that it was ten thousand to one he had not struck the bottom of it out which when one of his friends had seen and asked him why he did so toil his body perplex his spirit and torment his tub the philosopher's answer was that not being employed in any other charge by the republic he thought it expedient to thunder and storm it so tempestuously upon his tub that amongst the people so fervently busy and earnest at work he alone might not seem a loitering slug and a lazy fellow to the same purpose may i say of myself though i be rid from fear i'm not void of care for perceiving no account to be made of me towards the discharge of a trust of any great concernment and considering that through all the parts of this most noble kingdom of france both on this and on the other side of the mountains every one is most diligently exercised and busied some in the fortifying of their own native country for its defence others in the repulsing of their enemies by an offensive war and all this with a policy so excellent and such admirable order so manifestly profitable for the future whereby france shall have its frontiers most magnificently enlarged and the french assured of a long and well-grounded peace that very little withholds me from the opinion of good heraclitus which affirmeth war to be the father of all good things and therefore do i believe that war is in latin called bellum not by antiphrasis as some patches of old rusty latin would have us to think because in war there is little beauty to be seen but absolutely and simply for that in war appeareth all that is good and graceful and that by the wars is purged out all manner of wickedness and deformity for proof whereof the wise and pacific solomon could no better represent the unspeakable perfection of the divine wisdom than by comparing it to the due disposure and ranking of an army in battle array well provided and ordered therefore by reason of my weakness and inability being reputed by my compatriots unfit for the offensive part of warfare and on the other side being no way employed in matter of the defensive although it had been but to carry burthens fill ditches or break clods either whereof had been to me indifferent i held it not a little disgraceful to be only an idle spectator of so many valorous eloquent and warlike persons who in the view and sight of all europe act this notable interlude or tragic comedy and not make some effort towards the performance of this nothing at all remains for me to be done and not exert myself and contribute there to this nothing my all which remained for me to do ozel in my opinion little honour is due to such as are mere lookers-on liberal of their eyes and of their crowns and hide their silver scratching their head with one finger like grumbling puppies gaping at the flies like tithe calves clapping down their ears like arcadian asses at the melody of musicians who with their very countenances in the depth of silence express their consent to the prosopopoeia having made this choice and election it seemed to me that my exercise therein would be neither unprofitable nor troublesome to any whilst i should thus set a-going my diogenical tub which is all that has left me safe from the shipwreck of my former misfortunes at this dingle dangle wagging of my tub what would you have me to do 
by the virgin that tucks up her sleeve i know not as yet stay a little till i suck up a draught of this bottle it is my true and only helicon it is my cabaline fountain it is my sole enthusiasm drinking thus i meditate discourse resolve and conclude after that the epilogue is made i laugh i write i compose and drink again aeneas drinking wrote and writing drank aeschylus if plutarch in his symposiacs merit any fate drank composing and drinking composed homer never wrote fasting and cater never wrote till after he had drunk these passages i have brought before you to the end you may not say that i lived without the example of men well praised and better prized it is good and fresh enough even as if you would say it is entering upon the second degree god the good god Saveoth, that is to say the god of armies be praised for it eternally if you after the same manner would take one great draught or two little ones whilst you have your gown about you i truly find no kind of inconveniency in it provided you send up to god for all some small scantling of thanks since then my luck or destiny is such as you have heard for it is not for everybody to go to corinth i am fully resolved to be so little idle and unprofitable that i will set myself to serve the one and the other sort of people amongst the diggers pioneers and rampire builders i will do as did neptune and apollo at troy under laomedon or as did renault of mount tauban in his latter days i will serve the masons i'll set on the pot to boil for the bricklayers and whilst the mince meat is making ready at the sound of my small pipe i'll measure the muzzle of the musing dotards thus did amphion with the melody of his harp found build and finish the great and renowned city of thebes for the use of the warriors i am about to broach and of new my barrel to give them a taste which by two former volumes of mine if by the deceitfulness and falsehood of printers they have not been jumbled marred and spoiled you would have very well relished and draw unto them of the growth of our own trippery pastimes a gallant third part of a gallon and consequently a jolly cheerful quart of pantagruelic sentences which you may lawfully call if you please diogenical and shall have me seeing i cannot be their fellow-soldier for their faithful butler refreshing and cheering according to my little power their return from the alarms of the enemy as also for an indefatigable extoller of their martial exploits and glorious achievements i shall not fail therein par la pathium actum de diu if mars fail not in lent which the cunning lecher i warrant you will be loath to do i remember nevertheless to have read that ptolemy the son of lagus one day amongst the many spoils and booties which by his victories he had acquired presenting to the egyptians in the open view of the people a bactrian camel all black and a party-coloured slave in such sort as that the one half of his body was black and the other white not in partition of breadth by the diaphragma as was that woman consecrated to the indian venus whom the tyanian philosopher did see between the river hydaspes and mount caucasus but in a perpendicular dimension of altitude which were things never before that seen in egypt he expected by the show of these novelties to win the love of the people but what happened thereupon at the production of the camel they were all affrighted and offended at the sight of the party-coloured man some scoffed at him as a detestable monster brought forth by the error of nature in a word of the hope which he had to please these egyptians and by such means to increase the affection which they naturally bore him he was altogether frustrate and disappointed understanding fully by their deportments that they took more pleasure and delight in things that were proper handsome and perfect than in misshapen monstrous and ridiculous creatures 
since which time he had both the slave and the camel in such dislike that very shortly thereafter either through negligence or for want of ordinary sustenance they did exchange the life with death this example putteth me in a suspense between hope and fear misdoubting that for the contentment which i aim at i will but reap what shall be most distasteful to me my cake will be dough and for my venus i shall have but some deformed puppy instead of serving them i shall but vex them and offend them whom i propose to exhilarate resembling in this dubious adventure euclean's cook so renowned by plautus in his pot and by ausonius in his griffin and by divers others which cook for having by his scraping discovered a treasure had his hide well curried put the case i get no anger by it though formerly such things fell out and the like may occur again yet by hercules it will not so i perceive in them all one and the same specificial form and the like individual properties which our ancestors call pantagruelism by virtue whereof they will bear with anything that floweth from a good free and loyal heart i have seen them ordinarily take good will and part of payment and remain satisfied therewith when one was not able to do better having dispatched this point i returned to my barrel up my lads to this wine spare it not drink boys and troll it off at full bowls if you do not think it good let it alone i am not like those officious and importunate sots who by force outrage and violence constrain an easy good-natured fellow to whiffle quaff carouse and what is worse all honest tipplers all honest gouty men all such as are a dry coming to this little barrel of mine need not drink thereof if it please them not but if they have a mind to it and that the wine prove agreeable to the taste of their worshipful worships let them drink frankly freely and boldly without paying anything and welcome this is my decree my statute and ordinance and let none fear there shall be any want of wine as at the marriage of cana in galilee for how much soever you shall draw forth at the faucet so much shall i turn in at the bung thus shall the barrel remain inexhaustible it hath a lively spring and perpetual current such was the beverage contained within the cup of tantalus which was figuratively represented amongst the brachman sages such was in iberia the mountain of salt so highly written above by cato such was the branch of gold consecrated to the subterranean goddess which virgil treats of so sublimely it is a true cornucopia of merriment and raillery if at any time it seem to you to be emptied to the very lees yet shall it not for all that be drawn wholly dry good hope remains there at the bottom as in pandora's bottle and not despair as in the puncheon of the danaids remark well what i have said and what manner of people they be whom i do invite for to the end that none be deceived i in imitation of lucilius who did protest that he wrote only to his own tarentines and constantines have not pierced this vessel for any else but you honest men who are drinkers of the first edition and gouty blades of the highest degree the great dorophages bribe mongers have on their hands occupation enough and enough on the hooks for their venison there may they follow their prey here is no garbage for them you pettifoggers garblers and masters of chicanery speak not to me i beseech you in the name of and for the reverence you bear to the four hips that engendered you and to the quickening peg which at that time conjoined them as for hypocrites much less although they were all of them unsound in body pockified scurvy furnished with unquenchable thirst and insatiable eating and wherefore because indeed they are not of good but of evil and of that evil from which we daily pray to god to deliver us and albeit we see them sometimes counterfeit devotion yet never did old ape make pretty moppet hence mastiffs dogs in a doublet get you behind aloof villains out of my sunshine curs to the devil do you jog hither wagging your tails to pant at my wine and bepiss my barrel 
look here is the cudgel which diogenes in his last will ordained to be set by him after his death for beating away crushing the reins and breaking the backs of these bustuary hobgoblins and cerberian hell-hounds pack you hence therefore you hypocrites to your sheep-dogs get you gone you dissemblers to the devil hey what are you there yet i renounce my part of papa mani if i snatch you grr 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 avant avant will you not be gone may you never shit till you be soundly lashed with stirrup leather never piss but by the strapado nor be otherwise warmed than by the bastinado end of the author's prologue chapter three one of gargantua and pantagruel book three by francois rabelais this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three one how pantagruel transported a colony of utopians into dipsody pantagruel having wholly subdued the land of dipsody transported thereunto a colony of utopians to the number of nine billion eight hundred and seventy six million five hundred forty three thousand two hundred and ten men besides the women and little children artificers of all trades and professors of all sciences to people cultivate and improve that country which otherwise was ill inhabited and in the greatest part thereof but a mere desert and wilderness and did transport them not so much for the excessive multitude of men and women which were in utopia multiplied for number like grasshoppers upon the face of the land you understand well enough nor is it needful further to explain it to you that the utopian men had so rank and fruitful genitories and that the utopian women carried matrixes so ample so glutinous so tenaciously retentive and so architectonically cellulated that at the end of every ninth month seven children at the least what male what female were brought forth by every married woman in imitation of the people of israel in egypt if anthony nicholas de lyra be to be trusted nor yet was this transplantation made so much for the fertility of the soil the wholesomeness of the air or commodity of the country of dipsody as to retain that rebellious people within the bounds of their duty and obedience by this new transport of his ancient and most faithful subjects who from all time out of mind never knew acknowledged owned or served any other sovereign lord but him and who likewise from the very instant of their birth as soon as they were entered into this world had with the milk of their mothers and nurses sucked in the sweetness humanity and mildness of his government to which they were all of them so nourished and habituated that there was nothing sure than that they would sooner abandon their lives than swerve from their singular and primitive obedience naturally due to their prince whithersoever they should be dispersed or removed and not only should they and their children successively descending from their blood be such but also would keep and maintain in this same fealty and obsequious observance all the nations lately annexed to his empire which so truly came to pass that therein he was not disappointed of his intent for if the utopians were before their transplantation thither dutiful and faithful subjects the dipsodes after some few days conversing with them were every whit as if not more loyal than they and that by virtue of i know not what natural fervency incident to all human creatures at the beginning of any labour wherein they take delight solemnly attesting the heavens and supreme intelligences of their being only sorry that no sooner 
unto their knowledge had arrived the great renown of the good pantagruel remark therefore here honest drinkers that the manner of preserving and retaining countries newly conquered in obedience is not as hath been the erroneous opinion of some tyrannical spirits to their own detriment and dishonour to pillage plunder force spoil trouble oppress vex disquiet ruin and destroy the people ruling governing and keeping them in awe with rods of iron and in a word eating and devouring them after the fashion that homer calls an unjust and wicked king demoboron that is to say a devourer of his people i will not bring you to this purpose the testimony of ancient writers it shall suffice to put you in mind of what your fathers have seen thereof and yourselves too if you be not very babes newborn they must be given sucked to rocked in a cradle and dandled trees newly planted must be supported under propped strengthened and defended against all tempests mischiefs injuries and calamities and one lately saved from a long and dangerous sickness and new upon his recovery must be forborne spared and cherished in such sort that they may harbour in their own breasts this opinion that there is not in the world a king or a prince who does not desire fewer enemies and more friends though osiris the great king of the egyptians conquered almost the whole earth not so much by force of arms as by easing the people of their troubles teaching them how to live well and honestly giving them good laws and using them with all possible affability courtesy gentleness and liberality therefore was he by all men deservedly entitled the great king euergetes that is to say benefactor which style he obtained by virtue of the command of jupiter to one pamela and in effect hesiod in his hierarchy placed the good demons call them angels if you will or geniuses as intercessors and mediators betwixt the gods and men they being of a degree inferior to the gods but superior to men and for that through their hands the riches and benefits we get from heaven are dealt to us and that they are continually doing us good and still protecting us from evil he saith that they exercise the offices of kings because to do always good and never ill is an act most singularly royal just such another was the emperor of the universe alexander the macedonian after this manner was hercules sovereign possessor of the whole continent relieving men from monstrous oppressions exactions and tyrannies governing them with discretion maintaining them in equity and justice instructing them with seasonable policies and wholesome laws convenient for and suitable to the soil climate and disposition of the country supplying what was wanting abating what was superfluous and pardoning all that was past with a sempiternal forgetfulness of all preceding offences as was the amnesty of the athenians when by the prowess valour and industry of thrasybulus the tyrants were exterminated afterwards at rome by cicero exposed and renewed under the emperor aurelian these are the filters allurements hinges inveiglements baits and enticements of love by the means whereof that may be peaceably revived which was painfully acquired nor can a conqueror reign more happily whether he be a monarch emperor king prince or philosopher than by making his justice to second his valour his valour shows itself in victory and conquest his justice will appear in the goodwill and affection of the people when he maketh laws publisheth ordinances establisheth religion and doth what is right to every one as the noble poet virgil writes of octavian augustus victorque volentis per populus dot ura therefore is it that homer in his iliads calleth a good prince and a great king cosmator lion that is the ornament of the people 
such was the consideration of numa pompilius the second king of the romans a just politician and wise philosopher when he ordained that to god terminus on the day of his festival call terminales nothing should be sacrificed that had died teaching us thereby that the bounds limits and frontiers of kingdoms should be guarded and preserved in peace amity and meekness without polluting our hands with blood and robbery who doth otherwise shall not only lose what he hath gained but also be loaded with this scandal and reproach that he is an unjust and wicked purchaser and his acquests perish with him juxta illud mala parta mala de la pantour and although during his whole lifetime he should have peaceable possession thereof yet if what hath been so acquired moulder away in the hands of his heirs the same opprobri scandal and imputation will be charged upon the defunct and his memory remain accursed for his unjust and unwarrantable conquest juxta illud de mala quaesitis vix gaudet tertius harus remark likewise gentlemen you gaudi fiafis in this main point worthy of your observation how by these means pantagruel of one angel made two which was a contingency opposite to the council of charlemagne who made two devils of one when he transplanted the saxons into flanders and the flemings into saxony for not being able to keep in such subjection the saxons whose dominion he had joined to the empire but that ever and anon they would break forth into open rebellion if he should casually be drawn into spain or other remote kingdoms he caused them to be brought unto his own country of flanders the inhabitants whereof did naturally obey him and transported the hainots and flemings his ancient loving subjects into saxony not mistrusting their loyalty now that they were transplanted into a strange land but it happened that the saxons persisted in their rebellion and primitive obstinacy and the flemings dwelling in saxony did imbibe the stubborn manners and conditions of the saxons End of chapter three one chapter three two of gargantua and pantagruel book three by francois rabelais this librivox recording is in the public domain how panurge was made laird of salmagondon in dipsody and did waste his revenue before it came in whilst pantagruel was giving order for the government of all dipsody he assigned to panurge the lairdship of salmagondon which was yearly worth six billion seven hundred and eighty nine million one hundred and six thousand seven hundred and eighty nine reals of certain rent besides the uncertain revenue of the locusts and periwinkles amounting one year with another to the value of four hundred and thirty five thousand seven hundred and sixty eight or two million four hundred and thirty five thousand seven hundred and sixty nine french crowns of berry sometimes it did amount to one billion two hundred and thirty million five hundred and fifty four thousand three hundred and twenty one seraphs when it was a good year and that locusts and periwinkles were in request but that was not every year now his worship the new laird husbanded this his estate so providently well and prudently that in less than fourteen days he wasted and dilapidated all the certain and uncertain revenue of his lairdship for three whole years yet did not he properly dilapidate it as you might say in founding of monasteries building of churches erecting of colleges and setting up of hospitals or casting his bacon flitches to the dogs but spent it in a thousand little banquets and jolly collations keeping open house for all comers and goers yea to all good fellows young girls and pretty wenches felling timber burning great logs for the sale of the ashes borrowing money beforehand buying deer selling cheap and eating his corn as it were 
whilst it was but grass tantagruel being advertised of this his lavishness was in good sooth no way offended at the matter angry nor sorry for i once told you and again tell it you that he was the best little great good man that ever girded a sword to his side he took all things in good part and interpreted every action to the best sense he never vexed nor disquieted himself with the least pretence of dislike to anything because he knew that he must have most grossly abandoned the divine mansion of reason if he had permitted his mind to be never so little grieved afflicted or altered at any occasion whatsoever for all the goods that the heaven covereth and that the earth containeth in all their dimensions of height depth breadth and length are not of so much worth as that we should for them disturb or disorder our affections trouble or perplex our senses or spirits he drew only panurge aside and then making to him a sweet remonstrance and mild admonition very gently represented before him in strong arguments that if he should continue in such an unthrifty course of living and not become a better meissonier it would prove altogether impossible for him or at least hugely difficult at any time to make him rich rich answered panurge have you fixed your thoughts there have you undertaken the task to enrich me in this world set your mind to live merrily in the name of god and good folks let no other cark nor care be harboured within the sancro sanctified domicile of your celestial brain may the calmness and tranquillity thereof be never incommodated with or overshadowed by any frowning clouds of sullen imaginations and displeasing annoyance for if you live joyful merry jocund and glad i cannot be but rich enough everybody cries up thrift thrift and good husbandry but many speak of robin hood that never shot in his bow and talk of that virtue of mesnagerie who know not what belongs to it it is by me that they must be advised from me therefore take this advertisement and information that what is imputed to me for a vice have been done in imitation of the university and parliament of paris places in which is to be found the true spring and source of the lively idea of pantheology and all manner of justice let him be counted a heretic that doubteth thereof and doth not firmly believe it yet they in one day eat up their bishop or the revenue of the bishopric is it not all one for a whole year yea sometimes for two this is done on the day he makes his entry and is installed nor is there any place for an excuse if we cannot avoid it unless he would be hooted at and stoned for his parsimony it hath been also esteemed an act flowing from the habit of the four cardinal virtues of prudence in borrowing money beforehand for none knows what may fall out who is able to tell if the world shall last yet three years but although it should continue longer is there any man so foolish as to have the confidence to promise himself three years what fool so confident to say that he shall live one other day of commutative justice in buying dear i say upon trust and selling goods cheap that is for ready money what says cato in his book of husbandry to this purpose the father of a family says he must be a perpetual seller by which means it is impossible but that at last he shall become rich if he have a vendible ware enough still ready for sale of distributive justice it doth partake in giving entertainment to good remark good and gentle fellows whom fortune hath shipwrecked like ulysses upon the rock of a hungry stomach without provision of sustenance and likewise to the good remark the good and young wenches for according to the sentence of hippocrates youth is impatient of hunger chiefly if it be vigorous lively frolic brisk stirring and bouncing which wanton lasses willingly and heartily devote themselves to the pleasure of honest men and are in so far both platonic and ciceronian that they do acknowledge 
they are being born into this world not to be for themselves alone but that in their proper persons their acquaintance may claim one share and their friends another the virtue of fortitude appears therein by the cutting down and overthrowing of the great trees like a second milo making havoc of the dark forest which did serve only to furnish dens caves and shelter to wolves wild boars and foxes and afford receptacles withdrawing corners and refuges to robbers thieves and murderers lurking holes and skulking places for cut-throat assassinators secret obscure shops for corners of false money and safe retreats for heretics laying them even and level with the plain champagne fields and pleasant heathy ground at the sound of the hope boys and bagpipes playing reeks with the high and stately timber and preparing seats and benches for the eve of the dreadful day of judgment i gave thereby proof of my temperance in eating my corn whilst it was but grass like a hermit feeding upon salads and roots that so affranchising myself from the yoke of sensual appetites to the utter disclaiming of their sovereignty i might the better reserve somewhat in store for the relief of the lame blind crippled maimed needy poor and wanting wretches in taking this course i saved the expense of the weed grubbers who gain money of the reapers in harvest time who drink lustily and without water of gleaners who will expect their cakes and bannocks of threshers who leave no garlic scallions leeks nor onions in our gardens by the authority of festilis in virgil and of the millers who are generally thieves and of the bakers who are little better is this small saving or frugality besides the mischief and damage of the field mice the decay of barns and the destruction usually made by weasels and other vermin of corn in the blade you may make good green sauce of a light concoction and easy digestion which recreates the brain and exhilarates the animal spirits rejoiceth the sight openeth the appetite delighteth the taste comforteth the heart tickleth the tongue cheereth the countenance striking a fresh and lively colour strengthening the muscles tempers the blood disburdens the midriff refresheth the liver disobstructs the spleen easeth the kidneys suppleth the reins quickens the joints of the back cleanseth the urine conduits dilates the spermatic vessels shortens the curmasters purgeth the bladder puffeth up the genitories correcteth the prepuce hardens the nut and rectifies the member it will make you have a current belly to trot far dung piss sneeze cough spit belch spew yawn snuff blow breeze snort sweat and set taut your robin with a thousand other rare advantages i understand you very well says pantagruel you would thereby infer that those of a mean spirit and shallow capacity have not the skill to spend much in a short time you are not the first in whose conceit that heresy hath entered nero maintained it and above all mortals admired most his uncle caius caligula for having in a few days by a most wonderfully pregnant invention totally spent all the goods and patrimony which tiberius had left him but instead of observing the sumptuous supper curbing laws of the romans to wit the orchia the fania the didia the licinia the cornelia the, the lepidiana the antia and of the corinthians by the which they were inhibited under pain of great punishment not to spend more in one year than their annual revenue did amount to you have offered up the oblation of protervia which was with the romans such a sacrifice as the paschal lamb was amongst the jews wherein all that was eatable was to be eaten and the remainder to be thrown into the fire without reserving anything for the next day i may very justly say of you as cato did of albidius who after that he had by a most extravagant expense wasted all the means and possessions he had to one only house he fairly set it on fire that he might the better say consummatum est even just as since his time st thomas aquinas did when he had eaten up the whole lamprey although there was no necessity in it End of chapter three two chapter three of gargantua and pantagruel 
book three by francois rabelais this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three three how panurge praiseth the debtors and borrowers but quoth pantagruel when will you be out of debt at the next ensuing term of the greek calends answered panurge when all the world shall be content and that it be your fate to become your own heir the lord forbid that i should be out of debt as if indeed i could not be trusted who leaves not some leaven overnight will hardly have paced the next morning be still indebted to somebody or other that there may be somebody always to pray for you that the giver of all good things may grant unto you a blessed long and prosperous life fearing if fortune should deal crossly with you that it might be his chance to come short of being paid by you he will always speak good of you in every company ever and anon purchase new creditors unto you to the end that through their means you may make a shift by borrowing from peter to pay paul and with other folks earth fill up his ditch when of old in the region of the gauls by the institution of the druids the servants slaves and bondmen were burnt quick at the funerals and obsequies of their lords and masters had not they fear enough think you that their lords and masters should die for perforce they were to die with them for company did not they incessantly send up their supplications to their great god mercury as likewise unto dis the father of wealth to lengthen out their days and to preserve them long in health were not they very careful to entertain them well punctually to look under them and to attend them faithfully and circumspectly for by those means were they to live together at least until the hour of death believe me your creditors with a more fervent devotion will beseech almighty god to prolong your life they being of nothing more afraid than that you should die for that they are more concerned for the sleeve than the arm and love silver better than their own lives as it evidently appeareth by the usurers of landerus who not long since hanged themselves because the price of the corn and wines was fallen by the return of a gracious season to this pantagruel answering nothing panurge went on in his discourse saying truly and in good sooth sir when i ponder my destiny aright and think well upon it you put me shrewdly to my plunges and have me at a bay in twitting me with the reproach of my debts and creditors and yet did i in this only respect and consideration of being a debtor esteem myself worshipful reverend and formidable for against the opinion of most philosophers that of nothing ariseth nothing yet without having bottomed on so much as that which is called the first matter did i out of nothing become such a maker and creator that i have created what a gay number of fair and jolly creditors nay creditors i will maintain it even to the very fire itself exclusively are fair and goodly creatures who lendeth nothing is an ugly and wicked creature and an accursed imp of the infernal old nick and there is made what debts a thing most precious and dainty of great use and antiquity debts i say surmounting the number of syllables which may result from the combinations of all the consonants with each of the vowels heretofore projected reckoned and calculated by the noble xenocrates to judge of the perfection of debtors by the numerosity of their creditors is the readiest way for entering into the mysteries of practical arithmetic you can hardly imagine how glad i am 
when every morning i perceive myself environed and surrounded with brigades of creditors humble fawning and full of their reverences and whilst i remark but as i look more favourably upon and give a cheerfuller countenance to one than to another the fellow thereupon buildeth a conceit that he shall be the first dispatched and the foremost in the date of payment and he valueth my smiles at the rate of ready money it seemeth unto me that i then act and personate the god of the passion of saw muir accompanied with his angels and cherubims these are my flatterers my soothers my clawbacks my smoothers my parasites my saluters my givers of good morrows and perpetual orators which makes me verily think that the supremest type of heroic virtue described by hesiod consisteth in being a debtor wherein i held the first degree in my commencement which dignity though all human creatures seem to aim at and aspire thereto few nevertheless because of the difficulties in the way and encumbrances of hard passages are able to reach it as is easily perceivable by the ardent desire and vehement longing harboured in the breast of every one to be still creating more debts and new creditors yet doth it not lie in the power of every one to be a debtor to acquire creditors is not at the disposure of each man's arbitrament you nevertheless would deprive me of this sublime felicity you ask me when i will be out of debt well to go yet further on and possibly worse in your conceit may saint bablin the good saint snatch me if i have not all my lifetime held debt to be as a union or conjunction of the heavens with the earth and the whole cement whereby the race of mankind is kept together yea of such virtue and efficacy that i say the whole progeny of adam would very suddenly perish without it therefore perhaps i do not think amiss when i repute it to be the great soul of the universe which according to the opinion of the academics vivifieth all manner of things in confirmation whereof that you may the better believe it to be so represent unto yourself without any prejudicacy of spirit in a clear and serene fancy the idea and form of some other world than this take if you please and lay hold on the thirtieth of those which the philosopher metrodorus did enumerate wherein it is to be supposed there is no debtor or creditor that is to say a world without debts there amongst the planets will be no regular course all will be in disorder jupiter reckoning himself to be nothing indebted unto saturn will go near to detrude him out of his sphere and with the homeric chain will be like to hang up the intelligences gods heavens demons heroes devils earth and sea together with the other elements saturn no doubt combining with mars will reduce that so disturbed world into a chaos of confusion mercury then would be no more subjected to the other planets he was scorned to be any longer their camillus as he was of old termed in the etrurian tongue for it is to be imagined that he is no way a debtor to them venus will be no more venerable because she shall have lent nothing the moon will remain bloody and obscure for to what end should the sun impart unto her any of his light he owed her nothing nor yet will the sun shine upon the earth nor the stars send down any good influence because the terrestrial globe hath desisted from sending up their wonted nourishment by vapours and exhalations wherewith heraclitus said the stoics proved cicero maintained they were cherished and alimented there would likewise be in such a world no manner of symbolization alteration nor transmutation amongst the elements for the one will not esteem itself obliged to the other as having borrowed nothing at all from it earth then will not become water water will not be changed into air of air will be made no fire and fire will afford no heat unto the earth the earth will produce nothing but monsters titans giants no rain will descend upon it 
nor light shine thereon no wind will blow there nor will there be in it any summer or harvest lucifer will break loose and issuing forth of the depth of hell accompanied with his furies fiends and horned devils will go about to unnestle and drive out of heaven all the gods as well of the greater as of the lesser nations such a world without lending will be no better than a dog kennel a place of contention and wrangling more unruly and irregular than that of the rector of paris a devil of an hurly-burly and more disordered confusion than that of the plagues of douay men will not then salute one another it will be but lost labour to expect aid or succour from any or to cry fire water murder for none will put to their helping hand why he lent no money there is nothing due to him nobody is concerned in his burning in his shipwreck in his ruin or in his death and that because he hitherto had lent nothing and would never thereafter have lent anything in short faith hope and charity would be quite banished from such a world for men are born to relieve and assist one another and in their stead should succeed and be introduced defiance disdain and rancour with the most execrable troop of all evils all imprecations and all miseries whereupon you will think and that not amiss that pandora had there spilt her unlucky bottle men under men will be wolves hob thrushers and goblins as were lycaon bellerophon nebuchadnezzar plunderers highway robbers cutthroats braparees murderers poisoners assassinators lewd wicked malevolent pernicious haters set against everybody like to ishmael metabus or timon the athenian who for that cause was named misanthropos in such sort that it would prove much more easy in nature to have fish entertained in the air and bullocks fed in the bottom of the ocean than to support or tolerate a rascally rabble of people that will not lend these fellows i vow do i hate with a perfect hatred and if conformed to the pattern of this grievous peevish and perverse world which lendeth nothing you figure and liken the little world which is man you will find in him a terrible jostling coil and clutter the head will not lend the sight of his eyes to guide the feet and hands the legs will refuse to bear up the body the hands will leave off working any more for the rest of the members the heart will be weary of its continual motion for the beating of the pulse and will no longer lend his assistance the lungs will withdraw the use of their bellows the liver will desist from convoying any more blood through the veins for the good of the whole the bladder will not be indebted to the kidneys so that the urine thereby will be totally stopped the brains in the interim considering this unnatural course will fall into a raving dotage and withhold all feeling from the sinews and motion from the muscles briefly in such a world without order and array owing nothing lending nothing and borrowing nothing you would see a more dangerous conspiration than that which aesop exposed in his apologue such a world will perish undoubtedly and not only perish but perish very quickly were it esculapius himself his body would immediately rot and the chafing soul full of indignation take its flight to all the devils of hell after my money End of chapter three three chapter three four of gargantua and pantagruel book three by francois rabelais this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three four panurge continueth his discourse in the praise of borrowers and lenders on the contrary be pleased to represent unto your fancy another world wherein every one lendeth and every one oweth all are debtors and all creditors oh how great will that harmony be which shall thereby result from the regular motions of the heavens methinks i hear it every whit as well as ever plato did what sympathy will there be amongst the elements oh how delectable then unto nature will be our own works and productions while ceres appeareth laden with corn 
bacchus with wines flora with flowers pomona with fruits and juno fair in a clear air wholesome and pleasant i lose myself in this high contemplation then will among the race of mankind peace love benevolence fidelity tranquillity rest banquets feastings joy gladness gold silver single money chains rings with other ware and chaffer of that nature be found to trot from hand to hand no suits at law no wars no strife debate nor wrangling none will be there a usurer none will be there a pinchpenny a scrape good wretch or churlish hard-hearted refuser good god will not this be the golden age in the reign of saturn the true idea of the olympic regions wherein all other virtues cease charity alone ruleth governeth domineereth and triumpheth all will be fair and goodly people there all just and virtuous o oh, happy world o oh, people of that world most happy yea thrice and four times blessed is that people i think in very deed that i am amongst them and swear to you by my good forsooth that if this glorious aforesaid world had a pope abounding with cardinals that so he might have the association of a sacred college in the space of very few years you should be sure to see the saints much thicker in the roll more numerous wonder-working and merific more services more vows more staves and wax candles than are all those in the nine bishoprics of brittany st e only excepted consider sir i pray you how the noble patelin having a mind to deify and extol even to the third heavens the father of william jasolum said no more but this and he did lend his goods to those who were desirous of them oh the fine saying now let our microcosm he fancied conform to this model in all its members lending borrowing and owing that is to say according to its own nature for nature hath not to any other end created man but to owe borrow and lend no greater is the harmony amongst the heavenly spheres than that which shall be found in its well-ordered policy the intention of the founder of this microcosm is to have a soul therein to be entertained which is lodged there as a guest with its host that it may live there for a while life consisteth in blood blood is the seat of the soul therefore the chiefest work of the microcosm is to be making blood continually at this forge are exercised all the members of the body none is exempted from labour each operates apart and doth its proper office and such is their hierarchy that perpetually the one borrows from the other the one lends the other and the one is the other's debtor the stuff and matter convenient which nature giveth to be turned into blood is bread and wine all kind of nourishing victuals is understood to be comprehended in these two and from hence in the gothish tongue is called compenage to find out this meat and drink to prepare and boil it the hands are put to work the feet do walk and bear up the whole bulk of the corporal mass the eyes guide and conduct all the appetite in the orifice of the stomach by means of a little sourish black humour called melancholy which is transmitted thereto from the milk giveth warning to shut in the food the tongue doth make the first essay and tastes it the teeth do chew it and the stomach doth receive digest and chylify it the mesaraic veins suck out of it what is good and fit leaving behind the excrements which are through special conduits for that purpose voided by an expulsive faculty thereafter it is carried to the liver where it being changed again it by the virtue of that new transmutation becomes blood what joy conjecture you will then be found amongst those officers when they see this rivulet of gold which is their sole restorative no greater is the joy of alchemists when after long travail toil and expense they see in their furnaces the transmutation 
thin is it that every member doth prepare itself and strive anew to purify and to refine this treasure the kidneys through the emulgent veins draw that aquacity from thence which you call urine and there send it away through the ureters to be slipped downwards where in a lower receptacle and proper for it to wit the bladder it is kept and stayeth there until an opportunity to void it out in his due time the spleen draweth from the blood its terrestrial part viz the grounds lees or thick substance settled in the bottom thereof which you term melancholy the bottle of the gall subtracts from thence all the superfluous collar whence it is brought to another shop or workhouse to be yet better purified and fined that is the heart which by its agitation of diastolic and systolic motions so neatly subtilizeth and inflames it that in the right side ventricle it is brought to perfection and through the veins ascent to all the members each parcel of the body draws it then unto itself and after its own fashion is cherished and alimented by it feet hands thighs arms eyes ears back breast yea all and then it is that who before were lenders now become debtors the heart doth in its left side ventricle so thinify the blood that it thereby obtains the name of spiritual which being sent through the arteries to all the members of the body serveth to warm and winnow the other blood which runneth through the veins the lights never cease with its lappets and bellows to cool and refresh it in acknowledgment of which good the heart through the arterial vein imparts unto it the choicest of its blood at last it is made so fine and subtle within the reet mirabla mirabile that thereafter those animal spirits are framed and composed of it by means whereof the imagination discourse judgment resolution deliberation ratiocination and memory have their rise actings and operations cops body i sink i drown i perish i wander astray and quite fly out of myself when i enter into the consideration of the profound abyss of this world thus lending thus owing believe me it is a divine thing to lend to owe an heroic virtue yet is not this all this little world thus lending owing and borrowing is so good and charitable that no sooner is the above specified alimentation finished but that it forthwith projecteth and hath already forecast how it shall lend to those who are not as yet born and by that loan endeavour what it may to eternize itself and multiply in images like the pattern that is children to this end every member doth of the choicest and most precious of its nourishment pair and cut off a portion then instantly dispatcheth it downwards to that place where nature hath prepared for it very fit vessels and receptacles through which descending to the genitories by long ambages circuits and flexuosities it receiveth a competent form and rooms apt enough both in man and woman for the future conservation and perpetuating of humankind all this is done by loans and debts of the one unto the other and hence have we this word the debt of marriage nature doth reckon pain to the refuser with a most grievous vexation to his members and an outrageous fury amidst his senses but on the other part to the lender a set reward accompanied with pleasure joy solace mirth and merry glee End of chapter three four chapter three five of gargantua and pantagruel book three by francois rabelais this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three five how pantagruel altogether abhorreth the debtors and borrowers i understand you very well quoth pantagruel and take you to be very good at topics and thoroughly affectioned to your own cause but preach it up and patrocinate it prattle on it and defend it as much as you will even from hence to the next whitsuntide if you please so to do yet in the end you will be astonished to find how you shall have gained no ground at all upon me nor persuaded me by your fair speeches and smooth talk to enter never so little into the thraldom of debt you shall owe to none saith the holy apostle anything save love friendship and mutual benevolence 
you serve me here i confess with fine graphides and diatyposes descriptions and figures which truly please me very well but let me tell you if you will represent unto your fancy an impudent blustering bully and an importunate borrower entering afresh and newly into a town already advertised of his manners you shall find that at his ingress the citizens will be more hideously affrighted and amazed and in a greater terror and fear dread and trembling than if the pest itself should step into it in the very same garb and accoutrement wherein the tyanean philosopher found it within the city of ephesus and i am fully confirmed in the opinion that the persians erred not when they said that the second vice was to lie the first being that of owing money for in very truth debts and lying are ordinarily joined together i will nevertheless not from hence infer that none must owe anything or lend anything for who so rich can be that sometimes may not owe or who can be so poor that sometimes may not lend let the occasion notwithstanding in that case as plato very wisely saith and ordaineth in his laws be such that none be permitted to draw any water out of his neighbour's well until first they by continual digging and delving into their own proper ground shall have hit upon a kind of potter's earth which is called ceramite and there had found no source or drop of water for that sort of earth by reason of its substance which is fat strong firm and close so retaineth its humidity that it doth not easily evaporate it by any outward excursion or evaporation in good sooth it is a great shame to choose rather to be still borrowing in all places from every one than to work and win then only in my judgment should one lend when the diligent toiling and industrious person is no longer able by his labour to make any purchase unto himself or otherwise when by mischance he has suddenly fallen into an unexpected loss of his goods howsoever let us leave this discourse and from henceforwards do not hang upon creditors nor tie yourself to them i make account for the time past to rid you freely of them and from their bondage to deliver you the least i should in this point quoth panurge is to thank you though it be the most i can do and if gratitude and thanksgiving be to be estimated and prized by the affection of the benefactor that is to be done infinitely and some paternally for the love which you bear me of your own accord and free grace without any merit of mine goeth far beyond the reach of any price or value it transcends all weight all number all measure it is endless and everlasting therefore should i offer to commensurate and adjust it either to the size and proportion of your own noble and gracious deeds or yet to the contentment and delight of the obliged receivers i would come off but very faintly and flaggingly you have verily done me a great deal of good and multiplied your favours on me more frequently than was fitting to one of my condition you have been more bountiful towards me than i have deserved and your courtesies have by far surpassed the extent of my merits i must needs confess it but it is not as you suppose in the proposed matter for there it is not where i itch it is not there where it fretteth hurts or vexeth me for henceforth being quit and out of debt what countenance will i be able to keep you may imagine that it will become me very ill for the first month because i have never hitherto been brought up or accustomed to it i am very much afraid of it furthermore there shall not one hereafter native of the country of salma gandhi but he shall level the shot towards my nose all the back cracking fellows of the world in discharging of their postern paterades use commonly to say voila pour les quittes that is for the quit my life will be a very short continuance i do foresee it i recommend to you the making of my epitaph for i perceive i will die confected in the very stench of farts if at any time to come by way of restorative to such good women as shall happen to be troubled with the grievous pain of the wind colic the ordinary medicaments prove nothing effectual the mummy of all my befarted body will straight be as a present remedy appointed by the physicians whereof they taking any small modicum it will incontinently for their ease afford them a rattle of bum-shot 
like a sow of muskets therefore would i beseech you to leave me some few centuries of debts as king louis the eleventh exempting from suits in law the reverend maudillier bishop of chartres was by the said bishop most earnestly solicited to leave him some few for the exercise of his mind i had rather give them all my revenue of the periwinkles together with the other incomes of the locusts albeit i should not thereby have any parcel abated from off the principal sums which i owe let us waive this matter quoth pantagruel i have told it you over again End of chapter three five chapter three six of gargantua and pantagruel book three by francois rabelais this librivox recording is in the public domain why new married men were privileged from going to the wars but in the interim asked panurge by what law was it constituted ordained and established that such as should plant a new vineyard those that should build a new house and the new married men should be exempted and discharged from the duty of warfare for the first year by the law answered pantagruel of moses why replied panurge the lately married as for the vine planters i am now too old to reflect on them my condition at this present induceth me to remain satisfied with the care of vintage finishing and turning the grapes into wine nor are these pretty new builders of dead stones written or pricked down in my book of life it is all with live stones that i set up and erect the fabrics of my architecture to wit men it was according to my opinion quoth pantagruel to the end first that the fresh married folks should for the first year reap a full and complete fruition of their pleasures in their mutual exercise of the act of love in such sort that in waiting more at leisure on the production of posterity and propagating of their progeny they might the better increase their race and make provision of new heirs that if in the years thereafter the men should upon their undergoing of some military adventure happen to be killed their names and coats of arms might continue with their children in the same families and next that the wives thereby coming to know whether they were barren or fruitful for one year's trial in regard of the maturity of age wherein of old they married was held sufficient for the discovery they might pitch the more suitably in case of their first husband's decease upon a second match the fertile women to be wedded to those who desire to multiply their issue and the sterile ones to such other mates as misregarding the storing of their own lineage choose them only for their virtues learning genteel behaviour domestic consolation management of the house and matrimonial conveniences and comforts and such like the preachers of varennes saith panurge detest and abhor the second marriages as altogether foolish and dishonest foolish and dishonest quoth pantagruel a plague take such preachers yea but quoth panurge the like mischief also befall the friar charmer who in a full auditory making a sermon at perilly and therein abominating the reiteration of marriage and the entering again in the bonds of a nuptial tie did swear and heartily give himself to the swiftest devil in hell if he had not rather choose and would much more willingly undertake the unmaidening or depuculating of a hundred virgins than the simple drudgery of one widow truly i find your reason in that point right good and strongly grounded but what would you think if the cause why this exemption or immunity was granted had no other foundation but that during the whole space of the said first year they so lustily bobbed it with their female consorts as both reason and equity require they should do that they had drained 
and evacuated their spermatic vessels and were become thereby altogether feeble weak emasculated drooping and flaggingly pithless yea in such sort that they in the day of battle like ducks which plunge over head and ears would sooner hide themselves behind the baggage than in the company of valiant fighters and daring military combatants appear where stern bellona deals her blows and moves a bustling noise of thwacks and thumps nor is it to be thought that under the standard of mars they will so much as once strike a fair stroke because their most considerable knocks have been already jerked and wirreted within the curtains of his sweetheart venus in confirmation whereof amongst other relics and monuments of antiquity we now as yet often see that in all great houses after the expiring of some few days these young married blades are readily sent away to visit their uncles that in the absence of their wives reposing themselves a little they may recover their decayed strength by the recruit of a fresh supply the more vigorous to return again and face about to renew the dueling shock and conflict of an amorous dalliance albeit for the greater part they have neither uncle nor aunt to go to just so did the king crackart after the battle of the cornets not cashier us speaking properly i mean me and the quail caller but for our refreshment remanded us to our houses and he is as yet seeking after his own my grandfather's godmother was wont to say to me when i was a boy pas de notre et horizon sans pour cela qui les retillons un fifre en venaisissant et plus fort que deux qui en bion not horizons no paternosters shall ever disorder my brain one cadet to the field as he flutters is worth two when they end the campaign that which prompteth me to that opinion is that the vine planters did seldom eat of the grapes or drink of the wine of their labour till the first year was wholly elapsed during all which time also the builders did hardly inhabit their new structured dwelling-places for fear of dying suffocated through want of respiration as galen hath most learnedly remarked in the second book of the difficulty of breathing under favour sir i have not asked this question without cause causing and reason truly very rationant be not offended i pray you End of chapter three six chapter three seven of gargantua and pantagruel book three by francois rabelais this librivox recording is in the public domain how panurge had a flea in his ear and forbore to wear any longer his magnificent codpiece panurge the day thereafter caused pierce his right ear after the jewish fashion and thereto clasped a little gold ring of a ferny like kind of workmanship in the bezel or collet whereof was set and encased a flea and to the end you may be rid of all doubts you are to know that the flea was black oh what a brave thing it is in every case and circumstance of a matter to be thoroughly well informed the sum of the expense hereof being cast up brought in and laid down upon his council board carpet was found to amount to no more quarterly than the charge of the nuptials of a hyrcanian tigress even as you would say six hundred thousand maravedis at these vast costs and excessive disbursements as soon as he perceived himself to be out of debt he fretted much and afterwards as tyrants and lawyers used to do he nourished and fed her with the sweat and blood of his subjects and clients he then took four french ells of a coarse brown russet cloth and therein apparelling himself as with a long plain seamed and single stitched gown left off the wearing of his breeches and tied a pair of spectacles 
to his cap in this equipage did he present himself before pantagruel to whom this disguise appeared the more strange that he did not as before see that goodly fair and stately codpiece which was the sole anchor of hope wherein he was wanted to rely and last refuge he had midst all the waves and boisterous billows which a stormy cloud in a cross fortune would raise up against him honest pantagruel not understanding the mystery asked him by way of interrogatory what he did intend to personate in that new-fangled prosopopoeia i have answered panurge a flea in mine ear and have a mind to marry in a good time quoth pantagruel you have told me joyful tidings yet would not i hold a red-hot iron in my hand for all the gladness of them but it is not the fashion of lovers to be accoutred in such dangling vestments so as to have their shirts flagging down over their knees without breeches and with a long robe of a dark brown mingled hue which is a colour never used in Talarian garments amongst any persons of honour quality or virtue if some heretical persons and schismatical sectaries have at any time formerly been so arrayed and clothed though many have imputed such a kind of dress to coasnage cheat imposture and an affectation of tyranny upon credulous minds of the rude multitude i will nevertheless not blame them for it nor in that point judge rashly or sinistrously of them every one overflowingly aboundeth in his own sense and fancy yea in things of a foreign consideration altogether extrinsical and indifferent which in and of themselves are neither commendable nor bad because they proceed not from the interior of the thoughts and heart which is the shop of all good and evil of goodness if it be upright and that its affections be regulated by the pure and clean spirit of righteousness and on the other side of wickedness if its inclinations straying beyond the bounds of equity be corrupted and depraved by the malice and suggestions of the devil it is only the novelty and newfangledness of thereof which i dislike together with the contempt of common custom and the fashion which is in use the colour answered panurge is convenient for it it is conformed to that of my council board carpet therefore will i henceforth hold me with it and more narrowly and circumspectly than ever hitherto i have done look to my affairs and business seeing i am once out of debt you never yet saw man more unpleasing than i will be if god help me not lo here be my spectacles do see me afar off you would readily say that it were friar john burgess i believe certainly that in the next ensuing year i shall once more preach the crusade bounce buckram do you see this russet doubt not but there lurketh under it some hid property an occult virtue known to very few in the world i did not take it on before this morning and nevertheless am already in a rage of lust mad after a wife and vehemently hot upon untying the codpiece point i itch i tingle i wriggle and long exceedingly to be married that without the danger of cudgel blows i may labour my female copes mate with the hard push of a bull-horned devil oh the provident and thrifty husband that i then will be after my death with all honour and respect due to my frugality will they burn the sacred bulk of my body of purpose to preserve the ashes thereof in memory of the choicest pattern that ever was of a perfectly wary and complete householder cop's body this is not the carpet whereon my treasurer shall be allowed to play false in his accounts with me by setting down an x for a v or an l for an s for in that case should i make a hail of fisticuffs to fly into his face look upon me sir both before and behind it is made after the manner of a toga which was the ancient fashion of the romans in time of peace i took the mode shape and form thereof in trajan's column at rome as also in the triumphant arch of septimus severus i am tired of the wars weary of wearing buff coats cassocks and hocatons my shoulders are pitifully worn and bruised with the carrying of harness let armour cease and the long robe bear a sway at least it must be so for the whole space of the succeeding year if i be married 
as yesterday by the mosaic law you evidenced in what concerneth the breaches my great aunt lawrence did long ago tell me that the breaches were only ordained for the use of the codpiece and to no other end which i upon a no less forcible consequence give credit to every wit as well as to the saying of the fine fellow galen who in his ninth book of the use and employment of our members alleged that the head was made for the eyes for nature might have placed our heads in our knees or elbows but having beforehand determined that the eyes should serve to discover things from afar she for the better enabling them to execute their designed office fixed them in the head as on the top of a long pole in the most eminent part of all the body no otherwise than we see the fairies or high towers erected in the mouths of havens that navigators may the further off perceive with ease the lights of the nightly fires and lanterns and because i would gladly for some short while a year at least take a little rest and breathing time from the toilsome labour of the military profession that is to say be married i have desisted from wearing any more a codpiece and consequently have laid aside my breeches for the codpiece is the principal and most especial piece of armour that a warrior doth carry and therefore do i maintain even to the fire exclusively understand you me that no turks can properly be said to be armed men in regard that codpieces are by their law forbidden to be worn End of chapter three seven chapter three eight of gargantua and pantagruel book three by francois rabelais this librivox recording is in the public domain why the codpiece is held to be the chief piece of armour amongst warriors will you maintain quoth pantagruel that the codpiece is the chief piece of a military harness it is a new kind of doctrine very paradoxical for we say at spurs begins the arming of a man sir i maintain it answered panurge and not wrongfully do i maintain it behold how nature having a fervent desire after its production of plants trees shrubs herbs sponges and plant animals to eternize and continue them unto all succession of ages in their several kinds or sorts at least although the individuals perish unruinable and in an everlasting being have most curiously armed and fenced their buds sprouts shoots and seeds wherein the above-mentioned perpetuity consisteth by strengthening covering guarding and fortifying them with an admirable industry with husks cases scurfs and swaths hulls cods stones films cartels shells ears rinds barks skins ridges and prickles which serve them instead of strong fare and natural codpieces as is manifest the apparent in peas beans vassals pomegranates peaches cottons gourds pumpions melons corn lemons almonds walnuts filberts and chestnuts as likewise in all plants slips or sets whatsoever wherein it is plainly and evidently seen that the sperm and cements is more closely veiled overshadowed corroborated and thoroughly harnessed than any other part portion or parcel of the whole nature nevertheless did not after that manner provide for the sempiternizing of the human race but on the contrary created man naked tender and frail without either offensive or defensive arms and that in the estate of innocence in the first age of all which was the golden season not as a plant but living creature born for peace not war and brought forth into the world with an unquestionable right and title to the plenary fruition and enjoyment of all fruits and vegetables as also to a certain calm and gentle rule and dominion over all kinds of beasts fowls fishes reptiles and insects yet afterwards it happening in the time of the iron age under the reign of jupiter when to the multiplication of mischievous actions wickedness and malice began to take root and footing within the then perverted hearts of men that the earth began to bring forth 
nettles thistles thorns briars and such other stubborn and rebellious vegetables to the nature of man nor scarce was there any animal which by a fatal disposition did not then revolt from him and tacitly conspire and covenant with one another to serve him no longer nor in case of their ability to resist to do him any manner of obedience but rather to the uttermost of their power to annoy him with all the hurt and harm they could the man then that he might maintain his primitive right and prerogative and continuous sway and dominion over all both vegetable and sensitive creatures and knowing of a truth that he could not be well accommodated as he ought without the servitude and subjection of several animals bethought himself that of necessity he must needs put on arms and make provision of harness against wars and violence by the holy saint babin goose cried out pantagruel you are become since the last reign a great liffer loafer philosopher i should say take notice sir quoth panurge when dame nature had prompted him to his own arming what part of the body it was where by her inspiration he clapped on the first harness it was forsooth by the double pluck of my little dog the balak and good signor don priapus stabo stando which done he was content and sought no more this is certified by the testimony of the great hebrew captain and philosopher moses who affirmeth that he fenced that member with a brave and gallant codpiece most exquisitely framed and by right curious devices of a notably pregnant invention made up and composed of fig-tree leaves which by reason of their solid stiffness incisory notches curled frizzling sleek smoothness large ampleness together with their colour smell virtue and faculty were exceeding proper and fit for the covering and arming of the satchels of generation the hideously big lorraine cullions being from thence only excepted which swaggering down to the lower most bottom of the breeches cannot abide but being quite out of all order and method the stately fashion of the high and lofty codpiece as is manifest by the noble valentine diardier whom i found at nancy on the first day of may the more flauntingly to gallantries it afterwards rubbing his bollocks spread out upon a table after the manner of a spanish cloak wherefore it is that none should henceforth say who would not speak improperly when any country bumpkin hieth to the wars have a care my royster of the wine-pot that is the skull but have a care my royster of the milk-pot that is the testicles by the whole rabble of the horned fiends of hell the head being cut off that single person only thereby dieth but if the bollocks be marred the whole race of humankind would forthwith perish and be lost for ever this was the motive which incited the goodly writer galen book one de spermata to aver with boldness that it were better that is to say a less evil to have no heart at all than to be quite destitute of genitories for there is laid up conserved and put in store as in a successive repository and sacred warehouse the cements and original source of the whole offspring of mankind therefore would i be apt to believe for less than a hundred francs that those are the very same stones by means whereof deucalion and pyrrha restored the human race in peopling with men and women the world which a little before that had been drowned in the overflowing waves of a poetical deluge this stirred up the valiant justinian book four de cogitus polendus to collocate his summum bonum in braguibus et braguitis for this and other causes the lord humphrey de merville following of his king to a certain warlike expedition whilst he was in trying upon his own person a new suit of armour for of his old rusty harness he could make no more use by reason that some few years since the skin of his belly was a great way removed from his kidneys his lady thereupon in the profound musing of a contemplative spirit very maturely considering that he had but small care of the staff of love and packet of marriage seeing he did no otherwise arm that part of the body than with links of mail advised him to shield fence and gabionate it with a big tilting helmet which she had lying in her closet to otherwise utterly unprofitable 
on this lady were penned these subsequent verses which are extant in the third book of the shit brana of paltry wenches when yolan saw her spouse equipped for fight and save the codpiece all in armour dight my dear she cried why pray of all the rest is that exposed you know i love the best was she to blame for an ill-managed fear or rather pious conscionable care wise lady she in hurly-burly fight can any tell where random blows may light leave off then sir from being astonished and wonder no more at this new manner of decking and trimming up of myself as you now see me End of chapter three eight chapter three nine of for gargantua and pantagruel book three by francois rabelais this librivox recording is in the public domain how panurge asketh counsel of pantagruel whether he should marry yea or no to this pantagruel replying nothing panurge prosecuted the discourse he had already broached and therewithal fetching as from the bottom of his heart a very deep sigh said my lord and master you have heard the design i am upon which is to marry if by some disastrous mischance all the holes in the world be not shut up stopped closed and bushed i humbly beseech you for the affection which of a long time you have borne me to give me your best advice therein then answered pantagruel seeing you have so decreed taken deliberation thereon and that the matter is fully determined what need is there of any further talk thereof but forthwith to put it into execution what you have resolved yea but quoth panurge i would be loath to act anything therein without your counsel had thereto it is my judgment also quoth pantagruel and i advise you to it nevertheless quoth panurge if i understood aright that it were much better for me to remain a bachelor as i am than to run headlong upon new harebrained undertakings of conjugal adventure i would rather choose not to marry quoth pantagruel then do not marry yea but quoth panurge would you have me so solitarily drive out the whole course of my life without the comfort of a matrimonial consort you know it is written way solely and a single person has never seen to reap the joy and solace that is found with married folks then marry in the name of god quoth pantagruel but if quoth panurge my wife should make me a cuckold as it is not unknown unto you how this hath been a very plentiful year in the production of that kind of cattle i would fly out and grow impatient beyond all measure and mean i love cuckolds with my heart for they seem unto me to be of a right honest conversation and i truly do very willingly frequent their company but should i die for it i would not be one of their number that is a point for me of a too sore prickling point then do not marry quoth pantagruel for without all controversy this sentence of seneca is infallibly true what thou to others shalt have done others will do the like to thee do you quoth panurge aver that without all exception yes truly quoth pantagruel without all exception ho ho says panurge by the wrath of a little devil his meaning is either in this world or in the other which is to come yet seeing i can no more want a wife than a blind man his staff for the funnel must be in agitation without which manner of occupation i cannot live were it not a great deal better for me to apply and associate myself to some one honest lovely and virtuous woman than as i do by a new change of females every day run a hazard of being bastinadoed 
or which is worse of the great pox if not of both together for never be it spoken by their husbands leave and favour had i enjoyment yet of an honest woman marry then in god's name quoth pantagruel but if quoth panurge it were the will of god and that my destiny did unluckily lead me to marry an honest woman who should beat me i would be stored with more than two-thirds parts of the patience of job if i were not stark mad by it and quite distracted with such rugged dealings for it hath been told me that those exceeding honest women have ordinarily very wicked headpieces therefore is it that their family lacketh not for good vinegar yet in that case should it go worse with me if i did not then in such sort bang her back and breast so thumpingly bethwack her gillets to wit her arms legs head lights liver and milk with her other entrails and mangle jag and slash her coat so after the cross billet fashion that the greatest devil of hell should wait at the gate for the reception of her damned soul i could make a shift for this year to waive such molestation and disquiet and be content to lay aside that trouble and not to be engaged in it do not marry then answered pantagruel yea but quoth panurge considering the condition wherein i now am out of debt and unmarried mark what i say free from all debt in an ill hour for were i deeply on the score my creditors would be but too careful of my paternity but being quit and not married nobody will be so regardful of me or carry towards me a love like that which is said to be in a conjugal affection and if by some mishap i should fall sick i would be looked to very waywardly the wise man saith where there is no woman i mean the mother of a family and wife in the union of a lawful wedlock the crazy and diseased are in danger of being ill-used and of having much brabbling and strife about them as by clear experience hath been made apparent in the persons of popes legates cardinals bishops abbots priors priests and monks but there assure yourself you shall not find me marry then in the name of god answered pantagruel but if quoth banerge being ill at ease and possibly through that distemper made unable to discharge the matrimonial duty that is incumbent to an active husband my wife impatient of that drooping sickness and faint fits of a pining languishment should abandon and prostitute herself to the embraces of another man and not only then not help and assist me in my extremity and need but with all flout at and make sport of that my grievous distress and calamity or peradventure which is worse embezzle my goods and steal from me as i have seen it oftentimes befall unto the lot of many other men it were enough to undo me utterly to fill brimful the cup of my misfortune and make me play the mad pate reeks of bedlam do not marry then quoth pantagruel yea but said panurge i shall never by any other means come to have lawful sons and daughters in whom i may harbour some hope of perpetuating my name and arms and to whom also i may leave and bequeath my inheritances and purchased goods of which latter sort you need not doubt but that in some one or other of these mornings i will make a fair and goodly show that so i may cheer up and make merry when otherwise i should be plunged into a peevish sullen mood of pensive sullenness as i do perceive daily by the gentle and loving carriage of your kind and gracious father towards you as all honest folks used to do at their own homes and private dwelling-houses or being free from debt and yet not married if casually i should fret and be angry although the cause of my grief and displeasure were never so just i am afraid instead of consolation that i should meet with nothing else but scoffs frumps jibes and mocks at my disastrous fortune marry then in the name of god quoth pantagruel end of chapter three nine chapter three ten of gargantua and pantagruel book three by francois rabelais this librivox recording is in the public domain how pantagruel representeth unto panurge the difficulty of giving advice in the matter of marriage and to that purpose mentioneth somewhat 
of the homeric and virgilian lotteries your counsel quoth panurge under your correction and favour seemeth unto me not unlike to the song of gammer yea by nay it is full of sarcasms mockeries bitter taunts nipping bobs derisive quips biting jerks and contradictory iterations the one part destroying the other i know not quoth pantagruel which of all my answers to lay hold on for your proposals are so full of ifs and buts that i can ground nothing on them nor pitch upon any solid and positive determination satisfactory to what is demanded by them are not you assured within yourself of what you have a mind to the chief and main point of the whole matter lieth there all the rest is merely casual and totally dependeth upon the fatal disposition of the heavens we see some so happy in the fortune of this nuptial encounter that their family shineth as it were with the radiant effulgency of an idea model or representation of the joys of paradise and perceive others again to be so unluckily matched in the conjugal yoke that those very basest of devils which tempt the hermits that inhabit the deserts of thebais and montserrat are not more miserable than they it is therefore expedient seeing you are resolved for once to take a trial of the state of marriage that with shut eyes bowing your head and kissing the ground you put the business to a venture and give it a fair hazard in recommending the success of the residue to the disposure of almighty god it lieth not in my power to give you any other manner of assurance or otherwise to certify you of what shall ensue on this your undertaking nevertheless if it please you this you may do bring hither virgil's poems that after having opened the book and with our fingers severed the leaves thereof three several times we may according to the number agreed upon betwixt ourselves explore the future hap of your intended marriage for frequently by a homeric lottery have many hit upon their destinies as is testified by the person of socrates who whilst he was in prison hearing the recitation of this verse of homer said of achilles in the ninth of the iliads imadi que tratato pythian eribolon icoi men we the third day to fertile pythia came thereby foresaw that on the third subsequent day he was to die of the truth whereof he assured e kines as plato in Criton, cicero in primo de divinatione diogenes laertius and others have to the full recorded in their works the like is also witnessed by opilius macrinus to whom being desirous to know if he should be the roman emperor befell by chance of lot this sentence and the eighth of the iliads o geron a mala de se noe ter rosi merketai ze debin le lutai chalapan de se geris opazai dotard new warriors urge thee to be gone thy life decays and old age weighs thee down in fact he being then somewhat ancient had hardly enjoyed the sovereignty of the empire for the space of fourteen months when by heliogabalus then both young and strong he was dispossessed thereof thrust out of all and killed brutus doth also bear witness of another experiment of this nature who willing through this exploratory way by lot to learn what the event and issue should be of the far sailing of battle wherein he perished he casually encountered on this verse said of patroclus in the sixteenth of the iliads a la memoire oloi kai letus ectonin uois fate and latona's son have shot me dead and accordingly apollo was the field word in the dreadful day of that fight divers notable things of old have likewise been foretold and known by casting of virgilian lots yea in matters of no less importance than the obtaining of the roman empire as it happened to alexander severus who trying his fortune at the said kind of lottery did hit upon this verse written in the sixth of the aeneids to regere imperio populus romana memento no roman that thy business is to reign he within very few years thereafter was effectually and in good earnest created 
and installed roman emperor a semblable story thereto is related of adrian who being hugely perplexed within himself out of a longing humour to know in what account he was with the emperor trajan and how large the measure of that affection was which he did bear unto him had recourse after the manner above specified to the moronian lottery which by haphazard tendered him these lines out of the sixth of the aeneids quis procul illi autumn ramus insignis olibi sacra ferens nasco crinus in canaque menta regis romani but who is he conspicuous from afar with olive boughs that doth his offerings bear by the white hair and beard i know him plain the roman king shortly thereafter was he adopted by trajan and succeeded to him in the empire moreover to the lot of the praiseworthy emperor claudius befell this line of virgil written in the sixth of his aeneids tertia dum latia regnantum bitterit istas whilst the third summer saw him reign a king in latium and in effect he did not reign above two years to the said claudian also inquiring concerning his brother quintilius whom he proposed as a colleague with himself in the empire happened the response following in the sixth of the aeneids ostendent terris hunc tantum bata whom fate let us see and would no longer suffer him to be and it so fell out for he was killed on the seventeenth day after he had attained unto the management of the imperial charge the very same lot also with the like misluck did betide the emperor gordian the younger to claudius albinus being very solicitous to understand somewhat of his future adventures did occur this saying which is written in the sixth of the aeneids hic rem romanum magno turbante tumultui sisset equus etc the romans boiling with tumultuous rage this warrior shall the dangerous storm assuage with victories or he the carthaginian malls and with strong hands shall crush the rebel gauls likewise when the emperor d claudius aurelian's predecessor did with great eagerness research after the fate to come of his posterity his hap was to alight on this verse in the first of the aeneids hic ego nec metis rerum nec tempora pono no bounds are to be set no limits here which was fulfilled by the goodly genealogical row of his race when mr peter amy did in like manner explore and make trial if he should escape the ambush of the hobgoblins who lay in wait all to bemaul him he fell upon this verse in the third of the aeneids hue fugae crudelis terris fugae litus averum o flee the bloody land the wicked shore which counsel he obeying safe and sound forthwith avoided all these ambuscades were it not to shun prolixity i could enumerate a thousand such like adventures which conform to the dictate and verdict of the verse have by that manner of lot-casting encounter befallen to the curious researches of them do not you nevertheless imagine lest you should be deluded that i would upon this kind of fortune flinging proof infer an uncontrollable and not to be gainsaid infallibility of truth End of chapter three ten chapter three eleven of gargantua and pantagruel book three by francois rabelais this librivox recording is in the public domain how pantagruel showeth the trial of one's fortune by the throwing of dice to be unlawful it would be sooner done quoth panurge and more expeditely if we should try the matter at the chance of three fair dice quoth pantagruel that sort of lottery is deceitful abusive illicitous and exceedingly scandalous never trust in it the accursed book of the recreation of dice was a great while ago excogitated in decaea near Bourg, by that ancient enemy of mankind the infernal calumniator who before the statue or massive image of the bouraic hercules did of old and doth in several places of the world as yet make many simple souls to err 
and fall into his snares you know how my father gargantua hath forbidden it over all his kingdoms and dominions how he hath caused burn the moulds and draughts thereof and altogether suppressed abolished driven forth and cast it out of the land as a most dangerous plague and infection to any well-polished state or commonwealth what i have told you of dice i say the same of the play at cockall it is a lottery of the like guile and deceitfulness and therefore do not for convincing of me allege in opposition to this my opinion or bring in the example of the fortunate cast of tiberius within the fountain of apennus at the oracle of gerion these are the baited hooks by which the devil attracts and draweth unto him the foolish souls of silly people into eternal perdition nevertheless to satisfy your humour in some measure i am content you throw three dice upon this table that according to the number of the blots which shall happen to be cast up we may hit upon a verse of that page which in the setting open of the book you shall have pitched upon have you any dice in your pocket a whole bagful answered banerge that is provision against the devil as is expounded by merlin cocaeus book two de patria diabolorum the devil would be sure to take me napping and very much at unawares if he should find me without dice with this the three dice being taken out produced and thrown they fell so pat upon the lower points that the cast was five six and five these are quoth panurge sixteen in all let us take the sixteenth line of the page the number pleaseth me very well i hope we shall have a prosperous and happy chance may i be thrown amidst all the devils of hell even as a great bowl cast athwart at a set of ninepins or cannon-ball shot among a battalion of foot in case so many times i do not bolt my future wife the first night of our marriage of that forsooth i make no doubt at all quoth pantagruel you needed not to have wrapped forth such a horrid imprecation the sooner to procure credit for the performance of so small a business seeing possibly the first bout will be amiss and that you know is usually at tennis called fifteen at the next justling turn you may readily amend that fault and so complete your reckoning of sixteen is it so quoth banerge that you understand the matter and must my words be thus interpreted nay believe me never yet was any solecism committed by that valiant champion who often hath for me in bellydale stood sentry at the hypogastrian cranny did you ever hitherto find me in the confraternity of the faulty never i trow never nor ever shall for ever and a day i do the feat like a goodly friar or a father confessor without the fault and therein am i willing to be judged by the players he had no sooner spoke these words than the works of virgil were brought in but before the book was laid open panurge said to pantagruel my heart like the firch of a heart in a rut doth beat within my breast be pleased to feel and grope my pulse a little on this artery of my left arm at its frequent rise and fall you would say that they swinge and belabour me after the manner of a probationer posed and put to a peremptory trial in the examination of his sufficiency for the discharge of the learned duty of a graduate in some eminent degree in the college of the sorbonists but would you not hold it expedient before we proceed any further that we should invocate hercules and the tenetian goddesses who in the chamber of lots are said to rule sit in judgment and bear a presidential sway neither him nor them answered pantagruel only open up the leaves of the book with your fingers and set your nails a work End of 
chapter three eleven chapter three twelve of gargantua and pantagruel book three by francois rabelais this librivox recording is in the public domain how pantagruel doth explore by the virgilian lottery what fortune panurge shall have in his marriage then at the opening of the book in the sixteenth row of the lines of the disclosed page did panurge encounter upon this following verse nec deus hunc mensa dea nec dignata cubili est the god him from his table banished nor would the goddess have him in her bed this response quoth pantagruel maketh not very much for your benefit or advantage for it plainly signifies and denoteth that your wife shall be a strumpet and yourself by consequence a cuckold the goddess whom you shall not find propitious nor favourable unto you is minerva a most redoubtable and dreadful virgin a powerful and fulminating goddess an enemy to cuckolds and effeminate youngsters to cuckold makers and adulterers the goddess jupiter a terrible and thunder-striking god from heaven and withal it is to be remarked that conformed to the doctrine of the ancient etrurians the manubis for so did they call the darting hurls or a slinging pass of the vulcanian thunderbolts did only appertain to her and to jupiter her father capital this was verified in the conflagration of the ships of ajax oileus nor doth this fulminating power belong to any other of the olympic gods men therefore stand not in such fear of them moreover i will tell you and you may take it as extracted out of the profoundest mysteries a mythology that when the giants had enterprised the waging of a war against the power of the celestial orbs the gods at first did laugh at those attempts and scorned such despicable enemies who were in their conceit not strong enough to cope in feats of warfare with their pages but when they saw by the gigantine labour the high hill pelion set on lofty ossa and that the mount olympus was made shake to be erected on the top of both then it was it that jupiter held a parliament or general convention wherein it was unanimously resolved upon and condescended to by all the gods that they should worthily and valiantly stand to their defence and because they had often seen battles lost by the cumbersome lets and disturbing encumbrances of women confusedly huddled in amongst armies it was at that time decreed and enacted that they should expel and drive out of heaven into egypt and the confines of nile that whole crew of goddesses disguised in the shapes of weasels polecats bats shrew mice ferrets full marts and other such like odd transformations only minerva was reserved to participate with jupiter in the horrific fulminating power as being the goddess both of war and learning of arts and arms of counsel and dispatch a goddess armed from her birth a goddess dreaded in heaven in the air by sea and land by the belly of saint buff quoth panurge should i be vulcan whom the poet blazons nay i am neither a cripple coiner a false money nor smith as he was my wife possibly will be as comely and handsome as ever was his venus but not a whore like her nor i a cuckold like him the crook-legged slovenly slave made himself to be declared a cuckold by a definite sentence and judgment in the open view of all the gods for this cause ought you to interpret the aforementioned verse quite contrary to what you have said this lot importeth that my wife will be honest virtuous chaste loyal and faithful not armed surly wayward cross giddy humorous heady hair-brained or extracted out of the brains as was the goddess pallas nor shall this fair jolly jupiter be my co-rival he shall never dip his bread in my broth though we should sit together at one table consider his exploits and gallant actions he was the manifest ruffian wencher whoremonger and most infamous cuckold maker that ever breathed he did always lecher it like a boar and no wonder for he was fostered by a sow in the isle of candia if agathocles the babylonian be not a liar and more ramishly lascivious than a buck whence it is that he is said by others 
to have been suckled and fed with the milk of the almethian goat by the virtue of acheron he jostled bold and lastoriated in one day the third part of the world beasts and people floods and mountains that was europa for this grand subagitatory achievement the ammonians cause draw a delineate and paint him in the figure and shape of a ram ramming and horned ram but i know well enough how to shield and preserve myself from that horned champion he will not trust me have to deal in my person with a sottish duncical amphitryon nor with a silly witless argus for all his hundred spectacles nor yet with the cowardly meacock acrisius the simple goose-cap lycus of thebes the doting blockhead agenor the phlegmatic pegus aesop rough-footed lycaon the luskis misshapen coritus of tuscany nor with the large-backed and strong-reined atlas let him alter change transform metamorphose himself into a hundred various shapes and figures into a swan a bull a satyr a shower of gold or into a cuckoo as he did when he unmaidened his sister juno into an eagle ram or dove as when he was enamoured of the virgin phthia who then dwelt in the aegean territory into fire a serpent yea even into a flea into epicurean and democratical atoms or more magistro nostralistically into those sly intentions of the mind which in the schools are called second notions i'll catch him in the nick and take him napping and would you know what i would do unto him even that which to his father Callum saturn did seneca foretold it of me and lactantius hath confirmed it what the goddess rhea did to athos i would make him two stone lighter rid him of his cyprian symbols and cut so close and neatly by the breach that there shall not remain thereof so much as one so cleanly would i shave him and disable him for ever from being pope for testiculus non habit ho there said pantagruel ho soft and fair my lad enough of that cast up turn over the leaves and try your fortune for the second time then did he fall upon this ensuing verse membra quatit gelidisque quat formidine sanguis his joints and members quake he becomes pale and sudden fear doth his cold blood congeal this importeth quoth pantagruel that she will soundly bang your back and belly clean and quite contrary answered panurge it is of me that he prognosticates in saying that i will beat her like a tiger if she vex me sir martin wagstaff will perform that office and in default of a cudgel the devil gulp him if i should not eat her up quick as candal the lydian king did his wife whom he ravened and devoured you are very stout says pantagruel and courageous hercules himself durst hardly venture to scuffle with you in this your raging fury nor is it strange for the jan is worth two and two in fight against hercules are too too strong am i a jan quoth panurge no no answered pantagruel my mind was only running upon the lurch and trick track thereafter did he hit at the third opening of the book upon this verse thoaminio pridei at spoliorum ar debat amore after the spoil and pillage as in fire he burnt with a strong feminine desire this portendeth quoth pantagruel that she will steal your goods and rob you hence this according to these three drawn lots will be your future destiny i clearly see it you will be a cuckold you will be beaten and you will be robbed nay it is quite otherwise quoth panurge for it is certain that this verse presages that she will love me with a perfect liking nor did the satyr writing poet lie in proof hereof when he affirmed that a woman burning with extreme affection takes sometimes pleasure to steal from her sweetheart and what i pray you a glove a point or some such trifling toy of no importance to make him keep a gentle kind of stirring in the research in quest thereof in like manner these small scolding debates and petty brabbling contentions which frequently we see spring up and for a certain space boil very hot betwixt the couple of high-spirited lovers are nothing else but recreative diversions for their refreshment spurs to and incentives of a more fervent amity than ever as for example we do sometimes see cuddlers and with hammers maul their finest whetstones therewith to sharpen their iron tools the better and therefore do i think that these three lots make much for my advantage which if not i from their sentence totally appeal there is no appellation quoth pantagruel from the decrees of fate or destiny of lot or chance as is recorded by our ancient lawyers witness baldus liber ultimum capus de legi us the reason hereof is 
fortune doth not acknowledge a superior to whom an appeal may be made from her or any of her substitutes and in this case the pupil cannot be restored to his right in full as openly by the said author is alleged in liber eight praetor paragraph alt following de minor End of chapter three twelve chapter three thirteen of gargantua and pantagruel book three by francois rabelais this librivox recording is in the public domain how pantagruel adviseth panurge to try the future good or bad luck of his marriage by dreams now seeing we cannot agree together in the manner of expounding or interpreting the sense of the virgilian lots let us bend our course another way and try a new sort of divination of what kind asked panurge of a good ancient and authentic fashion answered pantagruel it is by dreams for in dreaming such circumstances and conditions being thereto adhibited as are clearly enough described by hippocrates in liber peri tum enupnion by plato plotin m plicus synesius aristotle xenophon galen plutarch artemidorus daldianus herophilus q caliber theocritus pliny athenaeus and others the soul doth oftentimes foresee what is to come how true this is you may conceive by a very vulgar and familiar example as when you see that at such a time as suckling babes well nourished fed and fostered with good milk sleep soundly and profoundly the nurses in the interim get leave to sport themselves and are licentiated to recreate their fancies at what range to them shall seem most fitting and expedient their presence sedulity and attendance on the cradle being during all that space held unnecessary even just so when our body is at rest that the concoction is everywhere accomplished and that till it awake it lacks for nothing our soul delighteth to disport itself and is well pleased in that frolic to take a review of its native country which is the heavens where it receiveth a most notable participation of its first beginning with an imbuement from its divine source and in contemplation of that infinite and intellectual sphere where the centre is everywhere and the circumference in no place of the universal world to wit god according to the doctrine of hermes trismegistus to whom no new thing happeneth whom nothing that is past escapeth and unto whom all things are alike present remarketh not only what is preterite and gone in the inferior chorus and agitation of sublunary matters but withal taketh notice what is to come then bringing a relation of those future events unto the body of the outward senses and exterior organs it is divulged abroad unto the hearing of others whereupon the owner of that soul deserveth to be termed a vaticinator or prophet nevertheless the truth is that the soul is seldom able to report those things in such sincerity as it hath seen them by reason of the imperfection and frailty of the corporeal senses which obstruct the effectuating of that office even as the moon doth not communicate unto this earth of ours that light which she receiveth from the sun with so much splendour heat vigour purity and liveliness as it was given her hence it is requisite for the better reading explaining and unfolding of these somniatory vaticinations and predictions of that nature that a dexterous learned skilful wise industrious expert rational and peremptory expounder or interpreter be pitched upon such a one as by the greeks is called onirocrit or oniropolis for this cause heraclitus was wont to say that nothing is by dreams revealed to us that nothing is by dreams concealed from us and that only we thereby have a mystical signification 
and secret evidence of things to come either for our own prosperous or unlucky fortune or for the favourable or disastrous success of another the sacred scriptures testify no less and profane histories assure us of it in both which are exposed to our view a thousand several kinds of strange adventures which have befallen pat according to the nature of the dream and that is well to the party dreamer as to the others the atlantic people and those that inhabit the island of basos one of the cyclades are of this grand commodity deprived for in their countries none yet ever dreamed of this sort were cleon of dahlia thrasymedes in our days the learned frenchman villa no venus neither of all which knew what dreaming was fail not therefore to-morrow when the jolly and fair aurora with her rosy fingers draweth aside the curtains of the night to drive away the sable shades of darkness to bend your spirits wholly to the task of sleeping sound and there to apply it yourself in the meanwhile you must denude your mind of every human passion or affection such as our love and hatred fear and hope for as of old the great vaticinator most famous and renowned prophet proteus was not able in his disguise or transformation into fire water a tiger a dragon and the such like uncouth shapes and visors to presage anything that was to come till he was restored to his own first natural and kindly form just so doth man for at his reception of the art of divination and faculty of prognosticating future things that part in him which is the most divine to wit the noose or men's must be calm peaceable untroubled quiet still hushed and not unbusied or distracted with foreign soul-disturbing perturbations i am content quoth panurge but i pray you sir must i this evening ere i go to bed eat much or little i do not ask this without cause for if i sup not well large round and amply my sleeping is not worth a forked turnip all the night long i then but doze and rave and in my slumbering fits talk idle nonsense my thoughts being in a dull brown study and as deep in their dumps as is my belly hollow not to sup answered pantagruel were best for you considering the state of your complexion and healthy constitution of your body a certain very ancient prophet named amphiarus wished such as had a mind by dreams to be imbued with any oracle for four and twenty hours to taste no victuals and to abstain from wine three days together yet shall not you be put to such a sharp hard rigorous and extreme sparing diet i am truly right apt to believe that a man whose stomach is replete with various cheer and in a manner surfeited with drinking is hardly able to conceive a right of spiritual things yet am not i of the opinion of those who after long and pertinacious fastings think by such means to enter more profoundly into the speculation of celestial mysteries you may very well remember how my father gargantua whom here for honour's sake i name hath often told us that the writings of abstinent abstemious and long fasting hermits were every whit as saltless dry jejune and insipid as were their bodies when they did compose them it is a most difficult thing for the spirits to be in a good plight serene and lively when there is nothing in the body but a kind of voidness and inanity seeing the philosophers with the physicians jointly affirm that the spirits which are styled animal spring from and have their constant practice in and through the arterial blood refined and purified to the life within the admirable net which wonderfully framed lieth under the ventricles and tunnels of the brain he gave us also the example of the philosopher who when he thought most seriously to have withdrawn himself unto a solitary privacy far from the rustling clutterments of the tumultuous and confused world the better to improve his theory to contrived comment ratiocinate was notwithstanding his uttermost endeavours to free himself from all untoward noises surrounded and environed about so with the barking of curs bawling of mastiffs bleating of sheep prating of parrots tattling of jackdaws grunting of swine gurning of boars yelping of foxes mewing of cats cheeping of mice squeaking of weasels croaking of frogs crowing of cocks cackling of hens calling of partridges chanting of swans chattering of jays peeping of chickens singing of larks creaking of geese
chirping of swallows clucking of moor fowls cucking of cuckoos fumbling of bees ramage of hawks churming of linnets croaking of ravens screeching of owls wicking of pigs gushing of hogs curring of pigeons grumbling of cushat doves howling of panthers kirkling of quails chirping of sparrows crackling of crows nuzzing of camels weaning of whelps buzzing of dromedaries mumbling of rabbits cricking of ferrets humming of wasps miauling of tigers buzzing of bears sussing of kidlings clamouring of scarfs whimpering of fulmarts booing of buffaloes warbling of nightingales quavering of mavises trentling of turkeys coniating storks frantling of peacocks clattering of magpies murmuring of stock doves crowding of cormorants giggling of locusts charming of beagles squaring of puppies snarling messings rantling of raps quirating of apes snuttering of monkeys violing of pelicans quacking of ducks yelling of wolves roaring of lions neighing of horses crying of elephants hissing of serpents and wailing of turtles that he was much more troubled than if he had been in the middle of the crowd at the fair of fontenay or niort just so is it with those who are tormented with the grievous pangs of hunger the stomach begins to gnaw and bark as it were the eyes to look dim and the veins by greedily sucking some reflection to themselves from the proper substance of all the members of a fleshy consistence violently pull down and draw back that vagrant roaming spirit careless and neglecting of his nurse and natural host which is the body as when a hawk upon the fist willing to take her flight by a soaring aloft in the open spacious air is on a sudden drawn back by a leash tied to her feet to this purpose also did he allege unto us the authority of homer the father of all philosophy who said that the grecians did not put an end to their mournful mood for the death of patroclus the most intimate friend of achilles till hunger in a rage declared herself and their bellies protested to furnish no more tears unto their grief for from bodies emptied and macerated by long fasting there could not be such supply of moisture and brackish drops as might be proper on that occasion mediocrity at all times is commendable nor in this case are you to abandon it you may take a little supper but thereat must you not eat it of a hare nor of any other flesh you are likewise to abstain from beans from the preek by some called the polyp as also from colworts cabbage and all other such like windy fiddles which may endanger the troubling of your brains and the dimming or casting of a kind of mist over your animal spirits for as a looking-glass cannot exhibit the semblance or representation of the object set before it and exposed to have its image to the life expressed if that the polished sleekness thereof be darkened by gross breathings dampish vapours and foggish thick infectious exhalations even so the fancy cannot well receive the impression of the likeness of those things which divination doth afford by dreams if any way the body be annoyed or troubled with the fumish steam of meat which it had taken in a while before because betwixt these two there still hath been a mutual sympathy and fellow-feeling of an indissolubly knit affection you shall eat good isubian and pergamut pears one apple of the short shank pippin kind a parcel of the little plums of tour and some few cherries of the growth of my orchard nor shall you need to fear that thereupon will ensue doubtful dreams fallacious uncertain and not to be trusted to as by some peripatetic philosophers hath been related for that say they men do more copiously in the season of harvest feed on fruitages than at any other time the same is mystically taught us by the ancient prophets and poets to allege that all vain and deceitful dreams lie hid and in covert under the leaves which are spread on the ground by reason that the leaves fall from the trees in the autumnal quarter for the natural fervour which abounding in ripe fresh recent fruits cometh by the quickness of its ebullition to be with ease evaporated into the animal parts of the dreaming person the experiment is obvious in most is a pretty while before it be expired dissolved and evanished as for your drink you are to have it of the fair pure water of my fountain the condition quoth panage is very hard 
nevertheless cost what price it will or whatsoever come of it i heartily condescend thereto protesting that i shall to-morrow break my fast betimes after my somniatory exercitations furthermore i recommend myself to homer's two gates to morpheus to isolan to phantasis and unto phobator if they in this my great need succour me and grant me that assistance which is fitting i will in honour of them all erect a jolly genteel altar composed of the softest down if i were now in laconia in the temple of juno betwixt etao and thalamus she suddenly would disentangle my perplexity resolve me of my doubts and cheer me up with fair and jovial dreams and a deep sleep then did he say thus unto pantagruel sir were it not expedient for my purpose to put a branch or two of curious laurel betwixt the quilt and bolster of my bed under the pillow on which my head must lean there is no need at all of that quoth pantagruel for besides that it is a thing very superstitious the cheat thereof hath been at large discovered unto us in the writings of serapion ascaranates antiphon philochorus artemon and fulgentius planchiades i could say as much to you of the left shoulder of a crocodile as also of a chameleon without prejudice be it spoken to the credit which is due to the opinion of old democritus and likewise of the stone of the bactrians called eumitrides and of the ammonian horn for so by the ethiopians is termed a certain precious stone coloured like gold and in the fashion shape form and proportion of a ram's horn as the horn of jupiter amon is reported to have been they over and above assuredly affirming that the dreams of those who carry it about them are no less veritable and infallible than the truth of the divine oracles nor is this much unlike to what homer and virgil wrote of these two gates of sleep to which you have been pleased to recommend the management of what you have in hand the one is of ivory which loveth in confused doubtful and uncertain dreams for through ivory how small and slender soever it be we can see nothing the density opacity and close compactedness of its material parts hindering the penetration visual rays and the reception of the species of such things as are visible the other is of horn at which an entry is made to sure and certain dreams even as through horn by reason of the diaphanous splendour and bright transparency thereof the species of all objects of the sight distinctly pass and so without confusion appear that they are clearly seen your meaning is and you would thereby infer quoth friar john that the dreams of all horned cuckolds of which number panurge by the help of god and his future wife is without controversy to be one are always true and infallible End of chapter three thirteen chapter three fourteen of gargantua and pantagruel book three by francois rabelais this librivox recording is in the public domain panurge's dream with the interpretation thereof at seven o'clock of the next following morning panurge did not fail to present himself before pantagruel in whose chamber were at that time epistemon friar john of the funnels phanocrates eudemon carpalin and others to whom at the entry of panurge pantagruel said lo here cometh our dreamer that word quoth epistemon in ancient times cost very much and was dearly sold to the children of jacob then said panurge i have been plunged into my dumps so deeply as if i had been lodged with gaffer naughty cap dreamed indeed i have and that right lustily but i could take long with me no more thereof than i did goodly understand save only that i in my vision had a pretty fair young gallant handsome woman who no less lovingly and kindly treated and entertained me hugged cherished cockered dandled and made much of me as if i had been another neat dilly darling minion like adonis never was man more glad than i was then 
my joy at that time was incomparable she flattered me tickled me stroked me groped me frizzled me curled me kissed me embraced me laid her hands about my neck and now and then made jestingly pretty little horns above my forehead i told her in the like disport as i did play the fool with her that she should rather place and fix them in a little below mine eyes that i might see the better what i should stick at with them for being so situated momus then would find no fault therewith as he did once with the position of the horns of bulls the wanton toying girl notwithstanding any remonstrance of mine to the contrary did always drive and thrust them further in yet thereby which to me seemed wonderful she did not do me any hurt at all a little after though i know not how i thought i was transformed into a tabor and she into a chuff my sleeping there being interrupted i wakened in a start angry displeased perplexed chafing and very wroth there have you a large platter full of dreams make thereupon good cheer and if you please spare not to interpret them according to the understanding which you may have in them come carpalin let us to breakfast to my sense and meaning quoth pantagruel if i have skill or knowledge in the art of divination by dreams your wife will not really and to the outward appearance of the world plant or set horns and stick them fast in your forehead after a visible manner as satyrs used to wear and carry them but she will be so far from preserving herself loyal in the discharge and observance of a conjugal duty that on the contrary she will violate her plighted faith break her marriage oath infringe all matrimonial ties prostitute her body to the dalliance of other men and so make you a cuckold this point is clearly and manifestly explained and expounded by artemidorus just as i have related it nor will there be any metamorphosis or transmutation made of you into a drum or tabor but you will surely be as soundly beaten as ever was tabor at a merry wedding nor yet will she be changed into a chuff but will steal from you chiefly in the night as is the nature of that thievish bird hereby may you perceive your dreams to be in every jot conform and agreeable to the virgilian lots a cuckold you will be beaten and robbed then cried out father john with a loud voice he tells the truth upon my conscience thou wilt be a cuckold an honest one i warrant thee oh the brave horns that will be borne by thee ha 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 our good master de cornibus god save thee and shield thee wilt thou be pleased to preach but two words of a sermon to us and i will go through the parish church to gather up alms for the poor you are quoth banerge very far mistaken in your interpretation for the matter is quite contrary to your sense thereof my dream presageth that i shall by marriage be stored with plenty of all manner of goods the hornifying of me showing that i will possess a cornucopia that amalfian horn which is called the horn of abundance whereof the fruition did still portend the wealth of the enjoyer you possibly will say that they are rather like to be satyrs horns for you of these did make some mention amen amen fiat fiatur ad differentium papi thus shall i have my toucher home still ready my staff of love sempiternally in a good case will satyr like be never toiled out a thing which all men wish for and send up their prayers to that purpose but such a thing is nevertheless is granted but to a few hence doth it follow by a consequence as clear as the sunbeams that i will never be in the danger of being made a cuckold for the defect hereof is causa sine qua non yea the sole cause as many think of making husbands cuckolds what makes poor scoundrel rogues to beg i pray you is it not because they have not enough at home wherewith to fill their bellies and their pokes what is it makes the wolves to leave the woods is it not the want of flesh-meat 
what maketh women whores you understand me well enough and herein may i very well submit my opinion to the judgment of learned lawyers presidents counsellors advocates procurers attorneys and other glossers and commentators on the venerable rubric de frigidis et maleficiatus you are in truth sir as it seems to me excuse my boldness if i have transgressed in a most palpable and absurd error to attribute my horns to cuckoldry diana wears them on her head after the manner of a crescent is she a cookian for that how the devil can she be cuckolded who never yet was married speak somewhat more correctly i beseech you lest she being offended furnish you with a pair of horns shapen by the pattern of those which she made for actaeon the goodly bacchus also carries horns pan jupiter amon with a great many others are they all cuckolds if jove be a cuckold juno is a whore this follows by the figure matalepsis as to call a child in the presence of his father and mother a bastard or whore's son is tacitly and underboard no less than if he had said openly the father is a cuckold and his wife a punk let our discourse come nearer to the purpose the horns that my wife did make me are horns of abundance planted and grafted in my head for the increase and shooting up of all good things this will i affirm for truth upon my word and pawn my faith and credit both upon it as for the rest i will be no less joyful frolic glad cheerful merry jolly and gamesome than a well-bended tabor in the hands of a good drummer at a nuptial feast still making a noise still rolling still buzzing and cracking believe me sir in that consisteth none of my least good fortunes and my wife will be jocund feet compt neat quaint dainty trim tricked up brisk smirk and smug even as a pretty little cornish chuff who will now believe this let hell or the gallows be the burden of his christmas carol i remark quoth pantagruel the last point or particle which you did speak of and having seriously conferred it with the first find that at the beginning you were delighted with the sweetness of your dream but in the end and final closure of it you startlingly awakened and on a sudden were forthwith vexed and choler and annoyed yea quoth banerge the reason of that was because i had fasted too long flatter not yourself quoth pantagruel all will go to ruin know for a certain truth that every sleep that endeth with a starting and leaves the person irksome grieved and fretting doth either signify a present evil or otherwise presageth and portendeth a future imminent mishap to signify an evil that is to say to show some sickness hardly curable a kind of pestilentious or malignant boil botch or sore lying and lurking hid occult and latent within the very centre of the body which many times doth by the means of sleep whose nature is to reinforce and strengthen the faculty and virtue of concoction being according to the theorems of physic to declare itself and moves toward the outward superficies at this sad stirring is the sleeper's rest and ease disturbed and broken whereof the first feeling and stinging smart admonisheth that he must patiently endure great pain and trouble and thereunto provide some remedy as when we say proverbially to incense hornets to move a stinking puddle and to awake a sleep lion instead of these more usual expressions and of a more familiar and plain meaning to provoke angry persons to make a thing the worse by meddling with it and to irritate a testy choleric man when he is at quiet on the other part to presage or foretell an evil especially in what concerneth the exploits of the soul in matter of somnial divinations is as much to say as that it giveth us to understand that some dismal fortune or mischance is destinated and prepared for us which shortly will not fail to come to pass a clear and evident example hereof is to be found in the dream and dreadful awaking of hecuba as likewise in that of eurydice the wife of orpheus neither of which was no sooner finished saith aeneas but that incontinently thereafter they awaked in a start and were affrighted horribly thereupon these accidents ensued hecuba had her husband priamus 
together with her children slain before her eyes and saw then the destruction of her country and eurydice died speedily thereafter in a most miserable manner aeneas dreaming that he spoke to hector a little after his decease did on a sudden in a great start awake and was afraid now hereupon did follow this event troy that same night was spoiled sacked and burnt at another time the same aeneas dreaming that he saw his familiar geniuses and penates in a ghastly fright and astonishment awaked of which terror and amazement the issue was that the very next day subsequent by a most horrible tempest on the sea he was like to have perished and been cast away moreover turnus being prompted instigated and stirred up by the fantastic vision of an infernal fury to enter into a bloody war against aeneas awaked in a start much troubled and disquieted in spirit in sequel whereof after many notable and famous routs defeats and discomfitures in open field he came at last to be killed in a single combat by the said aeneas a thousand other instances i could afford if it were needful of this matter whilst i relate these stories of aeneas remark the saying of fabius pictor who faithfully averred that nothing had at any time befallen unto was done or enterprised by him whereof he prealably had not noticed and beforehand foreseen it to the full by sure predictions altogether founded on the oracles of somnial divination to this there is no want of pregnant reasons no more than of examples for if repose and rest in sleeping be a special gift in favour of the gods as is maintained by the philosophers and by the poet attested in these lines then sleep that heavenly gift came to refresh of human labourers the wearied flesh such a gift or benefit can never finish or terminate in wrath and indignation without portending some unlucky fate and most disastrous fortune to ensue otherwise it were a molestation and not an ease a scourge and not a gift at least not proceeding from the gods above but from the infernal devils our enemies according to the common vulgar saying suppose the lord father or master of the family sitting at a very sumptuous dinner furnished with all manner of good cheer and having at his entry to the table his appetite sharp set upon his victuals, where there was great plenty should be seen rise in a start and on a sudden fling out of his chair abandoning his meat frighted appalled and in a horrid terror who should not know the cause hereof would wonder and be astonished exceedingly but what he heard his male servants cry fire 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 his serving maids and women yell stop thief stop thief and all his children shout as loud as ever they could murder oh murder murder then was it not high time for him to leave his banqueting for application of a remedy in haste and to give speedy order for succouring of his distressed household truly i remember that the cabalists and masserets interpreters of the sacred scriptures entreating how with verity one might judge of evangelical apparitions because oftentimes the angel of satan is disguised and transfigured into an angel of light said that the difference of these two mainly did consist in this the favourable and comforting angel useth in his appearing unto man at first to terrify and hugely affright him but in the end he bringeth consolation leaveth the person who has seen him joyful well pleased fully content and satisfied on the other side the angel of perdition that wicked devilish and malignant spirit at his appearance unto any person in the beginning cheereth up the heart of his beholder but at last forsakes him and leaves him troubled angry and perplexed End of chapter three fourteen Chapter three fifteen of Gargantua and Pantagruel Book three by Francois Rabelais. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.
panurge's excuse and exposition of the monastic mystery concerning powdered beef the lord save those who see and do not hear quoth panurge i see you well enough but know not what it is that you have said the hunger-starved belly wanteth ears for lack of victuals before god i roar bray yell and fume as in a furious madness i have performed too hard a task to-day an extraordinary work indeed he shall be craftier and do far greater wonders than ever did mr mush who shall be able any more this year to bring me on the stage of preparation for a dreaming verdict fie not to sup at all that is the devil pox take that fashion come friar john let us go break our fast for if i hit on such a round refection in the morning as will serve thoroughly to fill the mill-hopper and hog's hide of my stomach and furnish it with meat and drink sufficient then at a pinch as in the case of some extreme necessity which presseth i could make a shift that day to forbear dining but not to sup a plague wrought that base custom which is an error offensive to nature that lady made the day for exercise to travel work wait on and labour in each his negotiation and employment and that we may with the more fervency and ardour prosecute our business she sets before us a clear burning candle to wit the sun's resplendency and at night when she begins to take the light from us she thereby tacitly implies no less than if she would have spoken thus unto us my lads and lasses all of you are good and honest folks you have wrought well to-day toiled in turmoil enough the night approacheth therefore cast off these moiling cares of yours desist from all your swinking painful labours and set your minds how to refresh your bodies in the renewing of their vigour with good bread choice wine and store of wholesome meats then may you take some sport and recreation and after that lie down and rest yourselves that you may strongly nimbly lustily and with the more alacrity to-morrow attend on your affairs as formerly falconers in like manner when they have fed their hawks will not suffer them to fly on a full gorge but let them on a perch abide a little that they may rouse bait tower and soar the better that good pope who was the first institutor of fasting understood this well enough for he ordained that our fast should reach but to the hour of noon all the remainder of that day was at our disposure freely to eat and feed at any time thereof in ancient times there were but few that dined as you would say some churchmen monks and canons for they have little other occupation each day is a festival unto them who diligently heed the claustral proverb de missa ad mensum they do not use to linger and defer their sitting down and placing of themselves at table only so long as they have a mind in waiting for the coming of the abbot so they fell to without ceremony terms or conditions and everybody supped unless it were some vain conceited dreaming dotard hence was a supper called kina which showeth that it is common to all sorts of people thou knowest it well friar john come let us go my dear friend in the name of all the devils of the infernal regions let us go the gnawings of my stomach in this rage of hunger are so tearing that they make it bark like a mastiff let us throw some bread and beef into his throat to pacify him as once the sibyl did to cerberus thou likest best monastical brewis the prime the flower of the pot 
i'm for the solid principal verb that comes after the good brown loaf always accompanied with a round slice of the nine lecture powdered labourer i know thy meaning answered friar john this metaphor is extracted out of the claustral cattle the labourer is the ox that hath wrought and done the labour after the fashion of nine lectures that is to say most exquisitely well and thoroughly boiled these holy religious fathers by a certain cabalistic institution of the ancients not written but carefully by tradition conveyed from hand to hand rising betimes to go to morning prayers were wont to flourish that their matutinal devotion with some certain notable preambles before their entry into the church viz they dunged in the dungaries pissed in the pisseries spit in the spitteries melodiously coughed in the cofferies and doted in their dotaries that to the divine service they might not bring anything that was unclean or foul these things thus done they very zealously made their repair to the holy chapel for so was in their canting language termed the convent kitchen where they with no small earnestness had care that the beef-pot should be put on the crook for the breakfast of the religious brothers of our lord and saviour and the fire they would kindle under the pot themselves now the matins consisting of nine lessons it it was so incumbent on them that must have risen the rather for the more expedite dispatching of them all the sooner that they rose the sharper was their appetite and the barking of their stomachs and the gnawings increased in the like proportion and consequently made these godly men thrice more a hungered and a thirst than when their matins were hemmed over only with three lessons the more betimes they rose by the said cabal the sooner was the beef-pot put on the longer that the beef was on the fire the better it was boiled the more it boiled it was the tenderer the tenderer that it was the less it troubled the teeth delighted more the palate less charged the stomach and nourished our good religious men the more substantially which is the only end of prime intention of the first founders as appears by this that they eat not to live but live to eat and in this world have nothing but their life let us go panurge now have i understood thee quoth panurge my plush cod friar my cabaline and claustral bollock i freely quit the costs interest and charges seeing you have so egregiously commented upon the most especial chapter of the culinary and monastic cabal come along my carpelin and you friar john my leather dresser good morrow to you all my good lords have dreamed too much to have so little let us go panurge had no sooner done speaking than epistemon with a loud voice said these words it is a very ordinary and common thing amongst men to conceive foresee know and presage the misfortune bad luck or disaster of another but to have the understanding providence knowledge and prediction of a man's own mishap is very scarce and rare to be found anywhere this is exceeding judiciously and prudently deciphered by aesop in his apologues who there affirmeth that every man in the world carrieth about his neck a wallet in the forebag whereof were contained the faults and mischances of others always exposed to his view and knowledge and in the other script thereof which hangs behind are kept the bearer's proper transgressions and inauspicious adventures at no time seen by him nor thought upon unless he be a person that hath a favourable aspect from the heavens End of chapter three fifteen chapter three sixteen of gargantua and pantagruel book three by francois rabelais this librivox recording is in the public domain how pantagruel adviseth panurge to consult with the sibyl of panzust a little while thereafter pantagruel sent for panurge and said unto him the affection which i bear you being now inveterate and settled in my mind by a long continuance of time prompteth me to the serious consideration of your welfare and profit in order whereto remark what i have thought thereon it hath been told me that at panzust near Cooley, dwelleth a very famous sibyl who is endowed with the skill of foretelling all things to come 
take epistemon in your company repair towards her and hear what she will say unto you she is possibly quoth epistemon some canidia sagana or pythonissa either whereof with us is vulgarly called a witch i being the more easily induced to give credit to the truth of this character of her that the place of her abode is vilely stained with the abominable repute of abounding more with sorcerers and witches than ever did the plains of thessaly i should not to my thinking go thither willingly for that it seems to me a thing unwarrantable and altogether forbidden in the law of moses we are not jews quoth pantagruel nor is it a matter judiciously confessed by her nor authentically proved by others that she is a witch let us for the present suspend our judgment and defer till after your return from thence the sifting and garbling of those niceties do we know but that she may be an eleventh sibyl or a second cassandra but although she were neither and she did not merit the name or title of any of these renowned prophetesses what hazard in the name of god do you run by offering to talk and confer with her of the instant perplexity and perturbation of your thoughts seeing especially and which is most of all she is in the estimation of those that are acquainted with her held to know more and to be of a deeper reach of understanding than is either customary to the country wherein she liveth or to the sex whereof she is what hindrance hurt or harm doth the laudable desire of knowledge bring to any man were it from a sod a pot a fool a stool a winter mitten a truckle for a pulley the lid of a goldsmith's crucible an oil bottle or an old slipper you may remember to have read or heard at least that alexander the great immediately after his having obtained a glorious victory over the king darius in arbella refused in the presence of the splendid and illustrious courtiers that were about him to give audience to a poor certain despicable like fellow who through the solicitations and mediation of some of his royal attendants was admitted humbly to beg that grace and favour of him but sore did he repent although in vain a thousand and ten thousand times thereafter the surly state which he then took upon him to the denial of so just a suit the grant whereof would have been worth unto him the value of a brace of potent cities he was indeed victorious in persia but withal so far distant from macedonia his hereditary kingdom that the joy of the one did not expel the extreme grief which through occasion of the other he had inwardly conceived for not being able with all his power to find or invent a convenient mean and expedient how to get or come by the certainty of any news from thence both by reason of the huge remoteness of the places from one to another as also because of the impeditive interposition of many great rivers the interjacent obstacle of divers wild deserts an obstructive interjection of sundry almost inaccessible mountains whilst he was in this sad quandary and solicitous pensiveness which you may suppose could not be of a small vexation to him considering that it was a matter of no great difficulty to run over his whole native soil possess his country seize on his kingdom install a new king in the throne and plant thereon foreign colonies long before he could come to have any advertisement of it for obviating the jeopardy of so dreadful inconveniency and putting a fit remedy thereto a certain sidonian merchant of a low stature but high fancy very poor in show and to the outward appearance of little or no account having presented himself before him went about to affirm and declare that he had excogitated and hit upon a ready mean and way by the which those of his territories at home should come to the certain notice of his indian victories and himself be perfectly informed of the state and condition of egypt and macedonia within less than five days whereupon the said alexander plunged into a sullen animadvertency of mind through his rash opinion of the improbability of performing a so strange and impossible like undertaking dismissed the merchant without giving ear to what he had to say and vilified him what could it have cost him to hearken 
and to what the honest man had invented and contrived for his good what detriment annoyance damage or loss could he have undergone to listen to the discovery of that secret which the good fellow would have most willingly revealed unto him nature i am persuaded did not without a cause frame our ears open putting thereto no gate at all nor shutting them up with any manner of enclosures as she hath done unto the tongue the eyes and other such outjetting parts of the body the cause as i imagine is to the end that every day and every night and that continually we may be ready to hear and by perpetual hearing apt to learn for of all the senses it is the fittest for the reception of the knowledge of arts sciences and disciplines and it may be that man was an angel that is to say a messenger sent from god as raphael was to tobit too suddenly did he contemn despise and misregard him but too long thereafter by an untimely and too late repentance did he do penance for it you say very well answered epistemon yet shall you never for all that induce me to believe that it can tend any way to the advantage or commodity of a man to take advice and counsel of a woman namely of such a woman and the woman of such a country truly i found quoth panurge a great deal of good in the counsel of women chiefly in that of the old wives amongst them for every time i consult with them i readily get a stool or two extraordinary to the great solace of my humgut passage they are as sleuth-hounds in the infallibility of their scent and in their sayings no less sententious than the rubrics of the law therefore in my conceit it is not an improper kind of speech to call them sage or wise women in confirmation of which opinion of mine the customary style of my language alloweth them the denomination of presage women the epithet of sage is due unto them because they are surpassing dexterous in the knowledge of most things and i give them the title of presage for that they divinely foresee and certainly foretell future contingencies and events of things to come sometimes i call them not moniettes but moniettes from their wholesome monitions whether it be so ask pythagoras socrates of pedocles and our master or to i furthermore praise and commend above the skies the ancient memorable institution of the pristine germans who ordained the responses and documents of old women to be highly extolled most cordially reverenced and prized at a rate in nothing inferior to the weight test and standard of the sanctuary and as they were respectfully prudent in receiving of these sound advices so by honouring and following them did they prove no less fortunate in the happy success of all their endeavours witness the old wife arenia and the good mother velid in the days of vespasian you need not any way doubt but that feminine old age is always fructifying in qualities sublime i would have said sibylline let us go by the help let us go by the virtue of god let us go farewell friar john i recommend the care of my codpiece to you well quoth epistemon i will follow you with this protestation nevertheless that if i happen to get a sure information or otherwise find that she doth use any kind of charm or enchantment in her responses it may not be imputed to me for a blame to leave you at the gate of her house without accompanying you any further in end of chapter three sixteen chapter three seventeen of gargantua and pantagruel book three by francois rabelais this librivox recording is in the public domain how panurge spoke to the sibyl of panzust their voyage was three days journeying on the third whereof was shown unto them the house of the vaticinatrice standing on the nap or top of a hill under a large and spacious walnut-tree without great difficulty they entered into that straw-thatched cottage scurvily built naughtily movable and all besmoked it matters not quoth epistemon heraclitus the grand scotist and tenebrous darksome philosopher was nothing astonished at his introit into such a coarse and paltry habitation 
for he did usually show forth unto his sectators and disciples that the gods made as cheerfully their residence in these mean homely mansions as in sumptuous magnific palaces replenished with all manner of delight pomp and pleasure i withal do really believe that the dwelling-place of the so famous and renowned hecate was just such another petty cell as this is when she made a feast therein to the valiant theseus and that of no other better structure was the cot or cabin of hyreus or enopion wherein jupiter neptune and mercury were not ashamed all three together to harbour and sojourn a whole night and there to take a full and hearty repast for the payment of the shot they thankfully pissed orion they finding the ancient woman at a corner of her own chimney epistemon said she is indeed a true sibyl and the lively portrait of one represented by the gry caminoi of homer the old hag was in a pitiful bad plight and condition in matter of the outward state and complexion of her body the ragged and tattered equipage of her person in the point of accoutrement and beggarly poor provision of fare for her diet and entertainment for she was ill apparelled worse nourished toothless blear-eyed crook-shouldered snotty her nose still dropping and herself still drooping faint and pithless whilst in this woefully wretched case she was making ready for her dinner porridge of wrinkled green cold warts with a bit skin of yellow bacon mixed with a twice before cooked sort of waterish unsavoury broth extracted out of bare and hollow bones epistemon said by the cross of a groat we are to blame nor shall we get from her any response at all for we have not brought along with us the branch of gold i have quoth panurge provided pretty well for that for here i have it within my bag in the substance of a gold ring accompanied with some fair pieces of small money no sooner were these words spoken when panurge coming up towards her after the ceremonial performance of a profound and humble salutation presented her with six neat tongues dried in the smoke a great butter pot full of fresh cheese a baraccio furnished with good beverage and a ram's cod stored with single pence newly coined at last he with a low courtesy put on her medical finger a pretty handsome golden ring wherein too was right artificially encased a precious toadstone of bos this done in few words and very succinctly did he set open and expose unto her the motive reason of his coming most civilly and courteously entreating her that she might be pleased to vouchsafe to give him an ample and plenary intelligence concerning the future good luck of his intended marriage the old trot for a while remained silent pensive and grinning like a dog then after she had set her withered breech upon the bottom of a bushel she took into her hands three old spindles which when she had turned and whirled betwixt her fingers very diversely and after several fashions she pried more narrowly into by the trial of their points the sharpest whereof she retained in her hand and threw the other two under a stone trough after this she took a pair of yarn windles which she nine times unintermittedly veered and frisked about then at the ninth revolution or turn without touching them any more maturely perpending the manner of their motion she very demurely waited on their repose and cessation from any further stirring in sequel whereof she pulled off one of her wooden pattens put her apron over her head as a priest uses to do his amice when he is going to sing mass and with a kind of antique gaudy party-coloured string knit it under her neck being thus covered and muffled she whiffed off a lusty good draught out of the baraccio 
took three several pence forth of the ramcod fob put them into so many walnut shells which she set down upon the bottom of a feather pot and then after she had given them three whisks of a broom besom athwart the chimney casting into the fire half a bavin of long heather together with a branch of dry laurel she observed with a very hush and coy silence in what form they did burn and saw that although they were in a flame they made no kind of noise or crackling din hereupon she gave a most hideous and horribly dreadful shout muttering betwixt her teeth some few barbarous words of a strange termination this so terrified panurge that he forthwith said to epistemon the devil mince me into a gala moffrey if i do not tremble for fear i do not think but that i am now enchanted for she uttereth not her voice in the terms of any christian language o oh, look i pray you how she seemeth unto me to be by three full spans higher than she was when she began to hood herself with her apron what meaneth this restless wagging of her slouchy chaps what can be the signification of the uneven shrugging of her halchy shoulders to what end doth she quaver with her lips like a monkey in the dismembering of a lobster my ears through horror glow ah how they tingle i think i hear the shrieking of proserpina the devils are breaking loose to be all here oh the foul ugly and deformed beasts let us run away by the hook of god i am like to die for fear i do not love the devils they vex me and are unpleasant fellows now let us fly and betake us to our heels farewell gammer thanks and gramercy for your goods i will not marry no believe me i will not i fairly quit my interest therein and totally abandon and renounce it from this time forward even as much as at present with this as he endeavoured to make an escape out of the room the old crone did anticipate his flight and make him stop the way how she prevented him was this whilst in her hand she held the spindle she flung out to a back yard close by her lodge where after she had peeled off the barks of an old sycamore three several times she very summarily upon eight leaves which dropped from thence wrote with the spindle point some curt and briefly couched verses which she threw into the air then said unto them search after them if you will find them if you can the fatal destinies of your marriage are written in them no sooner had she done thus speaking than she did withdraw herself unto her lurking hole where on the upper seat of the porch she tucked up her gown her coats and smock as high as her armpits and gave them a full inspection of the knock and draw, which being perceived by panurge he said to epistemon god's bodikins i see the sibyl's hole she suddenly then bolted the gate behind her and was never since seen any more they jointly ran in haste after the fallen and dispersed leaves and gathered them at last though not without great labour and toil for the wind had scattered them amongst the thorn bushes of the valley when they had ranged them each after other in their due places they found out their sentence as it is metrified in this octostitch thy fame upheld properly as corrected by ozel thy fame will be shelled by her i trow even so so and she with child of thee no thy good end suck she shall and flay thee friend but not all end of chapter three seventeen chapter three eighteen of gargantua and pantagruel book three by francois rabelais this librivox recording is in the public domain how pantagruel and panurge did diversely expound the verses of the sibyl of panzust the leaves being thus collected and orderly disposed epistemon and panurge returned to pantagruel's court partly well pleased and other part discontented glad for their being come back and vexed for the trouble they had sustained by the way which they found to be craggy rugged stony rough and ill-adjusted 
they made an ample and full relation of their voyage unto pantagruel as likewise of the estate and condition of the sibyl then having presented to him the leaves of the sycamore they show him the short and twaddle verses that were written in them pantagruel having read and considered the whole sum and substance of the matter fetched from his heart a deep and heavy sigh then said to panurge you are now forsooth in a good taking and have brought your hogs to a fine market the prophecy of the sibyl doth explain and lay out before us the same very predictions which have been denoted foretold and presaged to us by the decree of the virgilian lots and the verdict of your own proper dreams to wit that you shall be very much disgraced shamed and discredited by your wife for that she will make you a cuckold in prostituting herself to others being big with child by another than you will steal from you a great deal of your goods and will beat you scratch and bruise you even to plucking the skin in a part from off you will leave the print of her blows in some member of your body you understand as much answered panurge in the veritable interpretation and expounding of recent prophecies as a sow in the matter of spicery be not offended sir i beseech you that i speak thus boldly for i find myself a little in choler and that not without cause seeing it is the contrary that is true take heed and give attentive ear unto my words the old wife said that as the bean is not seen till first it be unhusked and that its swad or hull be shelled and peeled from off it so is it that my virtue and transcendent worth will never come by the mouth of fame to be blazed abroad proportionable to the height extent and measure of the excellency thereof until pre allibly i get a wife and make the full half of a married couple how many times have i heard you say that the function of a magistrate or office of dignity discovereth the merits parts and endowments of the person so advanced and promoted and what is in him that is to say we are then best able to judge aright of the deservings of a man when he is called to the management of affairs for when before he lived in a private condition we could have no more certain knowledge of him than of a bean within its husk and thus stands the first article explained otherwise could you imagine that the good fame repute and estimation of an honest man should depend upon the tale of a whore now to the meaning of the second article my wife will be with child here lies the prime felicity of marriage but not of me Cupsadi, that i do believe indeed it will be of a pretty little infant oh how heartily i shall love it i do already dote upon it for it will be my dainty fetal darling my genteel dilly minion from thenceforth no vexation care or grief shall take such deep impression in my heart how hugely great or vehement soever it otherwise appear but that it shall vanish forthwith at the sight of that my future babe and at the hearing of the chat and prating of its childish gibberish and blessed be the old wife by my truly i have a mind to settle some good revenue or pension upon her out of the readiest increase of the lands of my salmagandia noise not an inconstant and uncertain rent seek like that of witless giddy-headed bachelors but sure and fixed of the nature of the well-paid incomes of regenting doctors if this interpretation doth not please you think you my wife will bear me in her flanks conceive with me and be of me delivered as women use in childbed to bring forth their young ones so as that it may be said panurge is a second bacchus he hath been twice born he is reborn as was hippolytus as was proteus one time of thetis and secondly of the mother of the philosopher apollonius as were the two palaci near the flood simythos in sicily his wife was big of child with him in him is renewed and begun again the palantaki of the megarians and the paling genesi of democritus fie upon such errors to hear stuff of that nature rends mine ears the words of the third article are she will suck me at my best inn why not 
that pleaseth me right well you know the thing i need not tell you that it is my intercrural pudding with one end i swear and promise that in what i can i will preserve it sappy full of juice and as well victualled for her use as may be she shall not suck me i believe in vain nor be destitute of her allowance there shall her justum both in peck and lippy be furnished to the full eternally you expound this passage allegorically and interpret it to theft and larceny i love the exposition and the allegory pleaseth me but not according to the sense whereto you stretch it it may be that the sincerity of the affection which you bear me moveth you to harbour in your breast those refractory thoughts concerning me with a suspicion of my adversity to come we have this saying from the learned that a marvellously fearful thing is love and that true love is never without fear but sir according to my judgment you do understand both of and by yourself that here stealth signifieth nothing else no more than in a thousand other places of greek and latin old and modern writings but the sweet fruits of amorous dalliance which venus liketh best when reaped in secret and called by fervent lovers filchingly why so i prithee tell because when the feet of the loose coat skirmish happeneth to be done underhand and privily between two well-disposed athwart the steps of a pair of stairs lurkingly and in covert behind a suit of hangings or close hid and trussed upon an unbound faggot it is more pleasing to the cyprian goddess and to me also i speak this without prejudice to any better or more sound opinion than to perform that coal busting art after the cynic manner in the view of the clear sunshine or in a rich tent under a precious stately canopy within a glorious and sublime pavilion or yet on a soft couch betwixt rich curtains of cloth of gold without affrightment at long intermediate respites enjoying your pleasures and delights a bellyful at all great ease with a huge fly-flap fan of crimson satin and a bunch of feathers of some east indian ostrich serving to give chase unto the flies all round about whilst in the interim the female picks her teeth with a stiff straw picked even then from out of the bottom of the bed she lies on if you be not content with this my exposition are you of the mind that my wife will suck and sup me up as people used to gulp and swallow oysters out of the shell or as the kilikian women according to the testimony of dioscorides were wont to do the grain of alkermes assuredly that is an error who seizeth on it doth neither gulch up nor spill down but takes away what hath been packed up catcheth snatcheth and plies the play of hay pass repass the fourth article doth imply that my wife will flame me but not all oh the fine word you interpret this to beating strokes and blows speak wisely will you eat a pudding sir i beseech you to raise up your spirits above the low-sized pitch of earthly thoughts unto that height of sublime contemplation which reacheth to the apprehension of the mysteries and wonders of dame nature and here be pleased to condemn yourself by a renouncing of those errors which you have committed very grossly and somewhat perversely in expounding the prophetic sayings of the holy sibyl yet put the case albeit i yield not to it that by the instigation of the devil my wife should go about to wrong me make me a cuckold downwards to the very breach disgrace me otherwise steal my goods from me yea and lay violently her hands upon me she nevertheless should fail of her attempts and not attain to the proposed end of her unreasonable undertakings the reason which induceth me hereto is grounded totally on this last point which is extracted from the profoundest privacies of a monastic pantheology as good friar arthur wagtail told me once upon a monday morning as we were if i have not forgot eating a bushel of trotter pies and i remember well it rained hard god give him the good morrow the women at the beginning of the world or a little after conspired to flay the men quick because they found the spirit of mankind inclined to domineer it and bear rule over them upon the face of the whole earth and in pursuit of this their resolution promised confirmed swore and covenanted amongst them all by the pure faith they owe to the nocturnal sanct rogero but oh the vain enterprises of women oh the great fragility of that sex feminine 
they did begin to flay the man or peel him as says catullus at that member which of all the body they loved best to wit the nervous and cavernous cane and that above five thousand years ago yet have they not of that small part alone flayed any more till this hour but the head in mere despite whereof the jews snip off that parcel of the skin in circumcision choosing far rather to be called clipyards rascals than to be flayed by women as are other nations my wife according to this female covenant will flay it to me if it be not so already i hardly grant my consent thereto but will not give her leave to flay at all nay truly will i not my noble king yea but quoth epistemon you say nothing of her most dreadful cries and exclamations when she and we both saw laurel bough burn without yielding any noise or crackling you know it is a very dismal omen an inauspicious sign unlucky in sea, and token formidable bad disastrous and most unhappy as is certified by propertius tibullus the quick philosopher prophyreus eustathius on the iliads of homer and by many others verily verily quoth panurge brave are the allegations which you bring me and testimonies of two-footed calves these men were fools as they were poets and doters as they were philosophers full of folly as they were of philosophy End of chapter three eighteen chapter three nineteen of gargantua and pantagruel book three by francois rabelais this librivox recording is in the public domain how pantagruel praiseth the counsel of dumb men pantagruel when this discourse was ended held for a pretty while his peace seeming to be exceeding sad and pensive then said to panurge the malignant spirit misleads beguileth and seduceth you i have read that in times past the surest and most veritable oracles were not those which either were delivered in writing or uttered by word of mouth in speaking for many times in their interpretation right witty learned and ingenious men have been deceived through amphibologies equivoques and obscurity of words no less than by the brevity of their sentences for which cause apollo the god of that dissonation was surnamed loxius those which were represented then by signs and outward gestures were accounted the truest and the most infallible such was the opinion of heraclitus and jupiter did himself in this manner give forth in amon frequently predictions nor was he single in this practice for apollo did the like amongst the assyrians his prophesying thus unto those people moved them to paint him with a large long beard and clothes beseeming an old settled person of a most posed staid and grave behaviour not naked young and beardless as he was portrayed most usually amongst the grecians let us make trial of this kind of fat decency and go you take advice of some dumb person without any speaking i am content quoth panurge but says pantagruel it were requisite that the dumb you consult with be such as have been deaf from the hour of their nativity and consequently dumb for none can be so lively natural and kindly dumb as he who never heard how is it quoth panurge that you conceive this matter if you apprehend it so that never any spoke who had not before heard the speech of others i will from that antecedent bring you to infer very logically a most absurd and paradoxical conclusion but let it pass i will not insist on it you do not then believe what herodotus wrote of two children who at the special command and appointment of some king of egypt having been kept in a petty country cottage where they were nourished and entertained in a perpetual silence did at last after a certain long space of time pronounce this word back 
which in the phrygian language signifieth bread nothing less quoth pantagruel do i believe then that it is a mere abusing of our understandings to give credit to the words of those who say that there is any such thing as a natural language all speeches have had their primary origin from the arbitrary institutions accords and agreements of nations in their respective condescendments to what should be noted and be tokened by them an articulate voice according to the dialecticians hath naturally no signification at all for that the sense and meaning thereof did totally depend upon the good will and pleasure of the first deviser and imposer of it i do not tell you this without a cause for bartholus book five of verbal obligation very seriously reporteth that even in this time there was in eugubia one named sir nello de gabrielis who although he by a sad mischance became altogether deaf understood nevertheless every one that talked in the italian dialect howsoever he expressed himself and that only by looking on his external gestures and casting an attentive eye upon the divers motions of his lips and chaps i have read i remember also in a very literate and eloquent author that tiridates king of armenia in the days of nero made a voyage to rome where he was received with great honour and solemnity and with all manner of pomp and magnificence yea to the end there might be a sempiternal amity and correspondence preserved betwixt him and the roman senate there was no remarkable thing in the whole city which was not shown unto him at his departure the emperor bestowed upon him many ample donatives of an inestimable value and besides the more entirely to testify his affection towards him heartily entreated him to be pleased to make choice of any whatsoever thing in rome was most agreeable to his fancy with a promise juramentally confirmed that he should not be refused of his demand thereupon after a suitable return of thanks for a so gracious offer he required a certain jack pudding whom he had seen to act his part most egregiously upon the stage and whose meaning albeit he knew not what it was he had spoken he understood perfectly enough by the signs and gesticulations which he had made and for this suited his in that he asked nothing else he gave this reason that in the several wide and spacious dominions which were reduced under the sway and authority of his sovereign government there were sundry countries and nations much differing from one another in language with whom whether he was to speak unto them or give any answer to their requests he was always necessitated to make use of divers sorts of truckmen and interpreters now with this man alone sufficient for supplying all their places will that great inconveniency hereafter be totally removed seeing he is such a fine gesticulator and in the practice of chirology an artist so complete expert and dexterous that with his very fingers he does speak howsoever you are to pitch upon such a dumb one as is deaf by nature and from his birth to the end that his gestures and signs may be the more vively and truly prophetic and not counterfeit by the intermixture of some adulterate lustre and affectation yet whether this dumb person shall be of the male or female sex is in your option lieth at your discretion and altogether dependeth on your own election i would more willingly quoth panurge consult with and be advised by a dumb woman were it not that i am afraid of two things the first is that the greater part of women whatever be that they see do always represent unto their fancies think and imagine that it hath some relation to the sugared entering of the goodly ithophallus and graphing in the cleft of the overturned tree the quick-set imp of the pen of copulation whatever signs shows or gestures we shall make or whatever our behaviour carriage or demeanour shall happen to be in their view and presence they will interpret the whole in reference to the act of androgenation 
and the culbutizing exercise by which means we shall be abusively disappointed of our designs in regard that she will take all our sign for nothing else but tokens and representations of our desire to entice her unto the lists of a cyprian combat or katsinkani skirmish do you remember what happened at rome two hundred and three score years after the foundation thereof a young roman gentleman encountering by chance at the foot of mount celion with a beautiful latin lady named verona who from her very cradle upwards had always been both deaf and dumb very civilly asked her not without a chironomatic italianizing of his demand with various gestigation of his fingers and other gesticulations as yet customary amongst the speakers of that country what senators in her descent from the top of the hill she had met with going up thither for you are to conceive that he knowing no more of her deafness than dumbness was ignorant of both she in the meantime who neither heard nor understood so much as one word of what he had said straight imagined by all that she could apprehend in the lovely gesture of his manual signs that what he then required of her was what herself had a great mind to even that which a young man doth naturally desire of a woman then was it that by signs which in all occurrences of venereal love are incomparably more attractive valid and efficacious than words she beckoned to him to come along with her to her house which when he had done she drew him aside to a privy room and then made a most lively alluring sign unto him to show that the game did please her whereupon without any more advertisement or so much as the uttering of one word on either side they fell to and bringardized did lustily the other cause of my being averse from consulting with dumb women is that to our signs they would make no answer at all but suddenly fall backwards in a divarication posture to intimate thereby unto us the reality of their consent to the supposed motion of our tacit demands or if they should chance to make any countersigns responsory to our propositions they would prove so foolish impertinent and ridiculous that by them ourselves should easily judge their thoughts to have no excursion beyond the duffling academy you know very well how at brignolles when the religious nun sister fatbum was made big with child by the young stiffly stand to it her pregnancy came to be known and she sided by the abbess and in a full convention of the convent accused of incest her excuse was that she did not consent thereto but that it was done by the violence and impetuous force of the friar stiffly stand to it here too the abbess very austerely replying thou naughty wicked girl why didst thou not cry a rape a rape then should all of us have run to thy succour her answer was that the rape was committed in the door to her where she durst not cry because it was a place of sempiternal silence but quoth the abbess thou roguish wench why didst not thou then make some sign to those that were in the next chamber beside thee to this she answered that with her buttocks she made a sign unto them as vigorously as she could yet never one of them did so much as offer to come to her help and assistance but quoth the abbess thou scurvy baggage why didst thou not tell it me immediately after the perpetration of the fact that so we might orderly regularly and canonically have accused him i would have done so had the case been mine for the clearer manifestation of mine innocency i truly madam would have done the like with all my heart and soul quoth sister fat bum but that fearing i should remain in sin and in the hazard of eternal damnation if prevented by a sudden death i did confess myself to the father friar before he went out of the room who for my penance enjoined me not to tell it or reveal the matter unto any it were a most enormous and horrid offence detestable before god and the angels to reveal a confession such an abominable wickedness would have possibly brought down fire from heaven wherewith to have burnt the whole nunnery and sent us all headlong to the bottomless pit 
to bear company with cora Thathan, and the byron you will not quoth pantagruel with all your jesting make me laugh i know that all the monks friars and nuns had rather violate and infringe the highest of the commandments of god than break the least of their provincial statutes take you therefore goat's nose a man very fit for your present purpose for he is and hath been both dumb and deaf from the very remotest infancy of his childhood End of chapter three nineteen chapter three twenty of gargantua and pantagruel book three by francois rabelais this librivox recording is in the public domain how goat's nose by signs maketh answer to panurge goat's nose being sent for came the day thereafter to pantagruel's court at his arrival to which panurge gave him a fat calf the half of a hog two puncheons of wine one load of corn and thirty francs of small money then having brought him before pantagruel in presence of the gentlemen of the bedchamber he made this sign unto him he yawned a long time and in yawning made without his mouth with the thumb of his right hand the figure of the greek letter tau by frequent reiterations afterwards he lifted up his eyes to heavenwards then turned them in his head like a she-goat in the painful fit of an absolute birth in doing whereof he did cough and sigh exceeding heavily this done after that he had made demonstration of the want of his codpiece he from under his shirt took his placket racket in a full grip making it therewithal clack very melodiously betwixt his thighs then no sooner had he with his body stooped a little forwards and bowed his left knee but that immediately thereupon holding both his arms on his breast in a loose faint-like posture the one over the other he paused a while goat's nose looked wistly upon him and having heedfully enough viewed him all over he lifted up into the air his left hand the whole fingers whereof he retained fist-wise close together except the thumb and the forefinger whose nails he softly joined and coupled to one another i understand quoth pantagruel what he meaneth by that sign it denotes marriage and withal the number thirty according to the profession of the pythagoreans you will be married thanks to you quoth panurge in turning himself towards goat's nose my little sewer pretty master's mate dainty bailey curious sergeant marshal and jolly catchpole leader then did he lift higher up than before his said left hand stretching out all the five fingers thereof and severing them as wide from one another as he possibly could get done here says pantagruel doth he more amply and fully insinuate unto us by the token which he showeth forth of the quinary number that you shall be married yea that you shall not only be affianced betrothed wedded and married but that you shall furthermore cohabit and live jollily and merrily with your wife for pythagoras called five the nuptial number which together with marriage signifieth the consummation of matrimony because it is composed of a ternary the first of the odd and binary the first of the even numbers as of a male and female knit and united together in very deed it was the fashion of old in the city of rome at marriage festivals to light five wax tapers nor was it permitted to kindle any more at the magnific nuptials of the most potent and wealthy nor yet any fewer at the penurious weddings of the poorest and most abject of the world moreover in times past the heathen or paynims implored the assistance of five deities or of one helpful at least in five several good offices to those that were to be married of this sort were the nuptial jove juno president of the feast 
the fair venus pitho the goddess of eloquence and persuasion and diana whose aid and succour was required to the labour of childbearing then shouted panurge o oh, the gentle goat's nose i will give him a farm near canaeus and a windmill hard by mirabele hereupon the dumb fellow sneezeth with an impetuous vehemency and huge concussion of the spirits of the whole body withdrawing himself in so doing with a jerking turn towards the left hand by the body of a fox new slain quoth pantagruel what is that this maketh nothing for your advantage for he betokeneth thereby that your marriage will be inauspicious and unfortunate this sneezing according to the doctrine of terpsion is the socratic demon if done towards the right side it imports and portendeth that boldly and with all assurance one may go whither he will and do what he listeth according to what deliberation he shall be pleased to have thereupon taken his entries in the beginning progress in his proceedings and success in the events and issues will be all lucky good and happy the quite contrary thereto is thereby implied and presage if it be done towards the left you quoth panurge do take always the matter at the worst and continually like another davis casteth in new disturbances and obstructions nor ever yet did i know this old paltry terpsion worthy of citation but in points only of cosinage and imposture nevertheless quoth pantagruel cicero hath written i know not what to the same purpose in his second book of divination panurge then turning himself towards goat's nose made this sign unto him he inverted his eyelids upwards wrenched his jaws from the right to the left side and drew forth his tongue half out of his mouth this done he posited his left hand wholly open the mid-finger wholly excepted which was perpendicularly placed upon the palm thereof and set it just in the room where his codpiece had been then did he keep his right hand altogether shut up in a fist save only the thumb which he straight turned backwards directly under the right armpit and settled it afterwards on that most eminent part of the buttocks which the arabs call the al katin suddenly thereafter he made this interchange he held his right hand after the manner of the left and posited it on the place wherein his codpiece sometime was and retaining his left hand in the form and fashion of the right he placed it upon his al katin this altering of hands did he reiterate nine several times at the last whereof he reseated his eyelids into their own first natural position then doing the like also with his jaws and tongue he did cast a squinting look upon goat's nose dittering and shivering his chaps as apes used to do nowadays and rabbits whilst almost starved with hunger they are eating oats in the sheaf then was it that goat's nose lifting up into the air his right hand wholly open and displayed put the thumb thereof even close unto its first articulation between the two third joints of the middle and ring fingers pressing about the said thumb thereof very hard with them both and whilst the remnant joints were contracted and shrunken towards the wrist he stretched forth with as much straightness as he could the four and little fingers that hand thus framed and disposed of he laid and posited upon panurge's navel moving withal continually the aforesaid thumb and bearing up supporting or under propping that hand upon the above specified four and little fingers as upon two legs thereafter did he make in this posture his hand by little and little and by degrees and pauses successively to mount from athwart the belly to the stomach from whence he made it to ascend to the breast even upwards to panurge's neck still gaining ground till having reached his chin he had put within the concave of his mouth his aforementioned thumb then fiercely brandishing the whole hand which he made to rub and grate against his nose he heaved it further up and made the fashion as if with the thumb thereof he would have put out his eyes with this panurge grew a little angry and went about to withdraw and rid himself from this ruggedly untoward dumb devil but goat's nose in the meantime prosecuting the intended purpose of his prognosticatory response 
touch very rudely with the above-mentioned shaking thumb now his eyes then his forehead and after that the borders and corners of his cap at last panurge cried out saying before god master fool if you do not let me alone or that you will presume to vex me any more you shall receive from the best hand i have a mask wherewith to cover your rascally scoundrel face you paltry shitten varlet then said friar john he is deaf and doth not understand what thou sayest unto him bulla bollock make sign to him of a hail of fisticuffs upon the muzzle what the devil quoth panurge means this busy restless fellow what is it that this polypragmonetic ardelian to all the fiends of hell doth aim at he hath almost thrust out mine eyes as if he had been to poach them in a skillet with butter and eggs by god da gerandi i will feast you with flirts and raps on the snout interlarded with a double row of bobs and finger flippings then did he leave him in giving him by way of salvo a volley of farts for his farewell goat's nose perceiving panurge thus to slip away from him got before him and by mere strength enforcing him to stand made this sign unto him he let fall his right arm toward his knee on the same side as low as he could and raising all the fingers of that hand into a close fist passed his dexter thumb betwixt the foremost and mid fingers thereto belonging then scrubbing and swinging a little with his left hand alongst and upon the uppermost in the very bow of the elbow of the said dexter arm the whole cubit thereof by leisure fair and softly at these thumpatory warnings did raise and elevate itself even to the elbow and above it on a sudden did he then let it fall down as low as before and after that at certain intervals and such spaces of time raising and debasing it he made a show thereof to panurge this so incensed panurge that he forthwith lifted his hand to have stricken him the dumb royster and given him a sound worrit on the ear but that the respect and reverence which he carried to the presence of pantagruel restrained his collar and kept his fury within bounds and limits then said pantagruel if the bare signs now vex and trouble you how much more grievously will you be perplexed and disquieted with the real things which by them are represented and signified all truths agree and are consonant with one another this dumb fellow prophesieth and foretelleth that you will be married cuckolded beaten and robbed as for the marriage quoth panurge i yield thereto and acknowledge the verity of that point of his prediction as for the rest i utterly abjure and deny it and believe sir i beseech you if it may please you so to do that in the matter of wives and horses never any man was predestinated to a better fortune than i End of chapter 320chapter three twenty one of gargantua and pantagruel book three by francois rabelais this librivox recording is in the public domain how panurge consulted with an old french poet named ramina groby i never thought said pantagruel to have encountered with any man so headstrong in his apprehensions or in his opinions so wilful as i have found you to be and see you are nevertheless the better to clear and extricate your doubts let us try all courses and leave no stone unturned nor wind unsailed by take good heed to what i am to say unto you the swans which are fowls consecrated to apollo never chant but in the hour of their approaching death especially in the meander flood which is a river that runneth along some of the territories of phrygia this i say because elianus and alexander mindius write that they had seen several swans in other places die but never heard any of them sing or chant before their death however it passeth for current that the imminent death of a swan is presaged by his foregoing song and that no swan dieth until prealably he have sung after the same manner poets who are under the protection of apollo when they are drawing near their latter end 
do ordinarily become prophets and by the inspiration of that god sing sweetly in vaticinating things which are to come it hath been likewise told me frequently that old decrepit men upon the brinks of charon's banks do usher their deceased with the disclosure all at ease to those that are desirous of such informations of the determinate and assured truth of future accidents and contingencies i remember also that aristophanes in a certain comedy of his calleth the old folks sibyls aethogeron zebulia for as when being upon a pier by the shore we see afar off mariners seafaring men and other travellers alongst the curled waves of azure thetis within their ships we then consider them in silence only and seldom proceed any further than to wish them a happy and prosperous arrival but when they do approach near to the haven and come to wet their keels within their harbour then both with words and gestures we salute them and heartily congratulate their access safe to the port wherein we are ourselves just so the angels heroes and good demons according to the doctrine of the platonics when they see mortals drawing near unto the harbour of the grave as the most sure and calmest port of any full of repose ease rest tranquillity free from the troubles and solicitudes of this tumultuous and tempestuous world then is it that they with alacrity hail and salute them cherish and comfort them and speaking to them lovingly begin even then to bless them with illuminations and to communicate unto them the abstrusest mysteries of divination i will not offer here to confound your memory by quoting antique examples of isaac of jacob of patroclus towards hector of hector towards achilles of polynester towards agamemnon of hecuba of the rhodian renowned by posidonius of calanus the indian towards alexander the great of herodes towards mezentius and of many others it shall suffice for the present that i commemorate unto you the learned and valiant knight and cavalier william of belay late lord of langy who died on the hill of tarara the tenth of january in the climacteric year of his age and of our supputation fifteen forty three according to the roman account the last three or four hours of his life he did employ in the serious utterance of a very pithy discourse whilst with a clear judgment and spirit void of all trouble he did foretell several important things whereof a great deal has come to pass and the rest we wait for howbeit his prophecies did at that time seem unto us somewhat strange absurd and unlikely because there did not then appear any sign of efficacy enough to engage our faith to the belief of what he did prognosticate we have here near to the town of villamere a man that is both old and a poet ramina grobus who to his second wife espoused my lady broadsow on whom he begot the fair basoch it hath been told me he is a dying and so near unto his latter end that he is almost upon the very last moment point and article thereof prepare thither as fast as you can and be ready to give an attentive ear to what he shall chant unto you it may be that you shall obtain from him what you desire and that apollo will be pleased by his means to clear your scruples i am content quoth panurge let us go thither epistemon and that both instantly and in all haste lest otherwise his death prevent our coming wilt thou come along with us friar john yes that i will quoth friar john right heartily to do thee a courtesy my billy bollocks for i love thee with the best of my milt and liver thereupon incontinently without any further lingering to the way they all three went and quickly thereafter for they made good speed arriving at the poetical habitation they found the jolly old man albeit in the agony of his departure from this world looking cheerfully with an open countenance 
splendid aspect and behaviour full of alacrity after that panurge had very civilly saluted him he in a free gift did present him with a gold ring which he even then put upon the medical finger of his left hand in the collet or bezel whereof was encased an oriental sapphire very fair and large then in imitation of socrates did he make an oblation unto him of a fair white cock which was no sooner set upon the tester of his bed than that with a high raised head and crest lustily shaking his feather coat he crowed stentorifonically loud this done panurge very courteously required of him that he would vouchsafe to favour him with the grant and report of his sense and judgment touching the future destiny of his intended marriage for answer hereto when the honest old man had forthwith commanded pen paper and ink to be brought unto him and that he was at the same call conveniently served with all the three he wrote these following verses take or not take her off or on handy dandy is your lot when her name you write you blot tis undone when all is done ended ere it was begun hardly gallop if you trot set not forward when you run nor be single though alone take or not take her before you eat begin to fast for what shall be was never past say unsay gainsay save your breath then wish at once her life and death take or not take her these lines he gave out of his own hands unto them saying unto them go my lads in peace the great god of the highest heavens be your guardian and preserver and do not offer any more to trouble or disquiet me with this or any other business whatsoever i have this same very day which is the last both of may and of me with a great deal of labour toil and difficulty chased out of my house a rabble of filthy unclean and plaguily pestilentious rake hells black beasts dusk dun white ash-coloured speckled in a foul vermin of other hues whose obtrusive importunity would not permit me to die at my own ease for by fraudulent and deceitful pricklings ravenous harpy-like graspings waspish stingings and such like unwelcome approaches forged in the shop of i know not what kind of insatiabilities they went about to withdraw and call me out of those sweet thoughts wherein i was already beginning to repose myself and acquiesce in the contemplation and vision yea almost in the very touch and taste of the happiness and felicity which the good god hath prepared for his faithful saints and elect in the other life and state of immortality turn out of their courses and eschew them step forth of their ways and do not resemble them meanwhile let me be no more troubled by you but leave me now in silence i beseech you End of chapter 321chapter three twenty two of gargantua and pantagruel book three by francois rabelais this librivox recording is in the public domain alpanurge patrocinates and defendeth the order of the begging friars panurge at his issuing forth of ramenagrobes's chamber said as if he had been horribly affrighted by the virtue of god i believe that he is an heretic the devil take me if i do not he does so villainously rail at the mendicant friars and jacobins who are the two hemispheres of the christian world by whose gyronomonic circumbilivaginations as by two salivagus philopendulums and all the autonomic autonomatic metagrobalism of the romish church when tottering and implustricated with the gibble gabble gibberish of this odious error and heresy 
is homocentrically poised but what harm in the devil's name have these poor devils the capuchins and minims done unto him are not these beggarly devils sufficiently wretched already who can imagine that these poor snakes the very extracts of ichthyophagy are not thoroughly enough besmoked and besmeared with misery distress and calamity dost thou think friar john by thy faith that he is in the state of salvation he goeth before god as surely damned to thirty thousand baskets full of devils as a pruning bill to the lopping of a fine branch to revile with appropriate speeches the good and courageous props and pillars of the church is that to be called a poetical fury i cannot rest satisfied with him he sinneth grossly and blasphemeth against the true religion i am very much offended at his scandalizing words and contumelious obloquy i do not care a straw quoth friar john for what he hath said for although everybody should twit and jerk them it were but a just retaliation seeing all persons are served by them with the like sauce therefore do i pretend no interest therein let us see nevertheless what he hath written panurge very attentively read the paper which the old man had penned then said to his two fellow-travellers the poor drinker doteth howsoever i excuse him for that i believe he is now drawing near to the end and final closure of his life let us go make his epitaph by the answer which he hath given us i am not i protest one jot wiser than i was hearken here epistemon my little bully dost not thou hold him to be very resolute in his responsory verdicts he is a witty quick and subtle sophister i will lay an even wager that he is a miscreant apostate by the belly of a stalled ox how careful he is not to be mistaken in his words he answered but by disjunctives therefore can it not be true which he saith for the verity of such like propositions is inherent only in one of its two members oh the cousining prattler that he is i wonder if santiago of cressure be one of these cogging shirts such was of old quoth epistemon the custom of the grand vaccinator and prophet Tiresias, who used always by way of a preface to say openly and plainly at the beginning of his divinations and predictions that what he was to tell would either come to pass or not and such is truly the style of all prudently presaging prognosticators he was nevertheless quoth panurge so unfortunately misadventurous in the lot of his own destiny that juno thrust out both his eyes yes answered epistemon and that merely out of a spite and spleen for having pronounced his award more veritable than she upon the question which was merely proposed by jupiter but quoth panurge what archdevil is it that hath possessed this master remina grobus that so unreasonably and without any occasion he should have so snappishly and bitterly inveighed against these poor honest fathers jacobins miners and minims it vexeth me grievously i assure you nor am i able to conceal my indignation he has transgressed most enormously his soul goeth infallibly to thirty thousand panniers full of devils i understand you not quoth epistemon and it disliketh me very much that you should so absurdly and perversely interpret that of the friar mendicants which by the harmless poet was spoken of black beasts dun and other sorts of other coloured animals he is not in my opinion guilty of such a sophistical and fantastic allegory as by that phrase of his to have meant the begging brothers he in downright terms speaketh absolutely and properly of fleas punies handworms flies gnats and other such like scurvy vermin whereof some are black some dun some ash-coloured some tawny and some brown and dusky all noisome molesting tyrannous cumbersome and unpleasant creatures not only to the sick and diseased folks but to those also who are of a sound vigorous and healthful temperament and constitution it is not unlikely that he may have the asgurids and the lumbricks and worms within the entrails of his body possibly doth he suffer as it is frequent and usual amongst the egyptians together with all those who inhabit the ethereian confines and dwell along the shores and coasts of the red sea 
some sour prickings and smart stingings in his arms and legs of those little speckled dragons which the arabians call medan you are to blame for offering to expound his words otherwise and wrong the ingenuous poet and outrageously abuse and miscall the said freighters by an imputation of baseness undeservedly laid to their charge we still should in such like discourses of that eloquent soothsayers interpret all things to the best will you teach me quoth banerj how to discern flies among milk or show your father the way how to beget children he is by the virtue of god inerrant heretic a resolute formal heretic i say a rooted combustible heretic one as fit to burn as the little wooden clock at rochelle his soul goeth to thirty thousand carts full of devils would you know whither cock's body my friend straight under proserpina's close stool to the very middle of the self-same infernal pan within which she by an excrementitious evacuation voideth the fecal stuff of her stinking clysters and that just upon the left side of the great cauldron of three fathom height hard by the claws and talons of lucifer in the very darkest of the passage which leadeth towards the black chamber of demogorgon o oh, the villain End of chapter three twenty two chapter three twenty three of gargantua and pantagruel book three by francois rabelais this librivox recording is in the public domain how panurge maketh the motion of a return to ramanagrobus let us return quoth panurge not ceasing to the uttermost of our abilities to ply him with wholesome admonitions for the furtherance of his salvation let us go back for god's sake let us go in the name of god it will be a very meritorious work and of great charity in us to deal so in the matter and provide so well for him that albeit he come to lose both body and life he may at least escape the risk and danger of the eternal damnation of his soul we will by our holy persuasions bring him to a sense of feeling of his escapes induce him to acknowledge his faults move him to a cordial repentance of his errors and stir up in him such a sincere contrition of heart for his offences as will prompt him with all earnestness to cry mercy and to beg pardon at the hands of the good fathers as well of the absent as of such as are present whereupon we will take instrument formally and authentically extended to the end he be not after his decease declared an heretic and condemned as were the hobgoblins of the provost's wife of orleans to the undergoing of such punishments pains and tortures as are due to and inflicted on those that inhabit the horrid cells of the infernal regions and withal incline instigate and persuade him to bequeath and leave in legacy by way of an amends and satisfaction for the outrage and injury done to those good religious fathers throughout all the convents cloisters and monasteries of this province many bribes a great deal of mass singing store of orbits and that sympaternally on the anniversary day of his decease every one of them all be furnished with a quintuple allowance and that the great baraccio replenished with the best liquor trudge apace along the tables as well of the young duckling monquitos lay brothers and lower most degree of the abbey lubbards as of the learned priests and reverend clerks the very meanest of the novices and mitiants unto the order being equally admitted to the benefit 
of those funerary and obsequial festivals with the aged rectors and professed fathers this is the surest ordinary means whereby from god he may obtain forgiveness ho ho i am quite mistaken i digress from the purpose and fly out of my discourse as if my spirits were a wool gathering the devil take me if i go thither virtue god the chamber is already full of devils oh what a swinging thwacking noise is now amongst them oh the terrible coil that they keep hearken do you not hear the rustling thumping bustle of their strokes and blows as they scuffle with one another like true devils indeed who shall gulp up the ramanogrobus soul and be the first bringer of it whilst it is hot to monsieur lucifer beware and get you hence for my part i will not go thither the devil roast me if i go who knows but that these hungry mad devils may in the haste of their rage and fury of their impatience take a qui for a quo and instead of rama nagrobus snatch up poor panurge frank and free though formerly when i was deep in debt they always failed get you hence i will not go thither before god the very bare apprehension thereof is like to kill me to be in a place where there are greedy famished and hunger-starved devils amongst factious devils amidst trading and trafficking devils o oh, the lord preserve me get you hence i dare pawn my credit on it that no jacobin cordelier camerlite capuchin theatin or minim will bestow any personal presence at his interment the wiser they because he hath ordained nothing for them in his latter will and testament the devil take me if i go thither if he be damned to his own loss and hindrance be it what the deuce moved him to be so snappish and depravedly bent against the good fathers of the true religion why did he cast them off reject them and drive them quite out of his chamber even in that very nick of time when he stood in greatest need of the aid suffrage and assistance of their devout prayers and holy admonitions why did not he by testament leave them at least some jolly lumps and cantles of substantial meat a parcel of cheek puffing victuals and a little belly timber and provision for the guts of these poor folks who have nothing but their life in this world let him go thither who will the devil take me if i go for if i should the devil would not fail to snatch me up can crow ho the pox get you hence friar john art thou content that thirty thousand wane load of devils should get away with thee at this same very instant if thou be at my request do these three things first give me thy purse for besides that thy money is marked with crosses and the cross is an enemy to charms the same may befall to thee which not long ago happened to john doden collector of the excise of coudre at the ford of vide when the soldiers broke the planks this moneyed fellow meeting at the very brink of the bank of the ford with friar adam crankcod a franciscan observant of mirabeau promised him a new frock provided that in the transporting of him over the water he would bear him upon his neck and shoulders after the manner of carrying dead goats for he was a lusty strong-limbed sturdy rogue the condition being agreed upon friar crankcod trusteth himself up to his very bollocks and layeth upon his back like a fair little saint christopher the load of the said supplicant dodan and so carried him gaily and with a good will as aeneas bore his father and Caeses through the conflagration of troy singing in the meanwhile a pretty ave maria stella when they were in the very deepest place of all the ford a little above the master-wheel of the water-mill 
he asked if he had any coin about him yes quoth Dedin, a whole bagful and that he needed not to mistrust his ability in the performance of the promise which he had made unto him concerning a new frock how quoth our crank thou knowest well enough that by the express rules and canons and injunctions of our order we are forbidden to carry on us any kind of money thou art truly unhappy for having made me in this point to commit a heinous trespass why didst thou not leave thy purse with the miller without fail thou shalt presently receive thy reward for it and if ever hereafter i may but lay hold upon thee within the limits of our chancel at mirabeau thou shalt have the miserere even to the vitulos with this suddenly discharging himself of his burden he throws me down your dodin headlong take example by this dodin my dear friend friar john to the end that the devils may the better carry thee away at thine own ease give me thy purse carry no manner of cross upon thee therein lieth an evident and manifest the apparent danger for if you have any silver coined with a cross upon it they will cast thee down headlong upon some rocks as the eagles used to do with the tortoises for the breaking of their shells as the bold pate of the poet aeschylus can sufficiently bear witness such a fall would hurt thee very sore my sweet bully and i would be sorry for it or otherwise they will let thee fall and tumble down into the high swollen waves of some capacious sea i know not where but i warrant thee far enough hence as icarus fell which from that name would afterwards get the denomination of the funelian sea secondly be out of debt for the devils carry a great liking to those that are out of debt i have sore felt the experience thereof in mine own particular for now the lecherous varlets are always wooing me courting me and making much of me which they never did when i was all to pieces the soul of one in debt is insipid dry and heretical altogether thirdly with the cow and domino to grobus return to remina grobus and in case being thus qualified thirty thousand boats full of devils forthwith come not to carry thee quite away i shall be content to be at the charge of paying for the pint and faggot now if for the more security thou wouldst some associate to bear thee company let not me be the comrade thou searchest for think not to get a fellow-traveller of me nay do not advise thee for the best get you hence i will not go thither the devil take me if i go notwithstanding all the fright that you are in quoth friar john i would not care so much as might possibly be expected i should if i once had but my sword in my hand thou hast barely hit the nail on the head quoth panurge and speakest like a learned doctor subtle and well skilled in the art of devilry at the time when i was a student in the university of toulouse tolet that same reverend father in the devil picatrix rector of the diabological faculty was wont to tell us that the devils did naturally fear the bright glancing of swords as much as the splendour and light of the sun in confirmation of the verity whereof he related this story that hercules at his descent into hell to all the devils of those regions did not by half so much terrify them with his club and lion's skin as afterwards aeneas did with his clear shining armour upon him and his sword in his hand well furbished and unrusted by the aid counsel and assistance of the sibylla cumana that was perhaps the reason why the senior john giacomo di trivugio whilst he was a-dying at chartres called for his cutlass and died with a drawn sword in his hand laying about him the long stem the thwart around the bed and everywhere within his reach like a stout doughty valorous and knight-like cavalier by which resolute manner of fence he scared away and put to flight all the devils that were then lying in wait for his soul at the passage of his death when the masseret and cabalists are asked why it is that none of all the devils do at any time enter into the terrestrial paradise their answer hath been is and will be still that there is a cherubim standing at the gate thereof with a flame-like glistening sword in his hand although to speak in the true diabolical sense of phrase of toledo i must needs confess and acknowledge 
that veritably the devils cannot be killed or die by the stroke of a sword i do nevertheless avow and maintain according to the doctrine of the said diabology that they may suffer a solution of continuity as if with thy shabel thou shouldst cut athwart the flame of a burning fire or the gross opacous exhalations of a thick and obscure smoke and cry out like very devils at their sense and feeling of this dissolution which in real deed i must affer and affirm is devilishly painful smarting and dolorous when thou seest the impetuous shock of two armies and vehement violence of the push and their horrid encounter with one another dost thou think balacaso that so horrible a noise as is heard there proceedeth from the voice and shouts of men the dashing and jolting of harness the clattering and clashing of armies the hacking and slashing of battle axes the jostling and crashing of pikes the bustling and breaking of lances the clamour and shrieks of the wounded the sound and din of drums the clangour and shrillness of trumpets the neighing and rushing in of horses with the fearful claps and thundering of all sorts of guns from the double cannon to the pocket pistol inclusively i cannot goodly deny but that in these various things which i have rehearsed there may be somewhat occasionative of the huge yell and tintamari of the two engaged bodies but the most fearful and tumultuous coil and stir the terriblest and most boisterous garboil and hurry the chiefest rustling black santis of all the most principal hurly-burly springing from the grievously blangorous howling and lowing of devils who pell-mell in a hand over head confusion waiting for the poor souls of the maimed and hurt soldiery receive unawares some strokes with swords and so by those means suffer a solution of and division in the continuity of their aerial and invisible substances as if some lackey snatching at the large slices stuck in a piece of roast meat on the spit should give from mr greasy fist a good rap on the knuckles with a cudgel they cry out and shout like devils even as mars did when he was hurt by diomedes at the siege of troy who as homer testifieth of him did then raise his voice more horrifically loud and sonoriferously high than ten thousand men together would have been able to do what maketh all this for our present purpose i have been speaking here of well furbished armour and bright shining swords but so is it not friar john with thy weapon for by a long discontinuance of work cessation from labour desisting from making it officiate and putting it into that practice wherein it had been formerly accustomed and in a word for want of occupation it is upon my faith become more rusty than the keyhole of an old powdering tub therefore it is expedient that you do one of these two things either furbish your weapon bravely and as it ought to be or otherwise have a care that in the rusty case it is in you do not presume to return to the house of ramina grobus for my part i vow i will not go thither the devil take me if i go End of chapter three twenty three chapter three twenty four of gargantua and pantagruel book three by francois rabelais this librivox recording is in the public domain how panurge consulteth with epistemon having left the town of villamere as they were upon their return towards pantagruel panurge in addressing his discourse to epistemon spoke thus my most ancient friend and gossip thou seest the perplexity of my thoughts and knowest many remedies for the removal thereof art thou not able to help and succour me epistemon thereupon taking the speech in hand represented unto panurge how the open voice and common fame of the whole country did run upon no other discourse but the derision and mockery of his new disguise wherefore his counsel unto him was that he would in the first place be pleased to make use of a little hellebore for the purging of his brain of that peccant humour which through that extravagant and fantastic mummery of his had furnished the people with a too just occasion of flouting and gibing jeering and scoffing him 
and that next he would resume his ordinary fashion of accoutrement and go apparelled as he was wont to do i am quoth panurge my dear gossip epistemon of a mind and resolution to marry but am afraid of being a cuckold and to be unfortunate in my wedlock for this cause have i made a vow to young st francis who at place les tours is much reverenced of all women earnestly cried unto by them and with great devotion for he was the first founder of the confraternity of good men whom they naturally covet affect and long for to wear spectacles in my cap and to carry no codpiece in my breeches until the present inquietude and perturbation of my spirits be fully settled truly quoth the pistemon that is a pretty jolly vow of thirteen to a dozen it is a shame to you and i wonder much at it that you do not return unto yourself and recall your senses from this their wild swerving and straying abroad to that rest and stillness which becomes a virtuous man this whimsical conceit of yours brings me to the remembrance of a solemn promise made by the shag-haired argives who having in their controversy against the lacedaemonians for the territory of thyrea lost the battle which they hoped should have decided it for their advantage vowed to carry never any hair on their heads till pre alibly they had recovered the loss of both their honour and lands as likewise to the memory of the vow of a pleasant spaniard called michael doris who vowed to carry in his hat a piece of the shin of his leg till he should be revenged of him who had struck it off yet do not i know which of these two deserveth most to wear a green and yellow hood with a hare's ears tied to it either the aforesaid vainglorious champion or that en garon who having forgot the art and manner of writing histories set down by the samosatian philosopher maketh a most tediously long narrative and relation thereof for at the first reading of such a profuse discourse one would think it had been broached for the introducing of a story of great importance and moment concerning the waging of some formidable war or the notable change and mutation of potent states and kingdoms but in conclusion the world laugheth at the capricious champion at the englishman who had affronted him as also at their scribbler en angeron more drivelling at the mouth than a mustard pot the jest and scorn thereof is not unlike to that of the mountain of horse which by the poet was made to cry out and lament most enormously as a woman in the pangs and labour of childbirth at which deplorable and exorbitant cries and lamentations the whole neighbourhood being assembled in expectation to see some marvellous monstrous production could at last perceive no other but the paltry ridiculous mouse your mousing quoth panurge will not make me leave my musing why folks should be so frumpishly disposed seeing i am certainly persuaded that some flout who merit to be flouted at yet as my vow imports so will i do it is now a long time since by jupiter philos a mistake of the translators m we did swear faith and amity to one another give me your advice billy and tell me your opinion freely should i marry or no truly quoth epistemon the case is hazardous and the danger so eminently apparent that i find myself too weak and insufficient to give you a punctual and peremptory resolution therein and if ever it was true that judgment is difficult in matters of the medicinal art what was said by hippocrates of lango it is certainly so in this case true it is that in my brain there are some rolling fancies by means whereof somewhat may be pitched upon of a seeming efficacy to the disentangling your mind of those dubious apprehensions wherewith it is perplexed but they do not thoroughly satisfy me some of the platonic sect affirm that whosoever is able to see 
his proper genius may know his own destiny i understand not their doctrine nor do i think that you adhere to them there is a palpable abuse i have seen the experience of it in a very curious gentleman of the country of estangour this is one of the points there is yet another not much better if there were any authority now in the oracles of jupiter amon of apollo in Lepidia, delphos delos Chira, patara tigaris prinesti lycia colophon or in the castalian fountain near antiochia in syria between the branchidians of bacchus and dodona of mercury and fares near patras of apis in egypt of serapis in canopy of faunus in manalia and albunia near tivoli of tiresias in orcomenus of mopsus in cilicia of orpheus in lesbos and of trophonius in leucadia i would in that case advise you and possibly not to go thither for their judgment concerning the design and enterprise you have in hand but you know that they are all of them become as dumb as so many fishes since the advent of that saviour king whose coming to this world hath made all oracles and prophecies to cease as the approach of the sun's radiant beams expelleth goblins bugbears hob thrushes bromes screech owl mates night walking spirits and tenebrions these now are gone but although they were as yet in continuance and in the same power rule and request that formerly they were yet would not i counsel you to be too credulous in putting any trust in their responses too many folks have been deceived thereby it stands furthermore upon record how agrippina did charge the fair lalia with the crime of having interrogated the oracle of apollo clarius to understand if she should be at any time married to the emperor claudius for which cause she was first banished and thereafter put to a shameful and ignominious death but saith panurge let us do better the ogygian islands are not far distant from the haven of samalo let us after that we shall have spoken to our king make a voyage thither in one of these four isles to wit that which hath its primest aspect towards the sun setting it is reported and i have read in good antique and authentic authors that there reside many soothsayers fortune-tellers vaticinators prophets and diviners of things to come that saturn inhabiteth that place bound with fair chains of gold and within the concavity of a golden rock being nourished with divine ambrosia and nectar which are daily in great store and abundance transmitted to him from the heavens by i do not well know what kind of fowls it may be that they are the same ravens which in the deserts are said to have fed st paul the first hermit he very clearly foretelleth unto every one who is desirous to be certified of the condition of his lot what his destiny will be and what future chance the fates have ordained for him for the parsi or weird sisters do not twist spin or draw out a thread nor yet doth jupiter perpend project or deliberate anything which the good old celestial father knoweth not to the full even whilst he is asleep this will be a very summary abbreviation of our labour if we but hearken unto him a little upon the serious debate and canvassing of this my perplexity that is answered epistemon a gullery too evident a plain abuse and fib too fabulous i will not go not i i will not go end of chapter three twenty four chapter three twenty five of gargantua and pantagruel book three by francois rabelais this librivox recording is in the public domain how panurge consulted with herr tripper nevertheless quoth epistemon continuing his discourse i will tell you what you may do if you believe me before we return to our king hard by here in the brown wheat boucha island dwelleth herr tripper you know how by the arts of astrology geomancy chiromancy metopo mancy and others of a like stuff and nature he foretelleth all things to come 
let us talk a little and confer with him about your business of that answered panurge i know nothing but of this much concerning him i am assured that one day and that not long since whilst he was prating to the great king of celestial sublime and transcendent things the lackeys and footboys of the court upon the upper steps of stairs between two doors jumbled one after another as often as they listed his wife who is passable fair and a pretty snug hussy thus he who seemed very clearly to see all heavenly and terrestrial things without spectacles who discoursed boldly of adventures past with great confidence opened up present cases and accidents and stoutly professed a presaging of all future events and contingencies was not able with all the skill and cunning that he had to perceive the bombasting of his wife whom he reputed to be very chaste and hath not till this hour got notice of anything to the contrary yet let us go to him seeing you will have it so for surely we can never learn too much they on the very next ensuing day came to herr tripper's lodging panurge by way of donative presented him with a long gown lined all through with wolf skins with a short sword mounted with a gilded hilt and covered with a velvet scabbard and with fifty good single angels then in a familiar and friendly way did he ask of him his opinion touching the affair at the very first herr tripper looking on him very wistly in the face said unto him thou hast a metoposcopy and physiognomy of a cuckold i say of a notorious and infamous cuckold with this casting an eye upon panurge's right hand in all the parts thereof he said this rugged draught which i see here just under the mount of jove was never yet but in the hand of a cuckold afterwards he with a white lead pen swiftly and hastily drew a certain number of diverse kinds of points which by rules of geomancy he coupled and joined together then said truth itself is not truer than that it is certain thou wilt be a cuckold a little after thy marriage that being done he asked of panurge the horoscope of his nativity which was no sooner by panurge tendered unto him than that erecting a figure he very promptly and speedily formed and fashioned a complete fabric of the houses of heaven in all their parts whereof when he had considered the situation and the aspects in their triplicities he fetched a deep sigh and said i have clearly enough already discovered unto you the fate of your cuckoldry which is unavoidable you cannot escape it and here have i got of new a further assurance thereof so that i may now heartily pronounce and affirm without any scruple or hesitation at all that thou wilt be a cuckold that furthermore thou wilt be beaten by thine own wife and that she will purloin filch and steal of thy goods from thee for i find the seventh house in all its aspects of a malignant influence and every one of the planets threatening thee with disgrace according as they stand seated towards one another in relation to the horned signs of aries taurus and capricorn in the fourth house i find jupiter in a decadence as also in a tetragonal aspect to saturn associated with mercury thou wilt be soundly peppered my good honest fellow i warrant thee i will be answered panurge a plague rot thee thou old fool and doting sot how graceless and unpleasant thou art when all cuckolds shall be at a general rendezvous thou shouldst be their standard-bearer but whence comes this chiron worm betwixt these two fingers this panurge said putting the forefinger of his left hand betwixt the fore and mid finger of the right which he thrust out towards herr tripper holding them open after the manner of two horns and shedding into his fist his thumb with the other fingers then in turning to epistemon he said lo here the true olus of marshall who addicted and devoted himself wholly to the observing the miseries crosses and calamities of others whilst his own wife in the interim did keep an open bawdy house 
this valet is poorer than ever was iris and yet he is proud vaunting arrogant self-conceited overweening and more insupportable than seventeen devils in one word tocalizan which term of old was applied to the like beggarly strutting coxcombs come let us leave this mad pash bedlam this harebrained fop and give him leave to rave and dose his bellyful with his private and intimately acquainted devils who if they were not the very worst of all infernal fiends would never have deigned to serve such a knavish barking cur as this is he hath not learnt the first precept of philosophy which is know thyself for whilst he braggeth and boasteth that he can discern the least mote in the eye of another he is not able to see the huge block that puts out the sight of both his eyes this is such another polypragmon as is by plutarch described he is of the nature of the lamian witches who in foreign places in the houses of strangers in public and amongst the common people had a shover and more piercing inspection into their affairs than any lynx but at home in their own proper dwelling mansions were blinder than mould warps and saw nothing at all for their custom was at their return from abroad when they were by themselves in private to take their eyes out of their head from whence they were as easily removable as a pair of spectacles from their nose and to lay them up into a wooden slipper which for that purpose did hang behind the door of their lodging panurge had no sooner done speaking when herr trippa took into his hand a tamarisk branch and this quoth epistemon he doth very well write and like an artist for nicander calleth it the divinatory tree have you a mind quoth herr trippa to have the truth of the matter yet more fully and amply disclosed unto you by primomancy by aromancy whereof aristophanes in his clouds maketh great estimation by hydromancy by enlightenomancy of old and prime request amongst the assyrians and thoroughly tried by hermolaus barbarus come hither and i will show thee in this platterful of fair fountain water thy future wife lettering and super cooperizing it with two swaggering ruffians one after another yea but have a special care quoth panurge when thou comest to put thy nose within mine arse that thou forget not to pull off thy spectacles here trippa going on in his discourse said by a catapromancy likewise held in such account by the emperor didius julianus that by means thereof he ever and anon foresaw all that which at any time did happen or befall unto him thou shalt not need to put on thy spectacles for in a mirror thou wilt see her clearly and manifestly nibrandiated and billabodring it as if i should show it in the fountain of the temple of minerva near patras by coscinomancy most religiously observed of old amidst the ceremonies of the ancient romans let us have a sieve and shears and thou shalt see devils by alphitomancy cried up by theocritus in his pharmacutria by allantomancy mixing the flour of wheat with oatmeal by astagramancy whereof i have the plots and models all at hand ready for the purpose by tyromancy whereof we make some proof in a great briamont cheese which i here keep by me by gyromancy if thou shouldst turn round circles thou mightest assure thyself from me that they would fall always on the wrong side by sternomancy which maketh nothing for thy advantage for thou hast an ill-proportioned stomach by libanomancy for the which we shall need but a little frankincense by gastromancy which kind of ventral fataloquency was for a long time together used in ferrara by lady giacoma rhodogena the engastrimithian prophetess by cephalomancy often practised amongst the high germans in their boiling of an ass's head upon burning coals by seromancy where by the means of wax dissolved into water thou shalt see the figure portrait and lively representation of thy future wife and of her freedom fredaliatory belly thumping blades by capnomancy of the gallantest and most excellent of all secrets by axionomancy we want only a hatchet and a jetstone to be laid together upon a quick fire of hot embers o oh, how bravely homer was versed in the practice hereof towards penelope's suitors by animancy 
for that we have oil and wax by tetromancy thou wilt see the ashes thus aloft dispersed exhibiting thy wife in a fine posture by botanomancy for the nonce have some few leaves in reserve by sycomancy o divine art in fig tree leaves by ichthyomancy in ancient times so celebrated and put in use by tiresias and polydamas with the like certainty of event as was tried of old at the dina ditch within that grove consecrated to apollo which is in the territory of the lycians by quiromancy let us have a great many hogs and thou shalt have the bladder of one of them by cheromancy as the bean is found in the cake at the epiphany vigil by anthropomancy practised by the roman emperor heliogabalus it is somewhat irksome but thou wilt endure it well enough seeing thou art destinated to be a cuckold by a sibylline stichomancy by onomatomancy how do they call thee chauter quopanner or yet by electriomancy if i should hear with a compass draw around and in looking upon thee and considering thy lot divide the circumference thereof into four and twenty equal parts then form a several letter of the alphabet upon every one of them and lastly posit a barley corn or two upon each of these so disposed letters i just promise upon my faith and honesty that if a young virgin cock be permitted to range along and avoid them he should only eat the grains which are set and placed upon these letters a c u c k o l d t h o u s h a l t b e and that as fatidically as under the emperor valens most perplexedly desirous to know the name of him who should be his successor to the empire the cock back dissonating and electriomantic ate up the pickles that were posited on the letters t h e o d or for the more certainty will you have a trial of your fortune by the art of arispicony by augury or by extipicony by turdispicony quoth panage or yet by the mystery of necromancy i will if you please suddenly set up again and revive someone lately deceased as apollonius of Tyane did to achilles and the pythoness in the presence of saul which body so raised up and requickened will tell us the sum of all you shall acquire of him no more or less than at the invocation of erictho a certain defunct person foretold to pompey the whole progress and issue of the fatal battle fought in the far salian fields or if you be afraid of the dead as commonly all cuckolds are i will make use of the faculty of skyomancy go get thee gone quoth panage thou frantic ass to the devil and be buggered filthy bardashio that thou art by some albanian for a steeple crowned hat why the devil didst not thou counsel me as well to hold an emerald or a stone of a hyena under my tongue or to furnish and provide myself with tongues of whoops and hearts of green frogs or to eat of the liver and milk of some dragon to the end that by those means i might at the chanting and chirping of swans and other fowls understand the substance of my future lot and destiny as did of old the arabians in the country of mesopotamia fifteen brace of devils seize upon the body and soul of this horned renegado miscreant cuckold the enchanter witch and sorcerer of antichrist to all the devils of hell let us return towards our king i am sure he will not be well pleased with us if he once come to get notice that we have been in the kennel of this muffled devil i repent my being come hither i would willingly dispense with a hundred nobles and fourteen yeomen on condition that he who not long since did blow in the bottom of my breeches should instantly with his squirting spittle illuminate his moustaches o oh, lord god now how the villain hath besmoked me with vexation and anger with charms and witchcraft and with a terrible coil and stir of infernal and tartarian devils the devil take him say amen and let us go drink i shall not have any appetite for him, my victuals how good cheer soever i make these two days to come hardly these four end of chapter three twenty five chapter three twenty six of gargantua and pantagruel book three by francois rabelais this librivox recording is in the public domain how panurge consulteth with friar john of the funnels panurge was indeed very much troubled in mind 
and disquieted at the words of herr trippa and therefore as he passed by the little village of humes after he had made his address to friar john in pecking at rubbing and scratching his own left ear he said unto him keep me a little jovial and merry my dear and sweet bully for i find my brains altogether metagrabalized and confounded and my spirits in a most dunsical puzzle at the bitter talk of this devilish hellish damned fool hearken my dainty cod mellow cod lead-coloured cod knurled cod suborned cod desired cod stuffed cod speckled cod finely metalled cod arabian-like cod trussed up greyhound-like cod mounted cod sleeked cod diapered cod spotted cod master cod seated cod lusty cod jupped cod milked cod calfited cod raised cod odd cod steeled cod stale cod orange tawny cod embroidered cod glazed cod interlarded cod burger like cod impowdered cod ebonized cod braciliated cod organized cod passable cod trunkified cod furious cod packed cod hooded cod fat cod high-prized cod requisite cod lay cod cod hand filling cod insuperable cod agreeable cod formidable cod profitable cod notable cod musculus cod subsidiary cod satiric cod repercussive cod convulsive cod restorative cod masculinating cod incarnative cod sigillative cod sallying cod plump cod thundering cod lettering cod fulminating cod sparkling cod ramming cod lusty cod household cod pretty cod astrolabian cod algebraical cod venused cod aromatizing cod tricksy cod palliard cod galliard cod broaching cod addle cod syndicated cod hamed cod leisurely cod cut cod smooth cod depending cod independent cod lingering cod wrapping cod reverend cod nodding cod disseminating cod affecting cod affected cod grappled cod varnished cod renowned cod matted cod genitive cod gentle cod oval cod claustral cod virile cod staid cod massive cod manual cod absolute cod well set cod jamel cod turkish cod burning cod thwacking cod urgent cod handsome cod prompt cod fortunate cod boxwood cod latin cod unbridled cod hooked cod research cod encompassed cod sprouting out cod jolly cod lively cod gerundive cod franked cod polished cod powdered beef cod positive cod spared cod bold cod lascivious cod gluttonous cod bolting cod snorting cod pilfering cod shaking cod bobbing cod gibbeted cod fumbling cod topsy-turvying cod raging cod piled up cod filled up cod manly cod idle cod membrous cod strong cod twin cod belaboring cod gentle cod stirring cod confident cod nimble cod round-headed cod figging cod helpful cod spruce cod plucking cod ramage cod fine cod fierce cod brawny cod comp cod prepared cod soft cod wild cod renewed cod quaint cod starting cod fleshy cod auxiliary cod stuffed cod well-fed cod flourished cod fallow cod sudden cod graspful cod swill pow cod crushing cod creaking cod tilting cod ready cod vigorous cod skulking cod superlative cod resolute cod cabbage-like cod courteous cod fertile cod whizzing cod neat cod common cod brisk cod quick cod bear-like cod partitional cod patronymic cod cockney cod aromercuriated cod robust cod appetizing cod succurable cod redoubtable cod affable cod memorable cod palpable cod barbable cod tragical cod transpontine cod digestive cod active cod vital cod magistral cod monarchal cod subtle cod hammering cod clashing cod tingling cod 
usual cod exquisite cod trim cod succulent cod factious cod clammy cod new vamped cod improved cod mauling cod sounding cod battled cod burly cod seditious cod wardian cod protective cod twinkling cod able cod algoristical cod odoriferous cod pranked cod jocund cod routing cod purloining cod frolic cod wagging cod ruffling cod jumbling cod rumbling cod thumping cod bumping cod gringling cod perumpling cod jogging cod nobbing cod towsing cod tumbling cod fambling cod overturning cod shooting cod filletting cod jagged cod pinked cod arsiversing cod polished cod slash cod clashing cod wagging cod script like cob cod in cremastered cod bouncing cod levelling cod fly flap cod perini tegminal cod squat couching cod short hung cod the hypogastrian cod witness bearing cod testigerous cod instrumental cod my harka buzzing cod and buttock stirring bollock friar john my friend i do carry a singular respect unto thee and honour thee with all my heart thy counsel i hold for choice and delicate morsel therefore have i reserved it for the last bit give me thy advice freely i beseech thee should i marry or no friar john very merrily and with a sprightly cheerfulness made this answer to him marry in the devil's name why not what the devil else shouldst thou do but marry take thee a wife and furbish her harness to some tune swinge her skin coat as if thou wert beating on stockfish and let the repercussion of thy clapper from her resounding metal make a noise as if a double peal of chiming bells were hung at the cremasters of thy bollocks as i say mary so do i understand that thou shouldst fall to work as speedily as may be yea my meaning is that thou oughtest to be so quick and forward therein as on this same very day before sunset to cause proclaim thy bands of matrimony and make provision of bedsteads by the blood of a hog's pudding till when wouldst thou delay the acting of a husband's part dost thou not know and is it not daily told unto thee that the end of the world approacheth we are nearer it by three poles and a half a fathom than we were two days ago the antichrist is already born at least it is so reported by many the truth is that hitherto the effects of his wrath have not reached further than to the scratching of his nurse and governesses his nails are not sharp enough as yet nor have his claws attained to their full growth he is little crescat nos qui vivimus multiplicamur it is written so and it is holy stuff i warrant you the truth whereof is like to last as long as a sack of corn may be had for a penny and a puncheon of pure wine for threepence wouldst thou be content to be found with thy genitories full in the day of judgment doom wenerit judicari thou hast quoth banage a right clear and neat spirit friar john my metropolitan cod thou speak'st in very deed pertinently and to purpose that belike was the reason which moved leander of abydos in asia whilst he was swimming through the hellespontic sea to make a visit to his sweetheart hero of cestus in europe to pray unto neptune and all the other marine gods thus now whilst i go have pity on me and at my back returning drown me he was loath it seems to die with his cods overgorged he was to be commended therefore do i promise that from henceforth no malefactor shall by justice be executed within my jurisdiction of salmicondinoes who shall not for a day or two at least before be permitted to colbet and foraminate ono crotal wise that there remain not in all his vessels to write a greek why such a precious thing should not be foolishly cast away he will perhaps therewith beget a male and so depart the more contentedly out of this life that he shall have left behind him one for one End of chapter three twenty six chapter three twenty seven of gargantua and pantagruel book three by francois rabelais this librivox recording is in the public domain how friar john merrily and sportingly counselleth panurge by saint rigomet quoth friar john 
i do advise thee to nothing my dear friend panurge which i would not do myself were i in thy place only have a special care and take good heed thou solder well together the joints of the double-backed and two-bellied beast and fortify thy nerves so strongly that there be no discontinuance in the knocks of the venerian thwacking else thou art lost poor soul for if there pass long intervals betwixt the priapizing feats and that thou make an intermission of too large a time that will befall thee which betides the nurses if they desist from giving suck to children they lose their milk and if continually thou do not hold thy aspersory tool in exercise and keep thy mentul going thy lacticinian nectar will be gone and it will serve thee only as a pipe to piss out at and thy cods for a wallet of lesser value than a beggar's scrip this is a certain truth i tell thee friend and doubt not of it for myself have seen the sad experiment thereof in many who cannot now do what they would because before they did not what they might have done ex desuetudine amitantur privilegia non usage oftentimes destroys one's right say the learned doctors of the law therefore my billy entertain as well as possibly thou canst that hypogastrian lower sort of troglodytic people that their chief pleasure may be placed in the case of sempiternal labouring give order that henceforth they live not like idle gentlemen idly upon their rents and revenues but that they may work for their livelihood by breaking ground within the paphian trenches nay truly answered panurge friar john my left bollock i will believe thee for thou dealest plain with me and fallest down right square upon the business without going about the bush with frivolous circumstances and unnecessary reservations thou with the splendour of a piercing wit hast dissipated all the lowering clouds of anxious apprehensions and suspicions which did intimidate and terrify me therefore the heavens be pleased to grant to thee at all she conflicts a stiff standing fortune well then as thou hast said so will i do i will in good faith marry in that point there shall be no failing i promise thee and shall have always by me pretty girls clothed with the name of my wife's waiting-maids that lying under thy wings thou mayest be knight protector of their sisterhood let this serve for the first part of the sermon hearken quoth friar john to the oracle of the bells of varinis what say they i hear and understand them quoth panurge their sound is by my thirst more uprightly fatidical than that of jove's great kettles in dodona hearken take thee a wife take thee a wife and marry 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 for if thou marry thou shalt find good therein herein here in a wife thou shalt find good so marry marry i will assure thee that i shall be married all the elements invite and prompt me to it let this word be to thee a brazen wall by diffidence not to be broken through as for the second part of this our doctrine thou seemest in some measure to mistrust the readiness of my paternity in the practising of my placket racket within the aphrodisian tennis court at all times fitting as if the stiff god of gardens were not favourable to me i pray thee favour me so much as to believe that i still have him at a beck attending always my commandments docile obedient vigorous and active in all things and everywhere and never stubborn or refractory to my will or pleasure i need no more but to let go the reins and slacken the leash which is the belly point and when the game is shown unto him say hey jack to thy booty he will not fail even then to flesh himself upon his prey and tuzzle it to some purpose hereby you may perceive although my future wife were as unsatiable and gluttonous in her voluptuousness and the delights of venery as ever was the empress musselina or yet the marchioness of oinchester in england 
and i desire thee to give credit to it that i lack not for what is requisite to overlay the stomach of her lust but have wherewith aboundingly to please her i am not ignorant that solomon said who indeed of that matter speaketh clerk-like and learnedly as also how aristotle after him declared for a truth that for the greater part the lechery of a woman is ravenous and unsatisfiable nevertheless let such as are my friends who read those passages receive from me for a most real verity that i for such a jill have a fit jack and that if women's things cannot be satiated i have an instrument indefatigable an implement as copious in the giving as can in craving be their wade makums do not here produce ancient examples of the paragons of palardice and offer to match with my testiculatory ability the priapian prowess of the fabulous fornicators hercules proculus caesar and mahomet who in his al koran doth vaunt that in his cods he had the vigour of three score bully ruffians but let no zealous christian trust the rogue the filthy ribald rascal is a liar nor shalt thou need to urge authorities or bring forth the instance of the indian prince of whom theophrastus plinius and athenaeus testified that with the help of a certain herb he was able and had given frequent experiments thereof to toss his sinewy piece of generation in the act of carnal concupiscence above three score and ten times in the space of four and twenty hours of that i believe nothing the number is supposititious and too prodigally foisted in give no faith unto it i beseech thee but prithee trust me in this and thy credulity therein shall not be wrong for it is true and probatum est that my pioneer of nature the sacred ithephalian champion is of all stiff intruding blades the primest come hither my balaket and hearken didst thou ever see the monk of castra's cow when in any house it was laid down whether openly in the view of all or covertly out of the sight of any such was the ineffable virtue thereof for excitating and stirring up the people of both sexes unto lechery that the whole inhabitants and indwellers not only of that but likewise of all the circumjacent places thereto within three leagues around it did suddenly enter into rut both beasts and folks men and women even to the dogs and hogs rats and cats i swear to thee that many times heretofore i have perceived and found in my codpiece a certain kind of energy or efficacious virtue much more irregular and of a greater anomaly than what i have related i will not speak to thee either of house or cottage nor church or market but only tell thee that once at the representation of the passion which was acted at st maxence i had no sooner entered within the pit of the theatre but that forthwith by the virtue and occult property of it on a sudden all that were there both players and spectators did fall into such an exorbitant temptation of lust that there was not angel man devil nor deviless upon the place who would not then have brachilichid it with all their heart and soul the prompter forsook his copy he who played michael's part came down to rights the devils issued out of hell and carried along with them most of the pretty little girls that were there yea lucifer got out of his fetters in a word seeing the huge disorder i disparked myself forth of that enclosed place in imitation of cato the censor who perceiving by reason of his presence the floralian festivals out of order withdrew himself End of chapter three twenty seven chapter three twenty eight of gargantua and pantagruel book three by francois rabelais this librivox recording is in the public domain how friar john comforteth panurge in the doubtful matter of cuckoldry i understand thee well enough said friar john but time makes all things plain the most durable marble or poor fiery is subject to old age and decay though for the present thou possibly be not weary of the exercise yet is it like i will hear thee confess a few years hence that thy 
cods hang dangling downwards for want of a better truss i see thee waxing a little hoar-headed already thy beard by the distinction of grey white tawny and black hath to my thinking the resemblance of a map of the terrestrial globe or geographical chart look attentively upon and take inspection of what i shall show unto thee behold there asia here are tigris and euphrates lo there afric here is the mountain of the moon yonder thou mayest perceive the fenny march of nilus on this side lieth europe dost thou not see the abbey of Thelene? this little tuft which is altogether white is the hyperborean hills by the thirst of my thropple friend when snow is on the mountains i say the head and the chin there is not then any considerable heat to be expected in the valleys and low countries of the codpiece by the kives of thy heels quoth panurge thou dost not understand the topics when snow is on the tops of the hills lightning thunder tempest whirlwinds storms hurricanes and all the devils of hell rage in the valleys wouldst thou see the experience thereof go to the territory of the switzers and earnestly perpend with thyself there the situation of the lake of Wunterberlich, about four leagues distant from bern on the scion side of the land thou twittest me with my grey hairs yet considerest not how i am of the nature of leeks which with a white head carry a green fresh straight and vigorous tail the truth is nevertheless why should i deny it that i now and then discern in myself some indicative signs of old age tell this i prithee to nobody but let it be kept very close and secret betwixt us two for i find the wine much sweeter now more savoury to my taste and unto my palate of a better relish than formerly i was wont to do and withal besides mine accustomed manner i have a more dreadful apprehension than i ever heretofore have had of lighting on bad wine note and observe that this doth argue and portend i know not what of the west and occident of my time and signifieth that the south and meridian of mine age is past but what then my gentle companion that doth but betoken that i will hereafter drink so much the more that is not the devil hail it the thing that i fear nor is it there where my shoe pinches the thing that i doubt most and have greatest reason to dread and suspect is that through some long absence of our king pantagruel to whom i must needs bear company should he go to all the devils of barathrum my future wife shall make me a cuckold this is in truth the long and short on for i am by all those whom i have spoke to menaced and threatened with a horned fortune and all of them affirm it is the lot to which from heaven i am predestinated every one answered friar john that would be a cuckold is not one if it be thy fate to be hereafter of the number of that horned cattle then may i conclude with an ergo thy wife will be beautiful and ergo thou wilt be kindly used by her likewise with this ergo thou shalt be blessed with the fruition of many friends and well willers and finally with this other ergo thou shalt be saved and have a place in paradise these are monarchal topics and maxims of the cloister thou mayest take more liberty to sin thou shalt be more at ease than ever there will be nevertheless left for thee nothing diminished but thy goods shall increase notably and if so be it was preordinated for thee wouldst thou be so impious as not to acquiesce in thy destiny speak thou jaded cod faded cod mouldy cod musty cod paltry cod senseless cod foundered cod distempered cod bereaved cod inveigled cod dangling cod stupid cod seedless cod soaked cod cod coldish cod pickled cod churn cod philipped cod single thighed cod begrimed cod wrinkled cod fainted cod extenuated cod grim cod wasted cod inflamed cod unhinged cod scurfy cod straddling cod putrefied cod maimed cod over lechered cod druggily cod nitified cod goat ridden cod weakened cod ass ridden cod puff pasted cod saint anthonified cod untriped cod blasted cod cut off cod beverage cod scarified cod 
dash cod slash cod and feeble cod whore hunting cod deteriorated cod chill cod scrupulous cod crazed cod tasteless cod sorrowful cod murdered cod metachin like cod besotted cod customerless cod mince cod exulcerated cod patch cod stupefied cod annihilated cod spent cod foiled cod foiled cod anguished cod disfigured cod disabled cod forceless cod censured cod cut cod rifled cod undone cod corrected cod slit cod skittish cod spongy cod botched cod dejected cod jagged cod pining cod deformed cod mischieved cod cobbled cod embased cod ransacked cod despised cod mangy cod abased cod supine cod mended cod dismayed cod divers cod weary cod sad cod cross cod vainglorious cod poor cod brown cod drunken cod abhorred cod troubled cod scornful cod dishonest cod reproved cod cockated cod filthy cod shred cod charmed cod short-winded cod branchless cod chap cod failing cod louding cod discouraged cod surfeited cod peevish cod translated cod forlorn cod unsavory cod worm-eaten cod over cod miserable cod steep cod kneaded with cold waters cod hack cod flaggy cod scrubby cod drain cod hail cod lolling cod ranch cod burst cod stirred up cod mitred cod peddlingly furnished cod rusty cod exhausted cod perplexed cod unhealth cod fizzle cod leprous cod bruised cod spadonic cod bouty cod mealy cod wrangling cod gangrene cod crust-ridden cod ragged cod quell cod braggadocio cod beggarly cod trepan cod bedusk cod emasculated cod cork cod transparent cod bile cod antedated cod chop cod pink cod cup glassified cod harsh cod beaten cod barred cod abandoned cod confounded cod loutish cod borne down cod spark cod bash cod unseasonable cod oppressed cod grated cod falling away cod small cat cod disordered cod lattice cod ruined cod exasperated cod rejected cod belammed cod fabricitant cod perused cod emasculated cod roughly handled cod examined cod crack cod wayward cod haggled cod gleaning cod ill-favored cod pole cod drooping cod faint cod parched cod paltry cod canker cod void cod vexed cod bestunk cod winnowed cod decayed cod disastrous cod and unhandsome cod stum cod barren cod wretched cod feeble cod cast down cod stop cod kept under cod stubborn cod ground cod wretchless cod weather beaten cod flayed cod bald cod tossed cod flapping cod cleft cod meagre cod appellant cod swagging cod withered cod broken reined cod defective cod crestfallen cod Felled cod, fleeted cod, quarried cod, squeezed cod, rusty cod, pounded cod, loose cod, fruitless cod, riven cod, percy cod, fusty cod, jadish cod, fistulous cod, languishing cod, maleficiated cod, hectic cod, worn out cod, ill favored cod, duncified cod, macerated cod, paralytic cod, degraded cod, benumb cod, bat like cod, fart shotten cod, sunburnt cod, pacified cod, blunted cod, rankling tasty cod, rooted out cod, costed cod hailed on cod cuffed cod buffeted cod wirreted cod robbed cod neglected cod lame cod confused cod unsavory cod overthrown cod bolted cod trod under cod desolate cod declining cod stinking cod crooked cod brabbling cod rotten cod anxious cod clouded cod tired cod proud cod fractured cod melancholy cod coxcombly cod base cod bleak cod detested cod diaphanous cod unworthy cod check cod mangled cod turned over cod hairy cod flawed cod froward cod ugly cod drawn cod riven cod distasteful cod hanging cod broken cod limber cod effeminate cod kindled cod evacuated cod grieved cod carking cod disorderly cod empty cod disquieted cod besisted cod confounded cod hooked cod unlucky cod sterile cod beshitten cod appeased cod caitiff cod woeful cod unseemly cod heavy cod weak cod prostrated cod uncomely cod naughty cod laid flat cod suffocated cod held down cod barked cod hairless cod flamping cod hooded cod wormy cod besisted cod in his anxiety to swell his catalogue as much as possible sir thomas urquart has set down this word twice deficient cod lean cod consumed cod used cod puzzled cod allayed cod spoiled cod clagged cod palsy stricken cod amazed cod bedunced cod extirpated cod bang cod stripped cod hoary cod blotted cod sunk in cod ghastly cod unpointed cod blistered cod wizened cod beggar plated cod dolph cod clardy cod lumpish cod abject cod 
side cod choked up cod backward cod prolix cod spotted cod crumpled cod frumpled cod dumpified cod suppressed cod haggard cod jawped cod havoc cod astonished cod dulled cod slow cod plucked up cod constipated cod blown cod blockified cod pummeled cod altered bemauled cod fallen away cod stale cod corrupted cod devoured cod a mated cod blackish cod underlaid cod loathing cod ill-filled cod bobbed cod mated cod tonic cod wheeled cod besmeared cod hollow cod pantless cod gizzoned cod demiss cod refractory cod faulty cod mealed cod mortified cod scurvy cod bescabbed cod torn cod subdued cod sneaking cod beer cod swart cod smutched cod raised up cod chopped cod flirted cod blamed cod rancy cod frowning cod limping cod raveled cod ramish cod gaunt cod beskimmered cod scraggy cod lank cod swashering cod moiling cod swinking cod hairy cod tugged cod toad cod misused cod at a medical cod bollock at so to the devil my dear friend panurge seeing it is so decreed by the gods wouldst thou invert the course of the planets and make them retrograde wouldst thou disorder all the celestial spheres blame the intelligences blunt the spindles joint the worths slander the spinning quills reproach the bobbins revile their clue bottoms and finally ravel and untwist all the threads of both the warp and the waft of the weird sister parsi what a pox to thy bones dost thou mean stony cod thou wouldst if thou couldst a great deal worse than the giants of old intended to have done come hither billy cullion whether wouldst thou be jealous without cause or be a cuckold and know nothing of it neither the one nor the other quoth panurge would i choose to be but if i get an inkling of the matter i will provide well enough or there shall not be one stick of wood within five hundred leagues about me whereof to make a cudgel in good faith friar john i speak now seriously unto thee i think it will be my best not to marry hearken to what the bells do tell me now that we are nearer to them do not marry marry not 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 marry marry not 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 if thou marry thou wilt miscarry carry carry thou'lt repent it resent it sent it if thou marry thou a cuckold a coo coo cuckoo a coo 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 cuckold thou shalt be by the worthy wrath of god i begin to be angry this campanilian oracle fretteth me to the guts a march here was never in such a chafe as i am oh how i am vexed you monks and friars of the cow pated and hood polled fraternity have you no remedy nor salve against this malady of graffing horns in heads hath nature so abandoned humankind and of her help left us so destitute that married men cannot know how to sail through the seas of this mortal life and be safe from the whirlpools quicksands rocks and banks that lie alongst the coast of cornwall i will said friar john show thee a way and teach thee an expedient by means whereof thy wife shall never make thee a cuckold without thy knowledge and thine own consent do me the favour i pray thee quoth panurge my pretty soft downy cod now tell it billy tell it i beseech thee take quoth friar john hans carvel's ring upon thy finger who was the king of melinda's chief jeweller besides that this hans carvel had the reputation of being very skilful and expert in the lapidary's profession he was a studious learned and ingenious man a scientific person full of knowledge a great philosopher of a sound judgment of a prime wit good sense clear-spirited an honest creature courteous charitable a giver of alms and of a jovial humour a boon companion and a merry blade if ever there was any in the world he was somewhat gore-bellied and had a little shake in his head and was in effect unwieldy of his body in his old age he took to wife the bailiff of concordat's daughter young fair jolly gallant spruce frisk brisk neat feet smirk smug compt quaint gay fine tricksy trim decent proper graceful handsome beautiful comely and kind a little too much to her neighbours and acquaintance hereupon it fell out after the expiring of a scantling of weeks the master carvel became as jealous as a tiger and entered into a very profound suspicion that his new married gixy did keep a buttock stirring with others to prevent which inconveniency he did tell her many tragical stories of the 
total ruin of several kingdoms by adultery it read unto her the legend of chaste wives and made some lectures to her in the praise of the choice virtue of pudicity and did present her with a book in commendation of conjugal fidelity wherein the wickedness of all licentious women was odiously detested and withal he gave her a chain enriched with pure oriental sapphires notwithstanding all this he found her always more and more inclined to the reception of her neighbour cope's mates that day by day his jealousy increased in sequel whereof one night as he was lying by her whilst in his sleep the rambling fancies of the lecherous deportments of his wife did take up the cellus of his brain he dreamt that he encountered with the devil to whom he had discovered to the full the buzzing of his head and suspicion that his wife did tread her shoe awry the devil he thought in this perplexity did for his comfort give him a ring and therewithal did kindly put it on his middle finger saying hans carvel i give thee this ring whilst thou carriest it upon that finger thy wife shall never carnally be known by any other than thyself without thy special knowledge and consent gramercy quoth hans carvel my lord devil i renounce mahomet if ever it shall come off my finger the devil vanished as is his custom and then hans carvel full of joy awaking found that his middle finger was as far as it could reach within the what do by call it of his wife i did forget to tell thee how his wife as soon as she had felt the finger there said in recoiling her buttocks oh yes nay tut pish tush ay lord that is not the thing which should be put up in that place with this hans carvel thought that some pilfering fellow was about to take the ring from him is not this an infallible and sovereign antidote therefore if thou wilt believe me in imitation of this example never fail to have continually the ring of thy wife's commodity upon thy finger when that was said their discourse and their way ended End of chapter three twenty eight chapter three twenty nine of gargantua and pantagruel book three by francois rabelais this librivox recording is in the public domain how pantagruel convocated together a theologian physician lawyer and philosopher for extricating panurge out of the perplexity wherein he was no sooner were they come into the royal palace but they to the full made report unto pantagruel of the success of their expedition and showed him the response of ramina grobus when pantagruel had read it over and over again the oftener he perused it being the better pleased therewith he said in addressing his speech to panurge i have not as yet seen any answer framed to your demand which affordeth me more contentment for in this his succinct copy of verses he summarily and briefly yet fully enough expresseth how he would have us to understand that every one in the project and enterprise of marriage ought to be his own carver sole arbitrator of his proper thoughts and from himself alone take counsel in the main and peremptory closure of what his determination should be in either his assent to or dissent from it such always hath been my opinion to you and when at first you spoke thereof to me i truly told you this same very thing but tacitly you scorned my advice and would not harbour it within your mind i know for certain and therefore may i with the greater confidence utter my conception of it that philodi or self-love is that which blinds your judgment and deceiveth you let us do otherwise and that is this whatever we are or have consisteth in three things the soul the body and the goods now for the preservation of these three there are three sorts of learned men ordained each respectively to have care of that one which is recommended to his charge theologues are appointed for the soul physicians for the welfare of the body and lawyers for the safety of our goods hence it is that it is my resolution to have on sunday next 
with me at dinner a divine a physician and a lawyer that with those three assembled thus together we may in every point and particle confer at large of your perplexity by saint picot answered panurge we never shall do any good that way i see it already and you see yourself how the world is vilely abused as when with a fox-tail one claps another's breech to cajole him we give our souls to keep to the theologues who for the greater part are heretics our bodies we commit to the physicians who never themselves take any physic and then we entrust our goods to the lawyers who never go to law against one another you speak like a courtier quoth pantagruel but the first point of your assertion is to be denied for we daily see how good theologues make it their chief business their whole and sole employment by their deeds their words and writings to extirpate errors and heresies out of the hearts of men and in their stead profoundly plant the true and lively faith the second point you spoke of i commend for whereas the professors of the art of medicine give so good order to the prophylactic or conservative part of their faculty in what concerneth their proper healths that they stand in no need of making use of the other branch which is the curative or therapeutic by mendicaments as for the third i grant it to be true for learned advocates and counsellors at law are so much taken up with the affairs of others in their consultations pleadings and such like pratocinations of those who are their clients that they have no leisure to attend any controversies of their own therefore in the next ensuing sunday let the divine be our godly father hippothede the physician our honest master rondibilis and our legist our friend bridal goose nor will it be to my thinking amiss that we enter into the pythagoric field and choose for an assistant to the three or four named doctors our ancient faithful acquaintance the philosopher truiocan especially seeing a perfect philosopher such as is truiocan is able positively to resolve all whatsoever doubts you can propose carpalin have you a care to have them here all four on sunday next at dinner without fail i believe quoth the pistamon that throughout the whole country in all the corners thereof you could not have pitched upon such other four which i speak not so much in regard of the most excellent qualifications and accomplishments wherewith all of them are endowed for the respective discharge and management of each his own vocation and calling wherein without all doubt or controversy they are the paragons of the land and surpass all others as for that rondabilis is married now who before was not hippothede was not before nor is yet bridal goose was married once but is not now and true yogan is married now who wedded was to another wife before sir if it may stand with your good liking i will ease carpalin of some parcel of his labour and invite bridal goose myself with whom i of a long time have had a very intimate familiarity and under whom i am to speak on the behalf of a pretty hopeful youth who now studieth at toulouse under the most learned virtuous dr boissonnet do what you deem most expedient quoth pantagruel and tell me if my recommendation can in anything be studible for the removal of the good of that youth or otherwise serve for bettering of the dignity and office of the worthy boissonnet whom i do so love and respect for one of the ablest and most sufficient in his way than anywhere are extant sir i will use therein my best endeavours and heartily bestir myself about it End of chapter three twenty nine chapter three thirty of gargantua and pantagruel book three by francois rabelais this librivox recording is in the public domain how the theologue hippothede giveth counsel to panurge in the matter and business of his nuptial enterprise 
the dinner on the subsequent sunday was no sooner made ready than that the aforenamed invited guests gave thereto their appearance all of them bridal goose only excepted who was the deputy governor of fons baton at the ushering in of the second service panurge making a low reverence spake thus gentlemen the question i am to propound unto you shall be uttered in very few words should i marry or no if my doubt herein be not resolved by you i shall hold it altogether insolvable as are the insolubilia de aliaco for all of you are elected chosen and called out from amongst others every one in his own condition and quality like so many picked peas on a carpet the father hippothede in obedience to the bidding of pantagruel and with much courtesy to the company answered exceeding modestly after this manner my friend you are pleased to ask counsel of us but first you must consult with yourself do you find any trouble or disquiet in your body by the importunate stings and pricklings of the flesh that i do quoth panurge in a hugely strong and almost irresistible measure be not offended i beseech you good father at the freedom of my expression no truly friend not i quoth hippothede there is no reason why i should be displeased therewith but in this carnal strife and debate of yours have you obtained from god the gift and special grace of continency in good faith not quoth panurge my counsel to you in that case my friend is that you marry quoth hippothede for you should rather choose to marry once than to burn still in fires of concupiscence then panurge with a jovial heart and a loud voice cried out that is spoke gallantly without circumvaginating about and about and never hitting it in its centred point gramercy my good father in truth i am resolved now to marry and without fail i shall do it quickly i invite you to my wedding by the body of a hen we shall make good cheer and be as merry as crickets you shall wear the bridegroom's colours and if we eat a goose my wife shall not roast it for me i will entreat you to lead up the first dance of the bridesmaids if it may please you to do me so much favour and honour there resteth yet a small difficulty a little scruple yea even less than nothing whereof i humbly crave your resolution shall i be a cuckold father yea or no by no means answered hippothede will you be cuckolded if it please god o oh, the lord help us now quoth panurge whither are we driven to good folks to the conditionals which according to the rules and precepts of the dialectic faculty admit of all contradictions and impossibilities if my transalpine mule had wings my transalpine mule would fly if it please god i shall not be a cuckold but i shall be a cuckold if it please him good god if this were a condition which i knew how to prevent my hopes should be as high as ever nor would i despair but you here send me to god's privy council to the closet of his little pleasures you my french countryman which is the way you take to go thither my honest father i believe it will be your best not to come to my wedding the clutter and dingle dangle noise of marriage guests will but disturb you and break the serious fancies of your brain you love repose with solitude and silence i really believe you will not come and then you dance but indifferently and would be out of countenance at the first entry i will send you some good things to your chamber together with the bride's favour and there you may 
drink our health if it may stand with your good liking my friend quoth hippothady take my words in the sense wherein i meant them and do not misinterpret me when i tell you if it please god do i to you any wrong therein is it an ill expression is it a blaspheming clause or reserve any way scandalous unto the world do not we thereby honour the lord god almighty creator protector and conserver of all things is not that a mean whereby we do acknowledge him to be the sole giver of all whatsoever is good do not we in that manifest our faith that we believe all things to depend upon his infinite and incomprehensible bounty and that without him nothing can be produced nor after its production be of any value force or power without the concurring aid and favour of his assisting grace is it not a canonical and authentic exception worthy to be premised to all our undertakings is it not expedient that what we propose unto ourselves be still referred to what shall be disposed of by the sacred will of god unto which all things must acquiesce in the heavens as well as on the earth is not that verily a sanctifying of his holy name my friend you shall not be a cockold if it please god nor shall we need to despair of the knowledge of his good will and pleasure herein as if it were such an abstruse and mysteriously hidden secret that for the clear understanding thereof it were necessary to consult with those of his celestial privy council or expressly make a voyage unto the empyrean chamber where order is given for the effectuating of his most holy pleasures the great god hath done us this good that he hath declared and revealed them to us openly and plainly and described them in the holy bible there will you find that you shall never be a cuckold that is to say your wife shall never be a strumpet if you make choice of one of a commendable extraction descended of honest parents and instructed in all piety and virtue such a one as hath not at any time haunted or frequented the company or conversation of those that are of corrupt and depraved manners one loving and fearing god who taketh a singular delight in drawing near to him by faith and the cordial observing of his sacred commandments and finally one who standing in awe of the divine majesty of the most high will be loath to offend him and lose the favourable kindness of his grace through any defect of faith or transgression against the ordinances of his holy law wherein adultery is most rigorously forbidden and a close adherence to her husband alone most strictly and severely enjoined yea in such sort that she is to cherish serve and love him above anything next to god that meriteth to be beloved in the interim for the better schooling of her in these instructions and that the wholesome doctrine of a matrimonial duty may take the deeper root in her mind you must needs carry yourself so on your part and your behaviour is to be such that you are to go before her in a good example by entertaining her unfeignedly with a conjugal amity by continually approving yourself in all your words and actions a faithful and discreet husband and by living not only at home and privately with your own household and family but in the face also of all men and open view of the world devoutly virtuously and chastely as you would have her on her side to deport and to demean herself towards you as becomes a godly loyal and respectful wife who maketh conscience to keep inviolable the tie of a matrimonial oath for as that looking-glass is not the best which is most decked with gold and precious stones but that which representeth to the eye the liveliest shapes of objects set before it even so that wife should not be most esteemed who richest is and of the noblest race but she who fearing god conforms herself nearest unto the humour of her husband consider how the moon doth not borrow her light from jupiter mars mercury or any other of the planets nor yet from any of those splendid stars which are set in the spangled firmament but from her husband only the bright sun which she receiveth from him more or less according to the manner of his aspect and variously bestowed irradiations just so should you be a pattern to your wife in virtue goodly zeal and true devotion that by your radiance in darting on her the aspect of an exemplary goodness she in your imitation may outshine the luminaries of all other women 
to this effect you daily must implore god's grace to the protection of you both you would have me then quoth panurge twisting the whiskers of his beard on either side with the thumb and forefinger of his left hand to espouse and take to wife the prudent frugal woman described by solomon without all doubt she is dead and truly to my best remembrance i never saw her the lord forgive me nevertheless i thank you father eat this slice of march pain it will help your digestion then shall you be presented with a cup of claret hippocras which is right healthful and stomachal let us proceed End of chapter three thirty chapter three thirty one of gargantua and pantagruel book three by francois rabelais this librivox recording is in the public domain how the physician rondabellus counselleth panurge panurge continuing his discourse said the first word which was spoken by him who gelded the lubberly quaffing monks of sauciniac after that he had unstoned friar call the real was this to the rest in like manner i say to the rest therefore i beseech you my good master rondabilis should i marry or not by the raking pace of my mule quoth rondabilis i know not what answer to make to this problem of yours you say that you feel in you the pricking stings of sensuality by which you are stirred up to venury i find in our faculty of medicine and we have founded our opinion therein upon the deliberate resolution and final decision of the ancient platonics that carnal concupiscence is cooled and quelled five several ways first by the means of wine i shall easily believe that quoth friar john for when i am well whittled with the juice of the grape i care for nothing else so i may sleep when i say quoth rondabilis that wine abateth lust my meaning is wine immoderately taken for by intemperancy proceeding from the excessive drinking of strong liquor there is brought upon the body of such a swill down boozer of chillness in the blood a slackening in the sinews a dissipation of the generative seed a numbness and habitation of the senses with a perversive wryness and convulsion of the muscles all which are great lets and impediments to the act of generation hence it is that bacchus the god of bibbers tipplers and drunkards is most commonly painted beardless and clad in a woman's habit as a person altogether effeminate or like a libbed eunuch wine nevertheless taken moderately work of quite contrary effects as is implied by the old proverb which saith that venus takes cold when not accompanied with ceres and bacchus this opinion is of great antiquity as appeareth by the testimony of diodorus the sicilian and confirmed by pausanias and universally held amongst the lamsacians that don priapus was the son of bacchus and venus secondly the fervency of lust is abated by certain drugs plants herbs and roots which make the taker cold maleficiated unfit for and unable to perform the act of generation as have been often experimented in the water-lily heraclea agnus castus willow twigs hemp stalks woodbine honeysuckle tamarisk chase tree mandrake bennet kekbugloss the skin of a hippopotam and many other such which by convenient doses proportioned to the peccant humour and constitution of the patient being duly and seasonably received within the body what by their elementary virtues on the one side and peculiar properties on the other do either benumb mortify and beclumps with cold and prolific cements or scatter and disperse the spirits which ought to have gone along with and conducted the sperm to the places destined and appointed for its reception or lastly shut up stop and obstruct the ways passages and conduits through which the seed should have been expelled evacuated and ejected we have nevertheless of those ingredients which being of a contrary operation heat the blood bend the nerves unite the spirits quicken the senses 
strengthen the muscles and thereby rouse up provoke excite and enable a man to the vigorous accomplishment of the feat of amorous dalliance i have no need of those quoth manage god be thanked and you my good master howsoever i pray you take no exemption or offence at these my words for what i have said was not out of any ill-will i did bear to you the lord he knows thirdly the ardour of lechery is very much subdued and mated by frequent labour and continual toiling for by painful exercises and laborious working so great a dissolution is brought upon the whole body that the blood which runneth alongst the channels of the veins thereof for the nourishment and elementation of each of its members hath neither time leisure nor power to afford the seminal resudation or superfluity of the third concoction which nature most carefully reserves for the conservation of the individual whose preservation she more heedfully regarded than the propagating of the species and the multiplication of humankind whence it is that diana is said to be chaste because she is never idle but always busied about her hunting for the same reason was a camp or leaguer of old called castrum as if they would have said castum because the soldiers wrestlers runners throwers of the bar and other such like athletic champions as are usually seen in the military circumvallation do incessantly travail in turmoil and are in a perpetual stir and agitation to this purpose hippocrates also writeth in his book de ari aqua et locus that in his time there were people in scythia as impotent as eunuchs in the discharge of a venerian exploit because that without any cessation pause or respite they were never from from off horseback or otherwise assiduously employed in some troublesome and molesting drudgery on the other part in opposition and repugnancy hereto the philosophers say that idleness is the mother of luxury when it was asked of it why aegisthus became an adulterer he made no other answer but this because he was idle who were able to rid the world of loitering and laziness might easily frustrate and disappoint cupid of all his designs aims engines and devices and so disable and appall him that his bow quiver and dart should from thenceforth be a mere needless load and burden to him for that it could not then lie in his power to strike or wound any of either sex with all the arms he had he is not i believe so expert an archer as that he can hit the cranes flying in the air or yet the young stags skipping through the thickets as the parthians knew well how to do that is to say people moiling stirring and hurrying up and down restless and without repose he must have those hushed still quiet lying at a stay lither and full of ease whom he is able though his mother help him to touch much less to pierce with all his arrows in confirmation hereof theophrastus being asked on a time what kind of beast or thing he judged a toyish wanton love to be he made answer that it was a passion of idle and sluggish spirits from which pretty description of tickling love tricks that of diogenes's hatching was not very discrepant when he defined lettery the occupation of folks destitute of all other occupation for this cause the cyconian engraver canacus being desirous to give us to understand that sloth drowsiness negligence and laziness were the prime guardians and governesses of ribaldry made the statue of venus not standing as other stone-cutters had used to do but sitting fourthly the tickling pricks of incontinency are blunted by an eager study for from thence proceedeth an incredible resolution of the spirits that oftentimes there do not remain so many behind as may suffice to push and thrust forwards the generative resudation to the places thereto appropriated and therewithal inflate the cavernous nerve whose office is to ejaculate the moisture of the propagation of human progeny lest you should think it is not so be pleased but to contemplate a little the form fashion and carriage of a man exceeding earnestly set upon some learned meditation and deeply plunged therein and you shall see how all the arteries of his brains are stretched forth and bent like the string of a crossbow the more promptly dexterously and copiously to supeditate furnish and supply him with store of spirit sufficient to replenish and fill up the ventricles seats tunnels mansions receptacles and cellules of the common sense of the imagination apprehension and fancy of the ratiocination arguing and resolution 
as likewise of the memory recordation and remembrance and with great alacrity nimbleness and agility to run pass and course from the one to the other through those pipes windings and conduits which to skilful anatomists are perceivable at the end of the wonderful net where all the arteries close in a terminating point which arteries taking their rise and origin from the left capsule of the heart bring through several circus sandwiches and an fragmentuosities the vital to subtilize and refine them to the ethereal purity of animal spirits nay in such a studiously musing person you may espy so extravagant raptures of one as it were out of himself that all his natural faculties for that time will seem to be suspended from each their proper charge and office in his exterior senses to be at a stand in a word you cannot otherwise choose than think that he is by an extraordinary ecstasy quite transported out of what he was or should be and that socrates did not speak improperly when he said that philosophy was nothing else but a meditation upon death this possibly is the reason why democritus deprived himself of the sense of seeing prizing at a much lower rate the loss of his sight than the diminution of his contemplations which he frequently had found disturbed by the vagrant flying out strayings of his unsettled and roving eyes therefore is it that pallas the goddess of wisdom tutoress and guardianess of such as are diligently studious and painfully industrious is and hath been still accounted a virgin the muses upon the same consideration are esteemed perpetual maids and the graces for the like reason have been held to continue in a sempiternal pudicity i remember to have read that cupid on a time being asked of his mother venus why he did not assault and set upon the muses his answer was that he found them so fair so sweet so fine so neat so wise so learned so modest so discreet so courteous so virtuous and so continually busied and employed one in the speculation of the stars another in the supputation of numbers the third in the dimension of geometrical quantities the fourth in the composition of heroic poems the fifth in the jovial interludes of a comic strain the sixth in the stately gravity of a tragic vein the seventh in the melodious disposition of musical airs the eighth in the completest manner of writing histories and books on all sorts of subjects and the ninth in the mysteries secrets and curiosities of all sciences faculties disciplines and arts whatsoever whether liberal or mechanic that approaching near unto them he unbended his bow shut his quiver and extinguished his torch through mere shame and fear that by mischance he might do them some hurt and prejudice which done he thereafter put off the fillet wherewith his eyes were bound to look them in the face and to hear their melody and poetic odes there took he the greatest pleasure in the world that many times he was transported with their beauty and pretty behaviour and charmed to sleep by the harmony so far was he from assaulting them or interrupting their studies under this article may be comprised what hippocrates wrote in the aforesighted treatise concerning the scythians as also that in a book of his entitled of breeding and production where he hath affirmed all such men to be unfit for generation as have their parotid arteries cut whose situation is beside the ears for the reason given already when i was speaking of the resolution of the spirits and of that spiritual blood whereof the arteries are the sole and proper receptacles and that likewise he doth maintain a large portion of the peristatic liquor to issue and descend from the brains and backbone fifthly by the too frequent reiteration of the act of venery there did i wait for you quoth panurge and shall willingly apply it to myself whilst any one that pleaseth may for me make use of any of the four preceding that is the very same thing quoth friar john which father Celino, prior of saint victor at marseilles calleth by the name of maceration and taming of the flesh i am of the same opinion and so was the hermit of saint radagonde a little above chenon for quoth he the hermits of thebaid can no more aptly or expediently macerate and bring down the pride of their bodies daunt and mortify their lecherous sensuality or depress and overcome the stubbornness and rebellion of the flesh than by duffling and fanfrelucking it five-and-twenty or thirty times a day 
i see panurge quoth rondobilus neatly featured and proportioned in all the members of his body of a good temperament in his humours well complexioned in his spirits of a competent age in an opportune time and of a reasonably forward mind to be married truly if he encounter with a wife of the like nature temperament and constitution he may beget upon her children worthy of some transpontine monarchy and the sooner he marry it will be the better for him and the more conducible for his profit if he would see and have his children in his own time well provided for sir my worthy master quoth panurge i will do it do not you doubt thereof and that quickly enough i warrant you nevertheless whilst you were busied in the uttering of your learned discourse this flea which i have in mine ear hath tickled me more than ever i retain you in the number of my festival guests and promise to you that we shall not want for mirth and good cheer enough yea over and above the ordinary rate and if it may please you desire your wife to come along with you together with her she friends and neighbours that is to be understood and there shall be fair play End of chapter three thirty one chapter three thirty two of gargantua and pantagruel book three by francois rabelais this librivox recording is in the public domain how rondebilis declareth cockoldry to be naturally one of the appendances of marriage there remaineth as yet quoth panurge going on in his discourse one small scruple to be cleared you have seen heretofore i doubt not in the roman standards of p q r c per cur rien shall not i be a cuckold by the haven of safety cried out rondabilis what is this you ask of me if you shall be a cuckold my noble friend i am married and you are like to be so very speedily therefore be pleased from my experiment in the matter to write in your brain with a steel pen this subsequent detente there is no married man who doth not run the hazard of being made a cuckold cuckoldry naturally attendeth marriage the shadow doth not more naturally follow the body than cuckoldry ensueth after marriage to place fair horns upon the husband's heads and when you shall happen to hear any man pronounce these three words he is married if you then say he is hath been shall be or may be a cuckold you will not be accounted an unskilful artist in framing of true consequences tripes and bowels of all the devils cries panurge what do you tell me my dear friend answered rondabilis as hippocrates on a time was in the very nick of setting forwards from lango to palestilo to visit the philosopher democritus he wrote a familiar letter to his friend dionysius wherein he desired him that he would during the interval of his absence carry his wife to the house of her father and mother who were an honourable couple and of good repute because i would not have her at my home said he to make abode in solitude yet notwithstanding this her residence beside her parents do not fail quoth he with the most heedful care and circumspection to pry into her ways and to espy what places she shall go to with her mother and who those be that shall repair unto her not quoth he that i do mistrust her virtue or that i seem to have any diffidence of her pudicity and chaste behaviour for that i have frequently had good and real proofs but i must freely tell you she is a woman there lies the suspicion my worthy friend the nature of women is set forth before our eyes and represented to us by the moon in divers other things as well as in this that they squat skulk constrain their own inclinations and with all the cunning they can dissemble and play the hypocrite in the sight and presence of their husbands who come no sooner to be out of the way but that forthwith they take their advantage pass the time merrily desist from all labour frolic it gather abroad lay aside their counterfeit garb and openly declare and manifest the interior of their dispositions 
even as the moon when she is in conjunction with the sun is neither seen in the heavens nor on the earth but in her opposition when remotest from him shineth in her greatest fullness and wholly appeareth in her brightest splendour whilst it is night thus women are but women when i say womankind i speak of a sex so frail so variable so changeable so fickle inconstant and imperfect that in my opinion nature under favour nevertheless of the prime honour and reverence which is due unto her did in a manner mistake the road which she had traced formerly and stray exceedingly from that excellence of providential judgment by the which she had created and formed all other things when she built framed and made up the woman and having thought upon it a hundred and five times i know not what else to determine therein save only that in the devising hammering forging and composing of the woman she have had a much tenderer regard and by a great deal more respectful heed to the delightful consortship and sociable delectation of the man than to the perfection and accomplishment of the individual womanishness or mulabriety the divine philosopher plato was doubtful in what rank of living creatures to place and collocate them whether amongst the rational animals by elevating them to an upper seat in the specific classes of humanity or with the irrational by degrading them to a lower bench on the opposite side of a brutal kind and mere bestiality for nature hath posited in a privy secret and intestine place of their bodies a sort of member by some not impertinently termed an animal which is not to be found in men therein sometimes are engendered certain humours so saltish brackish clammy sharp nipping tearing prickling and most eagerly tickling that by their stinging acrimony rending nitrosity figging itch wriggling mordicancy and smarting solicitude for the said member is altogether sinewy and of a most quick and lively feeling their whole body is shaken and embrangled their senses totally ravished and transported the operations of their judgment and understanding utterly confounded and all discordant passions and perturbations of the mind thoroughly and absolutely allowed admitted and approved of yea in such sort that if nature had not been so favourable unto them as to have sprinkled their forehead with a little tincture of bashfulness and modesty you should see them in a so frantic mood run mad after lechery and high apace up and down with haste and lust in quest of and to fix some chamber standard in their paphian ground that never did the p to these mimmalonides merlaean thyades deport themselves in the time of their bacchanalian festivals more shamelessly or with a so affronted and brazen face to impudency because this terrible animal is knit unto and hath an union with all the chief and most principal parts of the body as to anatomists is evident let it not here be thought strange that i should call it an animal seeing therein i do no otherwise than follow and adhere to the doctrine of the academic and peripatetic philosophers for if a proper motion be a certain mark and infallible token of the life and animation of the mover as aristotle writeth and that any such thing as moveth of itself ought to be held animated and of a living nature then assuredly plato the very good reason did give it the denomination of an animal for that he perceived and observed in it the proper and self-stirring motions of suffocation precipitation corrugation and of indignation so extremely violent that oftentimes by them is taken and removed from the woman all other sense and moving whatsoever as if she were in a swounding lipothemy benumbing syncope epileptic apoplectic palsy and true resemblance of a pale face death furthermore in the said member there is a manifest discerning faculty of sense and odours very perceptible to women who feel it fly from what is rank and unsavoury and follow fragrant and aromatic smells it is not unknown to me how claudius galen striveth with might and main to prove that these are not proper and particular notions proceeding intrinsically from the thing itself but accidentally and by chance nor hath it escaped my notice how others of that sect have laboured hardly yea to the utmost of their abilities to demonstrate that it is not a sensitive discerning or perception in it 
of the difference of wafts and smells but merely a various manner of virtue and efficacy passing forth and flowing from the diversity of odoriferous substances applied near unto it nevertheless if you will studiously examine and seriously ponder and weigh in quitolaus's balance the strength of their reasons and arguments you shall find that they not only in this but in several other matters also of the like nature have spoken at random and rather out of an ambitious envy to check and reprehend their betters than for any design to make inquiry into the solid truth i will not launch my little skiff any further into the wide ocean of this dispute only will i tell you that the praise and commendation is not mean and slender which is due to those honest and good women who living chastely and without blame have had the power and virtue to curb range and subdue that unbridled heady and wild animal to an obedient submissive and obsequious yielding unto reason therefore here will i make an end of my discourse thereon when i shall have told you that the said animal being once satiated if it be possible that it can be contented or satisfied by that aliment which nature hath provided for it out of the epididymal storehouse of man all its former and irregular and disordered motions are at an end laid and assuaged all its vehement and unruly longings lulled pacified and quieted and all the furious and raging lusts appetites and desires thereof appeased calmed and extinguished for this cause let it seem nothing strange unto you if we be in a perpetual danger of being cuckolds that is to say such of us as have not wherewithal fully to satisfy the appetite and expectation of that voracious animal odds fish quoth panurge have you no preventive cure in all your medicinal art for hindering one's head to be horny graft at home whilst his feet are plodding abroad yes that i have my gallant friend answered von debilis and that which is a sovereign remedy whereof i frequently make use myself and that you may the better relish it is set down and written in the book of a most famous author whose renown is of a standing of two thousand years hearken and take good heed you are quoth Banerge, by cock's hobby a right honest man and i love you with all my heart eat a little of this quince pie it is very proper and convenient for the shutting up of the orifice of the ventricle of the stomach because of a kind of astringent stipticity which is in that sort of fruit and is helpful to the first concoction but what i think i speak latin before clerks stay till i give you somewhat to drink out of this nestorian goblet will you have another draught of white hippocras be not afraid of the squinzy no there is neither squinant ginger nor grains in it only a little choice cinnamon and some of the best refined sugar with the delicious white wine of the growth of that vine which was set in the slips of the great sorb apple above the walnut tree end of chapter three thirty two chapter three thirty three of gargantua and pantagruel book three by francois rabelais this librivox recording is in the public domain rondibillus the physician's cure of cuckoldry at that time quoth rondibillus when jupiter took a view of the state of his olympic house and family and that he had made the calendar of all the gods and goddesses appointing unto the festival of every one of them its proper day and season establishing certain fixed places and stations for the pronouncing of oracles and relief of travelling pilgrims and ordaining victims immolations and sacrifices suitable and correspondent to the dignity and nature of the worshipped and adored deity did not he do asked panurge therein as Tantuille, the bishop of auxerre is said once to have done this noble prelate loved entirely the pure liquor of the grape as every honest and judicious man doth therefore was it that he had an especial care in regard to the bud of the vine-tree as to the great grandfather of bacchus but so it is that for sundry years together he saw a most pitiful havoc desolation and destruction made amongst the sprouts shootings buds blossoms and scions of the vines by hoary frost dank fogs hot mists unseasonable colds 
chill blasts thick hail and other calamitous chances of foul weather happening as he thought by the dismal inauspiciousness of the holy days of st george st mary st paul st eutrope holy rood the ascension and other festivals in that time when the sun passeth under the sign of taurus and thereupon harboured in his mind this opinion that the aforenamed saints were saint hail flingers saint frost senders saint fog mongers and saint spoilers of the vine buds for which cause he went about to have transmitted their feasts from the spring to the winter to be celebrated between christmas and epiphany so the mother of the three kings called it allowing them with all honour and reverence the liberty then to freeze hail and rain as much as they would for that he knew that at such a time frost was rather profitable than hurtful to the vine buds and in their steads to have placed the festivals of st christopher st john the baptist st magdalene st anne st domingo and st lawrence yea and to have gone so far as to collocate and transpose the middle of august in and to the beginning of may because during the whole space of their solemnity there was so little danger of hoary frosts and cold mists that no artificers are then held in greater request than the affords of refrigerating inventions makers of junkets fit disposers of cooling shades composers of green arbours and refreshers of wine jupiter said rondabilis forgot the poor devil cuckoldry who was then in the court at paris very eagerly soliciting a peddling suit at law for one of his vassals and tenants within some few days thereafter i forgot how many when he got full notice of the trick which in his absence was done under him he instantly desisted from prosecuting legal processes in the behalf of others full of solicitude to pursue after his own business lest he should be foreclosed and thereupon he appeared personally at the tribunal of the great jupiter displayed before him the importance of his preceding merits together with the acceptable services which in obedience to his commandments he had formerly performed and therefore in all humility begged of him that he would be pleased not to leave him alone amongst all the sacred potentates destitute and void of honour reverence sacrifices and festival ceremonies to this petition jupiter's answer was excusatory that all the places and offices of his house were bestowed nevertheless so importuned was he by the continual supplications of monsieur cuckoldry that he in fine placed him in the rank list roll rubric and catalogue and appointed honours sacrifices and festival rites to be observed on earth in great devotion and tended to him with solemnity the feast because there was no void empty nor vacant place in all the calendar was to be celebrated jointly with and on the same day that had been consecrated to the goddess jealousy his power and dominion should be over married folks especially such as had handsome wives his sacrifices were to be suspicion diffidence mistrust a lowering pouting sullenness watchings wardings researchings plyings explorations together with the waylayings ambushes narrow observations and malicious doggings of the husband's scouts and despiles of the most privy actions of their wives herewithal every married man was expressly and rigorously commanded to reverence honour and worship him to celebrate and solemnize his festival with twice more respect than that of any other saint or deity and to immolate unto him with all sincerity and alacrity of heart the above-mentioned sacrifices and oblations under pain of severe censures threatenings and combinations of these subsequent fines mulcts amercealments penalties and punishments to be inflicted on the delinquents that m cuckoldry should never be favourable nor propitious to them that he should never help aid supply succour nor grant them any subventitious furtherance 
auxiliary suffrage or aminiculary assistance that he should never hold them in any reckoning account or estimation that he should never deign to enter within their houses neither at the doors windows nor any other place thereof that he should never haunt nor frequent their companies or conversations how frequently soever they should invocate him and call upon his name and that not only he should leave and abandon them to rot alone with their wives in a semi-paternal solitariness without the benefit of the diversion of any copes bait or co-rival at all but should withal shun and eschew them fly from them and eternally forsake and reject them as impious heretics and sacrilegious persons according to the accustomed manner of other gods towards such as are too slack in offering up the duties and reverences which ought to be performed respectively to their divinities as is evidently apparent in bacchus towards negligent vine dressers in ceres against idle ploughmen and tillers of the ground in pomona to unworthy fruiterers and costard mongers in neptune towards dissolute mariners and seafaring men in vulcan towards loitering smiths and forgemen and so throughout the rest now on the contrary this infallible promise was added that unto all those who should make a holy day of the above recited festival and cease from all manner of worldly work and negotiation lay aside all their own most important occasions and to be so wretchless heedless and careless of what might concern the management of their proper affairs as to mind nothing else but a suspicious espying and prying into the secret deportments of their wives and how to scoop shut up hold it under and deal cruelly and austerely with them by all the harshness and hardships that an implacable and every way inexorable jealousy can devise and suggest conform to the sacred ordinances of the aforementioned sacrifices and oblations he should be continually favourable to them should love them sociably converse with them should be day and night in their houses and never leave them destitute of his presence now i have said and you have heard my cure ha 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 quoth carpalin laughing this is a remedy yet more apt and proper than hans carvel's ring the devil take me if i do not believe it the humour inclination and nature of women is like the thunder whose force in its bolt or otherwise burneth bruiseth and breaketh only hard massive and resisting objects without staying or stopping at soft empty and yielding matters for it passeth into pieces the steel sword without doing any hurt to the velvet scabbard which ensheatheth it it crusheth also and consumeth the bones without wounding or in damaging the flesh wherewith they are veiled and covered just so it is that women for the greater part never bend the contention subtlety and contradictory disposition of their spirits unless it be to do what is prohibited and forbidden barely quoth hippophidy some of our doctors aver for a truth that the first woman of the world whom the hebrews called eve had hardly been induced or allured into the temptation of eating of the fruit of the tree of life if it had not been forbidden her so to do and that you may give the more credit to the validity of this opinion consider how the caudalus and wily tempter did commemorate unto her for an antecedent to his enthymeme the prohibition which was made to taste it as being desirous to infer from thence it is forbidden thee therefore thou shouldst eat of it else thou canst not be a woman End of chapter three thirty three chapter three thirty four of gargantua and pantagruel book three by francois rabelais this librivox recording is in the public domain how women ordinarily have the greatest longing after things prohibited when i was quoth carpalin a whore-master at orleans the whole art of rhetoric in all its tropes and figures was not able to afford unto me a colour or flourish of greater force and value 
nor could i by any other form or manner of elocution pitch upon a more persuasive argument for bringing young beautiful married ladies into the snares of adultery through alluring and enticing them to taste with me of amorous delights than with a lively sprightfulness to tell them in downright terms and to remonstrate to them with a great show of detestation of a crime so horrid how their husbands were jealous this was none of my invention it is written and we have laws examples reasons and daily experiences confirmative of the same if this belief once enter into their noddles their husbands will infallibly be cuckolds yea by god will they without swearing although they should do like semiramis pasiphae egesta the women of the isle of mandes in egypt and other such like queenish flirting harlots mentioned in the writings of herodotus strabo and such like puppies truly quoth ponocrates i have heard it related and it hath been told me for a verity that pope john the twenty second passing on a day through the abbey of toucheron was in all humility required and besought by the abbess and other discreet mothers of the said convent to grant them an indulgence by means of whereof they might confess themselves to one another alleging that religious women were subject to some petty secret slips and imperfections which would be a foul and burning shame for them to discover and to reveal to men how sacerdotal soever their functions were but that they would freelier more familiarly and with greater cheerfulness open to each other their offences faults and escapes under the seal of confession there is not anything answered the pope fitting for you to impetrate of me which i would not most willingly condescend unto but i find one inconvenience you know confession should be kept secret and women are not able to do so exceeding well quoth they most holy father and much more closely than the best of men the said pope on the very same day gave them in keeping a pretty box wherein he purposely caused a little linnet to be put willing them very gently and courteously to lock it up in some sure and hidden place and promising them by the faith of a pope that he should yield to their request if they would keep secret what was enclosed within that deposited box enjoining them withal not to presume one way nor other directly or indirectly to go about the opening thereof under pain of the highest ecclesiastical censure eternal excommunication the prohibition was no sooner made but that they did all of them boil with the most ardent desire to know and see what kind of thing it was that was within it they thought long already that the pope was not gone to the end they might jointly with the more leisure and ease apply themselves to the box opening curiosity the holy father after he had given them his benediction retired and withdrew himself to the pontifical lodgings of his own palace but he was hardly gone three steps from without the gates of their cloister when the good ladies throngingly and as in a huddled crowd pressing hard on the backs of one another ran thrusting and shoving who should be first at the setting open of the forbidden box and descrying of the quod latitat within on the very next day thereafter the pope made them another visit of a full design purpose and intention as they imagined to dispatch the grant of their sought and wished for indulgence but before he would enter into any chat or communing with them he commanded the casket to be brought unto him it was done so accordingly but by your leave the bird was no more there then was it that the pope did represent to their maternities how hard a matter and difficulty was for them to keep secrets revealed to them in confession unmanifested to the ears of others seeing for the space of four-and-twenty hours they were not able to lay up in secret a box which he had highly recommended to their discretion charge and custody welcome in good faith my dear master welcome it did me good to hear you talk the lord be praised for all i do not remember to have seen you before now since the last time that you acted at montpellier with our ancient friends anthony sapora guy bourg gaillet balthazar noyer tolet john quintin francis robinet john perdrier and francis rabelais the moral comedy of him who had espoused and married a dumb wife i was there quoth the pistamon the good honest man her husband was very earnestly urgent 
to have the fillet of her tongue untied and would needs have her speak by any means at his desire some pains were taken on her and partly by the industry of the physician other part by the expertness of the surgeon the encyclaglot which she had under her tongue being cut she spoke and spoke again yea within a few hours she spoke so loud so much so fiercely and so long that her poor husband returned to the same physician for a recipe to make her hold her peace there are quoth the physician many proper remedies in our art to make dumb women speak but there are none that ever i could learn therein to make them silent the only cure which i have found out is their husband's deafness the wretch became within a few weeks thereafter by virtue of some drugs charms or enchantments which the physician had prescribed unto him so deaf that he could not have heard the thundering of nineteen hundred cannons at a salvo his wife perceiving that indeed he was as deaf as a door nail and that her scolding was but in vain sith that he heard her not she grew stark mad some time after the doctor asked for his fee of the husband who answered that truly he was deaf and so was not able to understand what the tenor of his demand might be whereupon the leech bedusted him with a little i know not what sort of powder which rendered him a fool immediately so great was the stultificating virtue of that strange kind of pulverized dose then did this fool of a husband and his mad wife join together and falling on the doctor and the surgeon did so scratch but thwack and bang them that they were left half dead upon the place so furious were the blows which they received i never in my lifetime laughed so much as at the acting of that buffoonery let us come to where we left off quoth Panurge. your words being translated from the clapper dudgeons to plain english do signify that it is not very ex inexpedient that i marry and that i should not care for being a cuckold you have there hit the nail on the head i believe master doctor that on the day of my marriage you will be so much taken up with your patience or otherwise so seriously employed that we shall not enjoy your company sir i will heartily excuse your absence sturcus et urina medici sunt prandia prima ex aliis pali as ex istus collegae grana you are mistaken quoth rondabilis in the second verse of our distich for it ought to run thus nobis sunt signa vobis sunt prandia digna if my wife at any time prove to be unwell and ill at ease i will look upon the water which she shall have made in an urinal glass quoth rondabilis grope her pulse and see the disposition of her hypogaster together with her umbilicary parts according to the prescript rule of hippocrates book two aphorism thirty five before i proceed any further in the cure of her distemper no no quoth panurge that would be but to little purpose such a feat is for the practice of us that are lawyers who have the rubric de ventre in spiciendo do not therefore trouble yourself about it master doctor i will provide for her a plaster of warm guts do not neglect your more urgent occasions otherwise for coming to my wedding i will send you some supply of victuals to your own house without putting you to the trouble of coming abroad and you shall always be my special friend with this approaching somewhat nearer to him he clapped into his hand without the speaking of so much as one word four rose nobles rondabilis did shut his fist upon them right kindly yet as if it had displeased him to make acceptance of such golden presents he in a start as if he had been wroth said he 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 there was no need of anything i thank you nevertheless from wicked folks i never get enough and i from honest people refuse nothing i shall be always sir at your command provided that i pay you well quoth panurge that quoth rondabilis is understood End of chapter three thirty four chapter three thirty five of gargantua and pantagruel book three by francois rabelais this librivox recording is in the public domain how the philosopher true ye ogan handleth the difficulty of marriage as this discourse was ended pantagruel said to the philosopher true ye yogan our loyal honest true and trusty friend the lamp from hand to hand is come to you it falleth to your turn to give an answer should panurge pray you marry yea or no he should do both 
quoth troigogan what say you asked panurge that which you have heard answered troigogan what have i heard replied panurge that which i have said replied troigogan ha 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 are we come to that pass quoth panurge let it go nevertheless i do not value it at a rush seeing we can make no better of the game but howsoever tell me should i marry or no neither the one nor the other answered troigogan the devil take me quoth panurge if these odd answers do not make me dote and may he snatch me presently away if i do understand you stay a while until i fasten these spectacles of mine on this left ear that i may hear you better with this pantagruel perceived at the door of the great hall which was that day their dining-room gargantuous little dog whose name was kine for so was toby's dog called as is recorded then did he say to these who were there present our king is not far off let us all rise that word was scarcely sooner uttered than that gargantua with his royal presence graced that banqueting and stately hall each of the guests arose to do their king that reverence and duty which became them after that gargantua had most affably saluted all the gentlemen there present he said good friends i beg this favour of you and therein you will very much oblige me that you leave not the places where you sat nor quit the discourse you were upon let a chair be brought hither unto this end of the table and reach me a cupful of the strongest and best wine you have that i may drink to all the company you are in faith all welcome gentlemen now let me know what talk you were about to this pantagruel answered that at the beginning of the second service panurge had proposed a problematic theme to wit whether he should marry or not marry that father hippothede and dr rondebilis had already dispatched their resolutions thereupon and that just as his majesty was coming in the faithful true yogan in the delivery of his opinion hath thus far proceeded that when panurge asked whether he ought to marry yea or no at first he made this answer both together when this same question was again propounded his second answer was neither the one nor the other panurge exclaimeth that those answers are full of repugnancies and contradictions protesting that he understands them not nor what it is that can be meant by them if i be not mistaken quoth gargantua i understand it very well the answer is not unlike to that which was once made by a philosopher in ancient times who being interrogated if he had a woman whom they named him to his wife i have her quoth he but she hath not me possessing her by her i am not possessed such another answer quoth pantagruel was once made by a certain bouncing wench of sparta who being asked if at any time she had had to do with a man no quoth she but sometimes men have had to do with me well then quoth rondebilis let it be a neuter in physic as when we say a body is neuter when it is neither sick nor healthful and a mean in philosophy that by an abnegation of both extremes and this by the participation of the one and of the other even as when lukewarm water is said to be both hot and cold or rather as when time makes the partition and equally divides betwixt the two a while in the one another while is long in the other opposite extremity the holy apostle quoth hippothede seemeth as i conceive to have more clearly explained this point when he said those that are married let them be as if they were not married and those that have wives let them be as if they had no wives at all i thus interpret quoth pantagruel the having and not having of a wife to have a wife is to have the use of her in such a way as nature hath ordained which is for the aid society and solace of man and propagating of his race to have no wife is not to be uxorious play the coward and be lazy about her and not for her sake to disdain the lustre of that affection which man owes to god 
or yet for her to leave those offices and duties which he owes unto his country unto his friends and kindred or for her to abandon and forsake his precious studies and other businesses of account to wait still on her will her beck and her buttocks if we be pleased in this sense to take having and not having of a wife we shall indeed find no repugnancy nor contradiction in the terms at all end of chapter three thirty five chapter three thirty six of gargantua and pantagruel book three by francois rabelais this librivox recording is in the public domain a continuation of the answer of the aphitic and peronian philosopher truyogan you speak wisely quoth panurge if the moon were green cheese such a tale once pissed my goose i do not think but that i am let down into that dark pit in the lowermost bottom whereof the truth was hid according to the saying of heraclitus i see no wit at all i hear nothing understand as little my senses are altogether dulled and blunted truly i do very shrewdly suspect that i am enchanted i will now alter the former style of my discourse and talk to him in another strain our trusty friend stir not nor imburse any but let us vary the chance and speak without disjunctives i see already that these loose and ill-joined members of an enunciation do vex trouble and perplex you now go on in the name of god should i marry true Ogan, there is some likelihood therein panurge but if i do not marry true Ogan, i see in that no inconvenience panurge you do not true ye ogan none truly if my eyes deceive me not panurge yea but i find more than five hundred true ye ogan reckon them panurge this is an impropriety of speech i confess for i do no more thereby but take a certain for an uncertain number and posit the determinate term for what is indeterminate when i say therefore five hundred my meaning is many true e yogan i hear you panurge is it possible for me to live without a wife in the name of all the subterranean devils true e yogan away with these filthy beasts panurge let it be then in the name of god for my salmigandinish people used to say to lie alone without a wife is certainly a brutish life and such a life also was it a severed to be by dido in her lamentations true eogan at your command panurge by the potty cotty i have fished fair where are we now but will you tell me shall i marry true eogan perhaps panurge shall i thrive or speed well withal true eogan according to the encounter panurge but if in my adventure i encounter aright as i hope i will shall i be fortunate true yogan enough panurge let us turn the clean contrary way and brush our former words against the wool what if i encounter ill true yogan then blame not me panurge but of courtesy be pleased to give me some advice i heartily beseech you what must i do true yogan even what thou wilt panurge wishy washy trolly trolly true yogan do not invocate the name of anything i pray you panurge in the name of god let it be so my actions shall be regulated by the rule and square of your counsel what is it that you advise and counsel me to do true yogan nothing panurge shall i marry true yogan i have no hand in it panurge then shall i not marry true yogan i cannot help it panurge if i never marry i shall never be a cuckold true yogan i thought so panurge but put the case that i be married true yogan where shall we put it panurge admit it be so then and take my meaning in that sense true yogan i'm otherwise employed panurge by the death of a hog and mother of a toad o lord if i durst hazard upon 
a little fling at the swearing game though privily and under thumb it would lighten the burden of my heart and ease my lights and reins exceedingly a little patience nevertheless is requisite well then if i marry i shall be a cuckold true yogan one would say so panurge yet if my wife prove a virtuous wise discreet and chaste woman i shall never be cuckolded true yogan i think you speak congruously panurge hearken true yogan as much as you will panurge will she be discreet and chaste this is the only point i would be resolved in true yogan i question it panurge you never saw her true yogan not that i know of panurge why do you then doubt of that which you know not true yogan for a cause panurge and if you should know her true yogan yet more panurge page my pretty little darling take care of my cap i give it thee have a care you do not break the spectacles that are in it go down to the lower court swear there half an hour for me and i shall in compensation of that favour swear hereafter for thee as much as thou wilt but who shall cuckold me true yogan somebody panurge by the belly of the wooden horse at troy master somebody i shall bang blam thee and claw thee well for thy labour true yogan you say so panurge nay nay that nick is in a dark cellar who hath no white in his eye carry me quite away with him if in that case whensoever i go abroad from the palace of my domestic residence i do not with as much circumspection as they used to ring mares in our country to keep them from being sallied by stoned horses clap a burgo masco lock upon my wife true yogan talk better panurge it is bien chien chie chante well cacked and cackled shitten and sung in matter of talk let us resolve on somewhat true yogan i do not gainsay it panurge have a little patience seeing i cannot on this side draw any blood of you i will try if with the lancet of my judgment i be able to bleed you in another vein are you married or are you not true yogan neither the one nor the other and both together panurge oh the good god help us by the death of a buffalo ox i sweat with the toil and travail that i am put to and find my digestion broke off disturbed and interrupted for all my freens and metaphrenes and diaphragms back belly midriff muscles veins and sinews are held in a suspense and for a while discharged from their proper offices to stretch forth their several powers of and abilities for inconfistibulating and laying up into the hamper of my understanding your various sayings and answers true yogan i shall be no hinderer thereof panurge tush for shame our faithful friends speak are you married true yogan i think so panurge you were also married before you had this wife true yogan it is possible panurge had you good luck in your first marriage true yogan it is not impossible panurge how thrive you with this second wife of yours true yogan even as it pleases my fatal destiny panurge but what in good earnest tell me do you prosper well with her true yogan it is likely panurge come on in the name of god i vow by the burden of st christopher that i had rather undertake the fetching of a fart forth of the belly of a dead ass than to draw out of you a positive and determinate resolution yet shall i be sure at this time to have a snatch at you and get my claws over you our trusty friend let us shame the devil of hell and confess the verity were you ever a cuckold i say you who are here and not that other you who playeth below in the tennis court true yogan no if it was not predestinated panurge by the flesh blood and body i swear re-swear forswear abjure and renounce he evades and avoids shifts and escapes me and quite slips and winds himself out of my grips and clutches at these words gargantua arose and said praise be the good god in all things but especially for bringing the world into that height of refinedness beyond what it was when i first came to be acquainted therewith that now the learnest and most prudent philosophers are not ashamed to be seen entering in at the porches and frontispieces of the schools of the peronian apparatic sceptic and affectic sects blessed be the holy name of god veritably it is like henceforth to be found an enterprise of much more easy undertaking to catch lions by the neck horses by the mane oxen by the horns bulls by the muzzle wolves by the tail goats by the beard and flying birds by the feet than to 
entrap such philosophers in their words farewell my worthy dear and honest friends when he had done thus speaking he withdrew himself from the company pantagruel and others with him would have followed and accompanied him but he would not permit them so to do no sooner was gargantua departed out of the banqueting hall than the pantagruel said to the invited guests plato's timaeus at the beginning always of a solemn festival convention was wont to count those that were called thereto we on the contrary shall at the closure and end of this treatment reckon up our number one two three where's the fourth i miss my friend bridal goose was not he sent for epistemon answered that he had been at his house to bid and invite him but could not meet with him for that a messenger from the parliament of marlingois in marlinguis was come to him with a writ of summons to cite and warn him personally to appear before the reverend senators of the high court there to vindicate and justify himself at the bar of the crime a prevarication laid to his charge and to be peremptorily instanced against him in a certain decree judgment or sentence lately awarded given and pronounced by him and that therefore he had taken horse and departed in great haste from his own house to the end that without peril or danger of falling into a default or contumacy he might be the better able to keep the prefixed and appointed time i will quoth pantagruel understand how that matter goeth it is now above forty years that he hath been constantly the judge of fons baton during which space of time he hath given four thousand definitive sentences of two thousand three hundred and nine whereof although appeal was made by the parties whom he had judicially condemned from his inferior judicatory to the supreme court of the parliament of marlingua in merlinguis they were all of them nevertheless confirmed ratified and approved of by an order decree and final sentence of the said sovereign court to the casting of the appellants and utter overthrow of the suits wherein they had been foiled at law for ever and a day that now in his old age he should be personally summoned who in all the foregoing time of his life hath demeaned himself so unblameably in the discharge of the office and vocation he been called unto it cannot assuredly be that such a change hath happened without some notorious misfortune and disaster i am resolved to help and assist him in equity and justice to the uttermost extent of my power and ability i know the malice despite and wickedness of the world to be so much more nowadays exasperated increased and aggravated by what it was not long since that the best cause that is how just and equitable soever it be standeth in great need to be succoured aided and supported therefore presently from this very instant forth do i propose till i see the event and closure thereof most heedfully to attend and wait upon it for fear of some underhand tricky surprisal cavilling pettifoggery or fallacious quirks in law to his detriment hurt or disadvantage the dinner being done and the tables drawn and removed when pantagruel had very cordially and affectionately thanked his invited guests for the favour which he had enjoyed of their company he presented them with several rich and costly gifts such as jewels rings set with precious stones gold and silver vessels with a great deal of other sort of plate besides and lastly taking of them all his leave retired himself into an inner chamber End of chapter three thirty six